the ordeal of civility, Freud, Marx, Levi Strauss, and the Jewish struggle with modernity. John Murray Cudahy. Preface. This study may be considered to be a long meditation on its own epigraphs. It unpacks them. It is their hermeneutic. It recurs to them throughout. It is a midrash. Epigraphs. The German Jews were likely to be envied and resented by East European Jews for what would have been called their refinement. Lionel Drilling, afterward to the unpossessed. Ritual competence, perhaps the most fundamental socialization of all. Irving Goffman, relations in public. Are the Jews congenitally unsociable and rude, or are they this way as a result of having been segregated into ghettos? Such was the form of the question over which argument raged in the 18th century, on the eve of the emancipation. Leon Poliakov. Anti-Semitism and Christian teaching. Or is it obvious to everyone what the Jews have learned from Christianity since it is obvious what the Jews have learned from modernity and it is obvious that modernity is secularized Christianity? But is modernity in fact secularized Christianity? Leo Strauss. Liberalism ancient and modem. Freud deals directly with the whole range of feelings, thoughts and attitudes that fail to be successfully held back and hence, only less directly, with the rules regarding what is allowed expression. For what will be later seen as a symptom first comes to attention because it is an infraction of a rule regarding effect restraint during daily encounters. Irving Goffman. Encounters. No anti-Semite can begin to comprehend the malicious analysis of his soul which every Jew indulges every day. Norman Mailer. Responses and Reactions Vi. The prejudice against the Galileans, that is, early Christians, was not due to their doctrine or their form of worship so much as to their bad manners. It was their attitude towards the non-elect that irritated people, not their faith. Harold Nicholson. Good Behavior. Epigraphs. The gestures which we sometimes call empty are perhaps the fullest things of all. Irving Goffman. Interaction ritual. I had to laugh at these goyim and their politeness. They aren't born smart, like Jews. They're polite all the time, so they can be sure one won't screw the other. Jerome Wideman. I can get it for you wholesale. When normals and stigmatized. Enter one another's immediate presence. There occurs one of the primal scenes of sociology. Thus, the good Jew or mental patient waits for an appropriate time in a conversation with strangers and calmly says, Well, being Jewish has made me feel that. Or having had first hand experience as a mental patient, I can. Irving Goffman. Stigma, notes on the management of spoiled identity. The Jews have always been students and their greatest study is themselves. Albert Goldman. The real Lenny Bruce is alive and well in Brooklyn. Socialism is not a science, a sociology in miniature, it is a cry of grief. If it is not a scientific formulation of social facts, it is itself a social fact of the highest importance. Emile Erkheim. Socialism. The descriptions of the Brout facts can be explained in terms of the institutional facts. But the institutional facts can only be explained in terms of the constitutive rules which underlie them. John Searle. Speech Acts. I seem to detect, in some few passages in Leslie Fiedler, the tone of an informer to the Goyim, and the less said about that the better. Philip Raff, Lettuce and Tomatoes and newcomer that I am, I am constantly brought up short by the split between the nobility of Jewish thought and the vulgarity and chaos of Jewish life. Norma Rosen. Symposium, Living in Two Cultures. One of the principal criteria of the pariah group is its separation by ritual barrier. This distinguishes it from a class in the ordinary sense. I my. Epigraphs. Self do not think that, Sallow W. Baron fully refuted Weber on this whole point. Very far from it. Weber was quite right that the Jewish case was one to a very large extent of ritual, self exclusion rather than imposed exclusion by Gentile. Talcott Parsons. 
at Max Weber Centennial, Heidelberg, 1964. It illustrates the tribal, rather than the civil, nature of Jewish culture. There is, and can be, no provision made whereby disaffected Jews might leave the fold with dignity and self-respect. Anonymous. An analysis of Jewish culture. By manners, I mean not here, decency of behavior, as how one should salute another, or how a man should wash his mouth, or pick his teeth before company, and such other points of small morals, but those qualities of mankind, that concern their living together in peace, and unity. Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan. Many of our ancestors, recognizing themselves as disgracefully backward, were overwhelmed by the contact with a superior civilization. Michael Polanyi, Jewish Problems. Thoroughly naive coarseness is the source of that absolutely complacent inability, of Professor Hans Delbruck, to understand the obligation to distinguish between personal considerations and the truthful analysis of facts. Max Weber, On Universities. Humanity in the form of fraternity invariably appears historically among persecuted peoples and enslaved groups, and in 18th century Europe it must have been quite natural to detect it among the Jews, who then were newcomers in literary circles. This kind of humanity is the great privilege of pariah peoples. The privilege is dearly bought, it is often accompanied by so radical a loss of the world, that in extreme cases, in which pariahdom has persisted for centuries, we can speak of real worldlessness. And worldlessness, alas, is always a form of barbarism. In this as it were organically evolved humanity it is as if under the pressure of persecution the persecuted have moved so closely together that the interspace which we have called world, has simply disappeared. Hannah Arendt, On Humanity in Dark Times the reality we admire tells us that the observation of manners is trivial and even malicious. Lionel Drilling, Manners, Morals, and the Novel. Acknowledgements. I wish first to thank past teachers who, either in person or in their classrooms, have taught me important things, Miss Trout, Mr. Becker, and Mr. Kinney of the Lawrence Smith School in New York, William K. Wimsatt, now at Yale University. Frankie Lally, John Howard Benson, W. G. Kelly, Leonard Sargent, OSB, Wilfred Bain, OSB, Newt Ansgar Nelson, OSB of Portsmouth Abbey School in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, Father Murphy, S.J., the late Father Tui, S.J., and Phillips Temple, Librarian, of Georgetown University, William Gorman of St. John's College, Annapolis, Father Dor, CSB, E. Shein Gilson, and Jacques Maritain of St. Michael's College, University of Toronto, E. A. Moody, P. O. Christella, John H. Randall, Jr., Lionel Trilling, Ernst Cassira, Salo W. Barron, Arthur Hertzburg, and Ernst Cap of Columbia University, Charles de Conin Condor L. Colnai of Laval University, Quebec City. Benjamin Nelson, Bernard Rosenberg, and John O'Neill, on leave from York University, Toronto, of the New School for Social Research in New York, Professor Matilda White Riley and the late peer star of Rutgers University. Also, Father William Fox, SSS, Father Pacific Roy, and Father William Keller of Seton Hall, Professor Desmond Fitzgerald of the University of San Francisco, Paul Hillsdale, Donald Lawler, MP of Toronto, Peter Morin, Arthur Sheehan, Aid Beth Hune, Carrie Peebles, Charlene and Herbert Schwartz, Mary Edwards Newell, Mary Gilsey, Audrey White, Judith Sheercasius, May Marks, Laura Davis, and William A. Anderson. Photographs of the following persons, my intellectual heroes, are on my walls Eric Auerbach, A. N. Whitehead, Jacques Maritain. Wallace Stevens, G. K. Chesterton, Talcott Parsons, Albert Schweitzer, at 30, Evelyn War, Ernst Cassira, Ludwig Wittgenstein, W. B. Yates, and George Santiana. 
I hereby acknowledge idiosyncratic intellectual debts to all of them. I owe more to two underground classics of the 1940s which deal with the problem of social modernization than is indicated in my book, Benjamin Nelson's The Idea of Usury, From Tribal Brotherhood to Universal Otherhood and Karl Polanyi's The Great Transformation. To these I must add The Imperial Self, 1971, by Quentin Anderson and the pioneering study by Dr. Donald Clark Hodges, Ethics and Manners an unpublished Ph.D. dissertation in the Department of Philosophy, Columbia University, 1954, which I put to work in Chapter 12. Two psychiatrists, Edwin Cusson, M.D. and Valentine Zetlin, M.D. Acknowledgements Gave me understanding help in times of trouble. I want to thank them publicly here. To Jean Wacker of Rutgers University, Professor George L. Klein of Bryn Mawr College, Professor Jeffrey Hart of Dartmouth College, and Rabbi Lloyd Tenenbaum of Huntington, Long Island, many thanks for much good talk over many years. For his timely assistance in statistics, I wish to thank Dr. Egon Meyer of Brooklyn College. Bell Sikorella of Rutgers proved unfailingly helpful. I wish also to acknowledge the kindness of Professor Walter Fairservice and of Helen Markovics of Vassar College. To the late Albert Salomon of the New School for Social Research and to Robert Merton of Columbia, I owe my introduction to sociology as a discipline. In the fall of 1949, Salomon's Balzac as sociologist course gave me a wholly new sense of the relation of the modern novel to modem society, of modernism to modernization. My Chapter 22, A Sociology of Literature of the More Recent, 1950-1970, American Jewish Writing, stems ultimately from that course. It was at the prompting, I believe, of J. Schulman that I emigrated weekly from Philosophy Hall at Columbia to Audit Merton in Fairweather. Talcott Parsons' is The Social System, 1952, had just appeared and, week after exciting week, Merton's Talmudic explication the text, especially of the chapter on the medical profession, opened my eyes to the full implications of differentiating the motivational and institutional levels of analysis. This crucial differentiation made clear, for example, why medically socialized male gynecologists do not break out with erection bulges as they examine their patients. Ideology, as defined in my book usually involves a confusion of the motivational and institutional levels of analysis. To Professor Harry Breedy Muir of Rutgers University I owe much, his searching criticisms, his guidance, his patience, his brilliant teaching, and the unfailing generosity of his encouragement will never be forgotten. From Professor Peter Berger of Rutgers, both as great teacher and as good friend, I learned the sweep and daring of sociology. Durkheim and Weber came alive in his teaching. In him, theory never lost its contact with everyday life. Without his encouragement and the prodding of his praise I would still today be seated among my five glidomatic, goldsmith brothers, filing cabinets dreaming of a book. Thank you, Peter Berger. Needless to say, any shortcomings anyone should find in this study are not to be blamed on Peter Berger or on any of the others mentioned. Lastly, I should like to thank the people at Basic Books, Inc., my freelance copy editor, Bill Green, for a scrupulous and understanding reading of my manuscript, my project editor, Ruth Rosman, for her care and patience, Carol Vance, assistant to the president of Basic Books, for many acts of thoughtfulness, small and large, and lastly, Erwin Glykes, president and publisher of Basic Books. He let me speak my mind as I saw fit to speak it. I have no greater praise than this. The Ordeal of Civility Introduction Before becoming privy to the true inwardness of Jewish modernity one must first break the stranglehold of paradigms, the pious paradigms that preempt the story of Jewish emancipation. The story of the exodus of Jews into Europe in the 19th century is a case study in culture shock. The hoped for goodness of fit between what Jews expected from emancipation and what Europe had promised its Jews became, instead, the Jewish problem. The Jewish great expectations were utopian, 
the Gentile promises carried a caveat. An ethnocentric and family-oriented people, one of the most familistic societies known, Eisenstadt tells us one awoke the morning after emancipation to find itself in a world of strangers, the non-kinship, universalistic nation societies of modem Europe. A slow disintoxication supervenes as Jewish emancipation fails to make good on its promises. I give the problem of civility a thematic authority over this whole story because if, as Berger and Luckman argue, the most important experience of others takes place in the face-to-face -face situation, which is the prototypical case of social interaction, to this face-to-face -face encounter when it occurs between strangers in the West takes the form of a ritual exchange of gifts we call civility. The encounter of Jew with Gentile was never able to remain near enough to the surface to achieve a genuine ritual consummation. Thus, the ratification of Jewish emancipation in social emancipation, in face-to-face -face social contact with the Gentile, never occurred. The failure of Jewish emancipation was a failure of ritual competence and of social encounter, no ritually ratified face-to-face -face contact three took place, no social rites of public behavior were reciprocally performed, nor were they performed for their own sakes. This failure of civility spread shockwaves through 19th century society. In arguing a larger alienation, since the norms of civility merely spell out and specify for face-to-face -face interaction the more general values of the culture, the failure of civility came to define the Jewish problem as this problem reconstituted itself in the era of social modernity. It is this ordeal, this problem of the ritually unconsummated social courtship of Gentile and Jew that is. The phrase is Milton Himmelfarbs in the Jews of Modernity, New York, Basic Books, 1973, p. 8. Formative for the labors of the secular Jewish intelligentsia of the 19th and 20th centuries. It is their hidden theme. This problem stems, ultimately, as we shall see from a disabling inability of Judaism to legitimate culturally the differentiation of culture and society, or from what Philip Reif calls the disastrous Jewish attempt to maintain an identity of culture and society. 4. Max Weber wrote about the Protestant ethic. This book is about the Protestant aesthetic and the Protestant etiquette, those expressive and situational norms ubiquitously if informally institutionalized in the social interaction ritual of our modem Western societies. More particularly, it is about the Protestant etiquette, etiquette understood in the non-trivializing sense of public behavior and civility, and the spirit of Judaism, as Judaism took the form of Yiddishkeit when Jews from the late 18th century up into our own time, entered the West from the ghettos and Stittlach of Central and Eastern Europe. The cultural collision, the culture camp, between Yiddishkeit and the behavioral and expressive norms we call the Protestant aesthetic and etiquette came to constitute the modern form of the ancient Judenfrage, the Jewish question. Thus, Jewish emancipation, assimilation, and modernization constitute a single, total phenomenon. The secularizing Jewish intellectual, as the avant-garde of his decolonized people, suffered in his own person the trauma of this culture shock. Unable to turn back, unable completely to acculturate, caught between his own whom he had left behind and the Gentile host culture where he felt ill at ease and alienated, intellectual Jews and Jewish intellectuals experienced cultural shame and awkwardness, guilt and the guilt of shame. The focus of their concern, often unacknowledged, was the public behavior of their fellow Jews, the Ostjuden. The ideologies of the post-emancipation era, Marxism, Freudianism, Haskalah, Reform Judaism, have a double audience, on the one hand, they have designs on their Jewish audience, which they wish to change, enlighten, or reform, but, on the other hand, they constitute an elaborate effort at apologetics, addressed to the Gentile of goodwill and designed to reinterpret, excuse, or explain to him the otherwise questionable public look of emancipating Jewry. Secular Jewish intellectual ideologies are exercises in anti defamation, addresses in defense of Jewry to the cultured among its despisers. In Marxism and Freudianism, the ideology is both a hermeneutic, 
a reinterpretation, and a praxis, an instrument of change. Beginning, in each case, with the public dialect of Jewish behavior, the scene it was making in the public places of the diaspora, it urges change, wholesale revolutionary change in the case of Marx, retail individual change in the case of Freud. See Chapter 5, The Guilt of Shame. Let us take the case of socialism. The universalist in its rhetoric and appeal, the socialist ideology that comes out of German Jewry, from Marx to the young Walter Lippmann, is rooted in the Jewish question which, for German Jewry generally, has always turned on the matter of the public misbehavior of the Jews of Eastern Europe, the proverbial Ostjuden. Marx in his 1843 essay on the Jewish question views the problem, as we shall see, as one of eliminating the crudeness of practical need so conspicuously visible in Jewish economic behavior. He equally indicts the refinement of Gentile economic behavior in which the civil nexus, civility, serves only as a hypocritical fig leaf concealing the reality of the cash nexus. German Jewish Socialism, in other words, in its deep-lying motivation nexus is a sumptuary socialism. It is tailor-made for a recently decolonized new nation indigenous to the West whose now dispersed nationals have had neither time nor opportunity to internalize that system of informal restraints we are calling the Protestant etiquette. Protestant interiority and internalization, in the triple form of an ethic, an aesthetic, and an etiquette, was the functional modernizing equivalent of what, for Catholics and Jews in the Middle Ages, had been a formally institutionalized set of legal restrictions on conspicuous consumption and behavior. Jewry was in the 19th century exiting from its Middle Ages, feudal sumptuary laws, external constraints, took the modernizing form of internal restraints of moderation on consumption, trade, and commercial practices. As we shall see, the ideology of the Jewish intellectual is frequently a projection onto the general, Gentile culture of a forbidden ethnic self-criticism. Shame for one's own kind is universalized into anger at the ancestral enemy. The interrepunitive theodicy of the shtetl, we are in Galat as a punishment for our sins is secularized, after emancipation, into either extrapunitive sociodices, you made us what we are today or into the great impunitive, ideological, value-free edifices of Freud and Marx. Neither Jew nor Gentile is to be blamed for the juries of the diaspora, it is but a symptom of capitalist exploitation, Marx, or a medical symptom of anxiety, Freud. The relation of the secular Jewish ideologists to the Jewish problem is frequently forgotten or obscured. The late George Lichtheim's essay Socialism and the Jews, for example, abnubilates the Jewish problem matrix of Marxian as of other socialisms. Of this whole problem complex, for example, he writes that, by a stroke of bad luck, the problem has somehow become entangled with the issue of Jewish emancipation. 5. My emphasis. Licktime exhibits a curious disinclination to explore this somehow entanglement. Bad luck rushes in where historians fear to tread. With Jewish secularization modernization, the direction of punitiveness shifts. Judaism is psychologized into Jewishness, and the personal Messiah is depersonalized. These three axes define the direction of Judaism's secularization, its to medievalization into modernity. Emancipating Jewry was thus making a scene in the diaspora. Even if ordinary, prost, grassroots Jewry did not realize this, the Jewish intelligentsia did. They knew how Jews looked to Goyim. The Jewish intellectual placed himself between his people, backward and pre-modern, and their modern, Gentile status audience. If Jews offended the goyim why the Jewish intellectual would perform the remedial work best suited to place that offense in a different light. In a brilliant essay, Remedial Interchanges, Irving Goffman shows how in social interaction, when we violate a norm of civility, we resort to certain rights, accounts, apologies, and requests, thus transforming what could be seen as offensive into what can be seen as acceptable. By striking in some way at the moral responsibility otherwise imputed to the offender. 6. The intellectual elite of a modernizing, decolonized, 
or emancipated people performs, on the level of the culture system, through the creation of ideologies, socialism, liberalism, psychoanalysis, Zionism a functional equivalent of what are accounts, apologies, and excuses on the everyday level of social system behavior. This intelligentsia explains, excuses, and accounts for the otherwise offensive behavior of its people. All the moves made in the long public discussion of the Jewish emancipation problematic constitute, in the case of the detraditionalized intellectuals, an apologetic strategy. Attention must be paid to the deeply apologetic structure of diaspora intellectuality. Why, for example, did psychoanalysis, as Martin J. notes, prove to be especially congenial to assimilated Jewish intellectuals? 7 Because Freudianism like Marxism, supplied the transformation formulas by which the Jewish question that is, the normative social conflicts of emancipating Jewry, their offensive behavior could be translated into cognitive scientific problems. In this way, ritual social interaction offenses were accounted for as depth problems for which the offending parties were not responsible. Social conflict, that is, the Jewish problem, was thus honorably buried in cognitive structures. Social delicts became mental symptoms. Relations in public became public relations. The apologists of Jewry, the Jewish intellectuals, thus made Jewry less disreputable. This apologetic posture of diaspora intellectuals toward their fellow Jews and toward the Gentile host culture, the virtual offender and virtual claimant respectively, to use Goffman's phrases is exactly analogous to that of second-century Christian apologists toward pagan thought. As the Christian fathers clothed their kerygma in Greek, the better to defend it, they ipso facto made it more acceptable and, ultimately, more respectable. The offense that Christ constituted in the Greco-Roman world, folly to the Greeks, a scandal to the Jews, St. Paul had said, underwent, in remedial interchange with the Hellenistic world and conducted in its language, a subtle sea change in the direction of intellectual respectability. In fact, pagan critics, Jaroslav Pelikan tells us, often acknowledged the stubborn singularity of Jesus Christ in a manner more trenchant than the theology of the Christian apologists, thus calling forth a more profound defense. Eventually, as Christianity became more respectable socially, its apologetics became more respectable philosophically. 8. In the era of the Jewish emancipation, the 19th century, the prestige of science, not Greek logic, conferred intellectual respectability. Therefore, the pariah capitalism of emancipating Jewry and the social conflict it engendered, anti-Semitism, the socialism of fools, Bebel said were subsumed and honorably buried in the socialism of the Jewish intellectuals, in Marxian or scientific socialism. Later in the century, when social emancipation supervened on economic emancipation, giving rise to the bourgeois problem of social anti-Semitism, Freud transformed various social offenses against the goyim into various psychological defenses against the id of the offending party, the ten Freudian mechanisms of defense. Public misconduct was, for each of these ideologies, symptomatic behavior. For the ordinary Gentile, these Jews were simply troublemakers who showed the wrong deference and improper demeanor. By treating this behavior of the ordinary Jew symptomatically, as a symptom of economic exploitation, or of regression, or of homelessness, Marxism, Freudianism, or Zionism a Jewish intellectual could rescue his fellow Jews from the demeaning implications of the normative reality definitions of their Gentile interactants. The result of Marx's argument, Richard Bernstein tells us, was to de-emphasize the significance of anti-Semitism, to see the Jewish question as only a symptom of the state of bourgeois society 9, my emphasis. Normative problems of behavior could be decorously buried in cognitive problems of understanding. Social issues became social science. When, during a didactic analysis with Freud, Joseph Wirtis, thinking of the social behavior problem of Jews, challenges Freud's belief that they are a superior people, Freud immediately moves to the cognitive, I think nowadays they are, 
Freud replied. When one thinks that I.O. or 12 of the Nobel winners are Jews, and when one thinks of their other great achievements in the sciences and in the arts, one has every reason to think them superior. When Wirtis, himself a Jew, cites Jewish bad manners, Freud concedes the fact, attributes it to the fact that since Jewish emancipation they have not always adapted to the social life of a mixed society and ends by translating the normative problem into a cognitive one. They have had much to learn 10, my emphasis. In Freud's remedial work with Wirtus on a face-to-face -face basis we see epitomized the apologetic thrust of psychoanalytic theory construction. In Freud's science, the social troubles of a modernizing jury receive a self-enhancing cognitive gloss, social malaise becomes a medical symptom, offenses become defenses kvetches become hysterical com. Introduction. Plaints, juries become basic anxiety, social shame becomes moral guilt, deviance becomes incapacity, strangeness becomes alienation, to be badly behaved is to be mentally ill. As Jewish intellectuals with cultural aspirations constructed putatively value-free social sciences with which to talk about the social encounter of Jew with Gentile in the West, rank and file Jews with social aspirations were seeking religiously neutral places in which to interact with bourgeois Gentiles. Sociologically, the quest of the Jewish intellectual for value-neutral social sciences and the quest of the Jewish bourgeois for value-neutral social places are one event. The Salon of Rav Amagon, of the first generation of emancipation, was to have been a socially neutral place, eleven cutting across class, religion, and ethnicity. Neutral social interaction meant interaction between secularized and modernized Jews and Christians. Thus when, at the prompting of Moses Mendelssohn, the Marquis Dargins wrote Frederick the Great, asking that Mendelssohn be given the needed special permission to live in Berlin. He couched his request as follows, an intellectual, philosopher, who is a bad Catholic begs an intellectual who is a bad Protestant to grant the privilege, of residence in Berlin, to an intellectual who is a bad Jew. 12. The Lunat Masonry constituted for a socially aspirant jury lay in the fact that it offered a place, a piece of social space, the Masonic Lodge, in which bad Christians and bad Jews could interact as social equals, and this at the very time when Jews were not making it socially in the larger society. Later, in America, the meeting houses of the Ethical Culture Society were to have become the analogously neutral places where socially and culturally aspiring Jews, for whom Reform Judaism had become an impossible option, could meet socially with their Christian counterparts. The novelty of Freemasonry, writes Jacob Katz, was that it offered diverse sects and classes the opportunity to meet in neutral territory. 13 The Enlightenment stemming from Mendelssohn's circle in Berlin constituted a kind of prefiguration of the neutral society thought possible by both enlightened Jews and Gentiles of goodwill. All the ideologies constructed by secular Jewish intellectuals, from the Haskalah to Reform Judaism, from Marxism to Freudianism, from Assimilationism to Zionism, form a continuing tradition which I call Jewish intellectual culture. The Jews of modernity, as Milton Himmelfarb calls them, in each generation renew themselves, and sustain. At the turn of the century in Germany, marked in green notes, sociology was sometimes then called the Jewish science. The von Richthof and Sisters, New York, Basic Books, 1974. p. 24. In the 1920s, Milton Himmelfarb writes, Friedrich Gundolf, born Gundelfinger, a friend of Stefan George's, was curious to know what sociology was all about, so he attended a sociological congress in Berlin. Afterward he said, now I know what sociology is. Sociology is a Jewish sect. The Jeu Greater Than S of Modernity, New York, Basic Books, 1973, p. 44. Their intellectual morale in Galat, by drawing on various strands of this tradition. Secular Jewish intellectuals speak out from the predicament bequeathed to them by Jewish emancipation and modernization. 
I have never found particularly convincing the patently self-serving theory that intellectuals construct about themselves, that they are classless, or constitute an interstitial stratum, in Karl Mannheim's version, or are unattached, in Louis Coza's version. Intellectuals I have known are attached to their productions, as to those of the truck driver, we must address the nervy, vulgar little sociology of knowledge question says who? As Peter Berger puts it, there are many forms of attachment, if we are not particularly class bound, perhaps we are region bound, or time bound, or culture bound, or subculture bound. The present volume, being an essay on the culture of secular Jewish intellectuals, is a study in subculture boundedness. To make any kind of sense, it should be placed in the context of my interests and convictions, and a certain indulgence will be asked, allowing me simply to assert these convictions and interests, rather than to argue them, otherwise, my study will never get off the ground. Edward Schills has remarked the curiously oppositional stance of the modem intelligentsia from the 19th century and earlier up to our own period. With perhaps unpardonable oversimplification, I should like to name the essential thrust of what they were opposing. They were opposing modernity. Hereby hangs a paradox, most of them were very modern men supposedly engaged in attacking the status quo, and the fact that their traditional opponents also considered them to be a dangerously modernist avant-garde only confirmed them in this, their cherished illusion. What, then, is this modernization process? Its greatest theorist, in my conviction, is Talcott Parsons. His work culminates in a theory of the modernization process accurately described as the differentiation model of modernization. Modernization, in this conceptualization, is passing from the left to the right column of Parsons's famous pattern variable scheme, from effectivity to effective neutrality, from particularism to universalism, from ascription to achievement from diffuseness to specificity. Parsons, as an intellectual descendant of Calvin, has displayed, according to the conventional wisdom, an all but sovereign indifference to the high cost of this passing of traditional society, as Daniel Lemmer calls it, this passage from home, as Isaac Rosenfeld calls it in his haunting novel by that name. Members of the Protestant core culture, like Parsons, theorize from within the eye of the hurricane of modernization, where all is calm and intelligible. But for the underclass below, as for the ethnic outside, modernization is a trauma. Parsons views modernization, correctly, I contend, as a secularization of Protestant Christianity, much as Hegel, the secularizing Lutheran, viewed it in the 19th century. Both of these theorists lived at what Schills calls the charismatic center of Western culture. What this center demands, as Parsons above all has seen, is differentiation, the differentiation of home from job, the differentiation of political economy, Marx, into politics and economy, differentiation of the culture system from the personality and social systems, differentiation of economy from society, Weber and Parsons and Smolser, differentiation of fact from value, of theory from praxis, differentiation of art from belief. Differentiation is the cutting edge of the modernization process, sundering cruelly what tradition had joined. It splits ownership from control, Berland means, it separates church from state, the Catholic trauma, ethnicity from religion, the Jewish trauma. It produces the separated or liberal state, a limited state that knows its place, differentiated from society. Differentiation slices through ancient primordial ties and identities, leaving crisis and wholeness hunger in its wake. Differentiation divorces ends from means, Weber's rationalization, nuclear from extended families. It frees poetry from painting, and painting from representation. Literary modernism differentiates the medium from the message. Beneath the politics of the oppositional intelligentsia the anti-modernist thrust is all too audible. Demodernization, from Marx to Mao, is dead differentiation. In the Chinese Cultural Revolution, structural differentiation and the division of labor were denounced violently and explicitly and uprooted as such. 
this violent Maoist challenge to differentiation, Netland Robertson note, was a much more open prized opposition regarding differentiation than the uncomfortable and often contradictory Stellung Nam to the problem in the Soviet Union in recent times, even in the early days after the Bolshevik Revolution. Differentiated modernity was hardly ever attacked as specifically as this. But then, they add, the clearly expressed current notion of differentiated modernity did not exist, then. To this extent I the 14, my emphasis. Parsons is the sociologist par excellence of differentiated modernity. He has seen it steadily and, like Hegel, he has seen it whole. Stemming from the Protestant Reformation, the Industrial Revolution, and the English, French, and American revolutions, modernization constitutes the infrastructure of what Gabriel Armand and Sidney Verber call the civic culture. Introduction into this long and continuing revolution of differentiation is what we mean today by being civilized. Inward assent to the disciplines of differentiation, and the practice of its rights, may be viewed as the pater of the West. Ideology is the name we give to the the Boston Irish Catholic John F. Kennedy, for example, in the midst of campaigning for the presidency, made his way down to the Pays Real of Houston, the to offer to the Protestant ministerial conference a separation of church and state wide beyond the wildest dreams of their theological avarice, shortly after, he left Knesset for Washington. Various resistance movements mounted to stem the onslaught of the differentiation process. Essentially, these movements are demodernizing, dedifferentiating, rebarbative. Winston White, in a neglected masterpiece, defines the oppositional intelligentsia as resisting the emerging distinctions and defines ideology as the attempt to suppress differentiation. 15 and David Little notes that modem man, situated within the modernization process, socialized into a differentiated social order containing the principles of voluntarism, consensualism, private initiative and toleration, finds himself, paradoxically, compelled to be free. 16 The social change fostered by modern differentiations frees man from the old descriptive cushions, and thus, White observes, it cannot, unlike previous changes, be absorbed for the individual by the family, the church, a class, or an economic or political interest. It is one that the individual must confront by making choices without dependence on ascriptive guidance. He is, indeed, White concludes, forced to be free. 17, White's emphasis. Acculturation into modernity on the part of pre-modem and underdeveloped personalities and cultures is like the pleasure principle colliding with the social reality principle. D strain and deprivation are undergone, together with intimations of freedom. There is a further dimension to modernization that will lead us into this study of Jewish intellectuals. Once, in the office of Dr. Harry Bredemeyer, apropos of my having used the word modernization, he popped a question, almost out of the blue, what is modernization, Jack? I was nonplussed, there was a long silent pause as I searched for a definition, and finally I came up with refinement. Many things funded themselves into that answer. Differentiation on the level of the culture system is the power to make distinctions between previously fused, confused ideas, values, variables, concepts. Almost all intellectual interchange boils down to pointing out distinctions or aspects of a topic that have been obscured or neglected. Intellectual distinction and originality are frequently a matter of making a new and important distinction or differentiation. Learning theory teaches us that wholes must be distinguished into their parts before wider relationships can be established. Parsons sees the rhythm of modernization itself as involving first differentiation, then extension, and finally upgrading. This too is the rhythm of the intellectual. The differentiating scientific ethos does not end ideology, but it may deflate it. As Parsons and Platt write, a major aspect of the ethos of science, that is, all the intellectual disciplines, is organized skepticism. The duty of a scientist, a Wissenschaftler in Weber's sense, is to question the cognitive validity and or significance of propositions. 
the ideologist, on the other hand, always questions the level of his commitment to the ideology, including the cognitive belief component of it. Ideologies constitute forms of rhetoric which seek to mobilize faith, emphasis in original. Talcott Parsons and Gerald M. Platt, The American University, Cambridge, Harvard University Press, 1973, p. 296, n. 43. T. I. borrow the term social reality principle from Professor Benjamin Nelson, using it differently. Life on the plane of the culture system, crude, coarse, fused, undifferentiated holes, roles, structures, functions, topics, personalities, are distinguished into their elements, they are refined, like crude oil in the cracking process. This whole dimension of modernization can be put in a formula, in the West at least, the modernization process goes hand in hand with the civilizational process. They constitute one package. The coarse feudal baron is refined into the gentleman. The emergence of cities, multiplying strangers, expelling us from our tribal brotherhoods into the universal otherhood of an urban world of strangers, enables us to live with unknown others without transforming them into either brothers or enemies. Initiation into the social interaction rituals of civility equips us to deal with strangers routinely in urban public space my emphasis. 18 in the 19th century. The peasant or the young man from the provinces comes to Paris or London or Dublin, his urbanization process requires urbanity, his entry into civil society civility. For the first time, perhaps, he must differentiate relations in private from relations in public, behavior and intimate effect in private places from decorum in public places. Acquiring this private public differentiation is a great transition, neglected in sociology. It is significant, Kenneth Building writes, that the word civility and the word civil derive from the same root as the word civilization. The age of civilization is characterized not only by conquest, military ruthlessness, and the predominance of the threat as organizer. It is also characterized by the elaborate integrative systems of religion politeness, morals, and manners. The dynamics of this process whereby the rough feudal baron was turned into a gentleman again the literal meaning of the word is highly significant, is a process that has never been adequately studied, yet it may well be the most important single process in the whole dynamics of the age of civilization, for it is the process which permitted the rise of civil society, without which science would have been impossible. 19. And it was into this civil society that Jewry was emancipated in the 19th century. Because of the tribal, rather than the civil, nature of Jewish culture, 20 Jewish emancipation involved Jews in collisions with the differentiations of Western society. The differentiations most foreign to the shtetl subculture of Yiddishkeit were those of public from private behavior. Themes of Benjamin Nelson and Lofland are combined here to illustrate how the differentiation of the stranger from both brother and enemy is at once a modernizing and a civilizing process. Introduction And of manners from morals. Jews were being asked, in effect, to become bourgeois, and to become bourgeois quickly. The problem of behavior, then, became strategic to the whole problematic of assimilation. The modernization process, the civilizational process, and the assimilation process were experienced as one, as the price of admission to the bourgeois civil societies of the West at the end of the 19th century. It is in the light of this sociology of knowledge context of Jewish emancipation that I shall examine Freud, Marx, Levi Strauss, and other figures. As the 19th century drew to a close, and as the problems of political and economic integration were put behind them, the advanced guard of emancipating Jewry encountered head on the specific problem of social integration with the Gentile West. The emancipated Jew of this period, Max Norda told the First Zionist Congress in 1897, was allowed to vote for members of parliament, but he saw himself excluded, with varying degrees of politeness from the clubs and gatherings of his Christian fellow countrymen. It was precisely the relatively rapid promotion rates enjoyed by this jury in the political, 
economic, and cultural spheres that brought home to it the realization of that special misery of relative deprivation that was long to be its lot in the social sphere. This is the Jewish special misery, Nordau continues, which is more painful than the physical because it affects men of higher station, who are prouder and more sensitive. All the better Jews of Western Europe, he concludes, groan under this misery and seek for salvation and alleviation. 21 Freud heard their groans. Many of them were his patients and adherents. At least some of these groans derived from what I call the ordeal of civility. Civility requires, at a minimum, the bifurcation of private effect from public demeanor. Many 18th and 19th century Dutch and French paintings take us inside the homes of the bourgeoisie. We speak of bourgeois interiors. The faces and public behavior of these same people were a kind of bourgeois exterior. In France, for example, the emergence of the civil persona took the form of the Honit Hom what Eric Auerbach calls the adaptation of the individual's inner life to the socially appropriate, and the concealment of all unseemly depths. 22 In England it took the form of that tactful circumspection of surfaces we call respectability. Niceness is as good a name as any for the informally yet pervasively institutionalized civility expected, indeed, required, of members, and of aspirant members, of that societal community called the civic culture. Intensity, fanaticism, inwardness, too much of anything, in fact, is unseemly and bids fair to destroy there. As early as the 1920s Ludwig Luizon was to note that Freudianism functioned as a kind of diaspora Zionism, that it was first of all an effort on the part of the Jewish people to heal itself of the maladies of the soul contracted in the assimilatory process. Mid-Channel, An American Chronicle, New York and London, Harper and Brothers, 1929, p. 129. Fragile solidarity of the surface we call civility. The great cultural triumph of the middle class, writes Norman Podhoritz, is precisely that it brought obsession into disrepute. 23. Civility, as the very medium of Western social interaction, presupposes the differentiated structures of a modernizing civil society. Civility is not merely regulative of social behavior, it is an order of appearance constitutive of that behavior. This medium is itself the message and the message it beamed to the front runners of a socially emancipating Jewry came through loud and clear, be nice. The Jews, writes Morris Samuel looking back on the epoch of emancipation, are probably the only people in the world to whom it has ever been proposed that their historic destiny is, to be nice. 24. This study, focusing on Freud, Marx, and Levi Strauss, explores a crucial dimension of this historic destiny. It explores a dimension of the threat posed by modernization to a traditionary subculture. It explores the danger that the prospect of being gentled posed to an underdeveloped subculture indigenous to the West. 25 Ostensibly about Jewry and what Jews call assimilation, the study is, in the end, only methodologically Judeocentric. Like Weber rummaging in India and China and ancient Israel, all the while on the prowl for his Calvinist and gleeful at not finding him, thus demonstrating once again the uniqueness of the West, my central interest also lies in the West and in the religious idea and value system secularized into its modernizing structures. We learn what this civilization is, in good part, from a study of the Titans who, like Marx, hurled themselves against it or who, like Freud, grudgingly consented to its discontents just as Jews, from time immemorial, have resigned themselves to the juries of Galat. The perspective of this study involves the synthetic assimilation of multiple generalizations, requiring a flair for discerning hidden transformations as well as an eye for the more obvious continuities. 26 This study examines the hidden transformations of the everyday life problems of assimilating Jewry, the Jewish emancipation problematic into the very thought structures of Jewry's intellectual giants, Freud, Marx, and Levi Strauss. In a single sentence, Irving Howe catches the gemschaft effect of Eastern European shtetl Yiddish Kiet's life is with people, having love, he writes, 
they had no need for politeness. 27 But once he moved beyond the pale at the time of emancipation and entered the differentiating modernity of the West, the shtit lost Jude was to learn to his sorrow that in the larger society love is not enough. Outer, ecological conflict with the goyim then became inner conflict with the self. Judaism became Jewishness. The advent of Freud's psychoanalysis is a registration of this continuing hidden transformation, of this continuing ordeal. Part 1. Sigmund Freud? Chapter 1. The Matrix of Freud's Theory, The Jewish Emancipation Problematic. Sigmund Freud's life work, and especially his masterpiece. The Interpretation of Dreams, 1900, concluded one phase in the great 19th century debate on Jewish emancipation, as the unruly wish can fulfill itself only in the form of a disguised dream so the Ostjude is not admissible into the civil society of the Gentile unless he submits to social censorship, disguising his unruly importunity in socially acceptable ways. Just as we may find the clue to Marx's outlook in his first published article, his comments on the latest Prussian censorship instruction, 1842, one so also in Freud's early work it is censorship that blocks the primary process, the primary or Jewish socialization and produces the compromise which is the assimilating Jew. Though some dreams are undisguised wish fulfillments, it was the dream that dissimulates a wish which intrigued Freud, and that leads to the core of his interpretation of dreams. In cases where the wish fulfillment is unrecognizable, where it has been disguised, there must have existed some inclination to put up a defense against the wish and owing to this defense the wish was unable to express itself except in a distorted shape. I will try to seek a social parallel to this internal event in the mind. Where can we find a similar distortion of a psychical act in social life? Only where two persons are concerned, one of whom possesses a certain degree of power which the second person is obliged to take into account. In such a case the second person will distort his psychical acts or as we might put it, will dissimulate. 2. Then, at last, Freud gives us the social parallel he has been leading up to all along, the politeness which I practice every day, he confesses, is to a large extent dissimulation of this kind, and when I interpret my dreams for my readers I am obliged to adopt similar distortions. 3. My emphasis. Sigmund Freud? It is my contention that Freud in fact began with his everyday social life, and then found a dream parallel slash Freud moves quickly from social censorship, politeness, to the effects of political censorship, and he writes of it in a way astonishingly similar to what the young Karl Marx had written 58 years earlier. Freud continues. A similar difficulty confronts the political writer who has disagreeable truths to tell those in authority. If he presents them undisguised, the authorities will suppress his words, after they have been spoken, if his pronouncement was an oral one, but beforehand, if he had intended to make it in print. A writer must beware of the censorship, and on its account he must soften and distort the expression of his opinion. Or, speak in allusions in place of direct references, or he must conceal his objectionable pronouncement beneath some apparently innocent disguise. The stricter the censorship, the more far-reaching will be the disguise and the more ingenious too may be the means employed for putting the reader on the scent of the true meaning. The fact that the phenomena of censorship and of dream distortion correspond down to their smallest details justifies us in presuming that they are similarly determined. For, my emphasis. In 1919, after World War I, Freud added a footnote to this passage using the analogy of postal censorship. The postal censorship makes such passages unreadable by blacking them out. The dream censorship replaced them by an incomprehensible mumble. In the dream illustrating this, the dream of a cultivated and highly esteemed widow of fifty who wished for sexual intercourse. A staff surgeon mumbles some unintelligible proposal and is soon ushering her most politely and respectfully, Freud notes, up a spiral staircase. 5. Thus, 
if there is one agency in the dreamer that constructs the dream wish, there is another that softens or distorts the expression of the wish. 6 This agent is the censor, which stands at the borders of consciousness and says, Thou shall not pass. All through the 19th century, the Eastern European Jew had sought admission to bourgeois Western civil society. At first he experienced economic and political exclusion, by Freud's time he was seeking social acceptance and experiencing social rejection. This importunate Yid, released from ghetto and shtetl, is the model, I contend, for Freud's course, importunate Id. Both are saddled with the problem of passing from a latent existence beyond the pale of Western respectability into an open and manifest relation to. Professor Leo Strauss in his Persecution and the Art of Writing, 1952, takes up once more this obsessive theme of diaspora Jewish intellectuals. Freud's subject was Dreamwork, or Persecution and the Art of Dreaming, J.M.C. L8. Gentile society within Gentile society, from a state of unconsciousness to a state of consciousness. Freud's internal censor represents bourgeois Christian 19th century culture, not only moral standards, but all the components of the common culture are internalized as part of the personality structure, writes Stalcott Parsons in crediting Freud with the discovery of the phenomenon of internalization 7, Parsons' emphasis. The internal censor, writes Freud, allows nothing to pass without exercising its rights and making such modifications as it sees fit in the thought which is seeking admission to consciousness. 8 It is the phenomenon of Jewish passing and its cognate, the Jewish joke, that lie behind Freud's discovery of internalization. An examination of these allows one to glance behind the scenes of Freud's discovery. Freud began his study of the unconscious by examining the psychopathology of everyday life, slips of the tongue and pen, awkward parapraxis which violate the decorum of public places, and jokes, especially Jewish jokes, which he often exchanged in correspondence with his friend Flies. Freud was fascinated with the phenomenon of unsuitable effect, its expression, suppression, and repression, and of how it passes or fails to pass the censor. He was an expert on the status of the emancipated Jew in the late 19th century, he studied how he coped or failed to cope with the ambiguity involved in the terminal, and most difficult, social stage of emancipation. Freud deals directly, Irving Goffman notes, with the whole range of feelings, thoughts, and attitudes that failed to be successfully held back and hence, only less directly, with the rules regarding what is allowed expression, my emphasis. A slip, a neurotic symptom, an incivility, Goffman continues, first comes to attention because it is an infraction of a rule regarding effect restraint during daily encounters. 9 Freud was interested in pariahs, especially in what could be called pariah effect, the unruly, corset and the vicissitudes of its difficult domestication in the bourgeois Christian West. His interest in the discontents of civility preceded his concern with civilization and its discontents, 1930. The primary component in the socialization and self-image of Jews, writes James A. Sleeper, is the Pintel Yid, that ineradicable. Jewishness which surfaces at least occasionally to create havoc with carefully calculated loyalties and elaborately reasoned postures. 10. For 150 years, in fact, a whole genre of post-emancipation Jewish humor has been predicated on the sudden havoc that the involuntary eruption of Ost-Jewed identity from beneath the skin of the passing exception Jew can create in a public place. Freud's interest in slips can. Similarly, Jacob Katz, the noted authority on Jewish emancipation, explores the subject of the changing status of Jews in 19th century Freemasonry as an index of their position in the general society. Katz's subject allows one to glance behind the scenes. Jews and Freemasons in Europe, 1723-1939, trans. Leonard Ostry, Cambridge, Harvard University Press, 1970, p. 213. Be seen as deriving from interest in this archetypal slip. A recent example of such humor goes as follows. 
a Novorish Jewish couple moved to a non-Jewish neighborhood, changed their name from Cohen to Cowles, and sought admission to the country club that frowned on Jews. Finally admitted, they show up at the Sunday night club dinner, Mrs. Cowles, nay Cohen, decked out in all her jewels and a brand new gown. The waiter serving soup slips and it lands in Mrs. Cowles's lap. She lets out a shriek. Oi Javolt, whatever that means. Eleven a story such as this has different functions depending on the context in which it is told. If told by a member or representative of the Jewish community, as this one was, it is an instrument of social control, a whimsical warning to Jews not to try to assimilate and leave the Jewish community because, in a pinch, it will fail. Like the function of gossip in life, or in a Balzac novel, such jokes both are enjoyable in themselves and serve to keep people in line by citing the informal sanctions of self-defeating behavior, if told by an assimilating Jewish intellectual, however, such a joke serves as an objective correlative of his subjectively ambiguous situation. A revolutionary Jew like Marx refused with solemn prophetic anger the obliquity and gentle irony of the Jewish joking relation to their post-emancipation situation, for him. Such humor was a compromise, a cop-out, a substitute for direct, virile attacks on Western institutions. I argue that a classical genre of Jewish joke, the inner structure of Freud's theory of dreams, and the public discussion in 19th century Europe of the eligibility of the Eastern European shtetl Jew for admission to civil society, the so-called Jewish emancipation problematic, all have the same structure, there is, a, the latent dark id or yid pressing for admission to consciousness or civil society, b, there is the social moral authority, the censor, external or internalized insisting that to pass properly into western awareness or western society the course idiot should first disguise itself, assimilate, or refine itself, sublimate in a word, civilize itself, at whatever price in discontent, and finally, c, there is the idiot in the very act of passing, its public behavior in west and public places carefully impression managed by an ego vigilant against the danger of slips, in which the unseemly pariah will show through the parvenu. This isomorphism of structure, in joke, dream theory, and civil emancipation, reflects the fact that for the Jew, a latecomer to the modernization process, to leave the Middle Ages which were in Harold Garfinkel, Passing and the Managed Achievement of Sex Status in an Intersexed Person, Part 1, in Studies in Ethnomethodology, Englewood Cliffs, N.J., Prentice Hall, 1967, which I consider a cryptoanalysis of ethnic passing, Garfinkel's subject says, I have to be careful of the things I say, just natural things that could slip out. I just never say anything at all about my past that in any way would make a person ask what my past life was like. I say general things. I don't say anything that could be misconstrued, p. 148. Eternal vigilance is the price of passing. His ghetto or Stuttland to enter modern Europe was to experience the modernization process and the civilizational process as one thing, he could not become a Citoyen without becoming a bourgeois. In theory, these dimensions were analytically distinct, after all. The act of voting is not the act of speaking German or French, say, in practice, they were a package since. Fortunately or unfortunately, Jewish emancipation occurred in the bourgeois liberal era of the West. No one realized this more than Freud, born in culturally peripheral Freiburg, Moravia, in 1856, but soon to move to Pfeffergas Street in the largely Jewish quarter of Vienna called Leopoldstadt. Sophisticated and cosmopolitan Vienna was to become Freud's reference group. Freud records the following joke in jokes and their relation to the unconscious, 1905, a Galician Jew was traveling in a train. He had made himself really comfortable, had unbuttoned his coat and put his feet up on the seat. Just then a gentleman in modern dress entered the compartment. The Jew promptly pulled himself together and took up a proper pose. The stranger fingered through the pages of a notebook, made some calculations, reflected for a moment and then suddenly asked the Jew, excuse me, when is Yom Kippur, 
the Day of Atonement. Oh oh! said the Jew, and put his feet up on the seat again before answering. Twelve all the elements are here, the public, social place, a train, the identification of the Jew as an Ostjude, Galicine, the relaxed, regressive behavior, misbehavior, in a public place, the advent of the gentleman stranger as the modernizing West, in modem dress, the pose of good manners struck, and, finally, the polite intrusion, excuse me. The sudden disclosure of a shared ethnicity reconstitutes the pre-modern Gemschkaft which knew no public places with their situational proprieties, which encountered no strangers, which made no private public cleavage. Freud returns to this strange oak later and, instead of the natural feel of its imminent meaning we get a lumberingly apologetic interpretation written with the Gentile reader in mind. This anecdote of a Jew in a railway train promptly abandoning all decent behavior when he discovered that the newcomer into his compartment was a fellow believer. Is meant to portray, Freud hastens to assure us, the democratic mode of thinking of Jews, which recognizes no distinction between lords and serfs. 13. And there, embalmed in its edifying, obviously apologetic interpretation, the train joke was to remain for nearly fifty years, until it was resurrected by one of Freud's surviving disciples, Theodoc, reinterpreted, one should say, restored, and placed at the center of his book Jewish Wit. Clearly, Freud had been uncomfortable remaining on the level at which the joke had been told, the social level. It is decisive for. Freud even adds that this mode of thinking also, alas, upsets discipline and cooperation, see note 13. Any understanding of diaspora Jewry's encounter with the West and the era of social emancipation that we recognize how difficult it is for us to get from them, except via an assimilator like Simmel, a view of the social category that is inward to the social, that is, a member's, viewpoint. The social nature of society is either politicized, psychologized or economized, that is, construed on the model of the market. Hannah Arendt is but the latest in a long line of European Jewish thinkers to experience society as a curious, somewhat hybrid realm between the political, polis, and the private, oikos. 14. Maintains that this Jewish strain anecdote derives from Artur Schnitzler's novel The Way to the Opera, in which it is told by the Jewish writer Heinrich Berman to his aristocratic friend George von Werkenthin. Heinrich explains this deep joke to his friend as expressing the eternal truth that no Jew has any real respect for his fellow Jew. Envy, hate, yes, frequently admiration, even love. But never respect, for the play of all their emotional life takes place in an atmosphere of familiarity, so to speak, in which respect cannot help being stifled. Fifteen later returns to the train story, and, in a section on the intimacy of Jewish wit, finds that the anecdote does indeed show that once it is recognized that the other person is also Jewish, one need not behave 16, my emphasis. But then, shifting his focus, prefers to stress not the absence of respect but the presence of intimacy in intra-Jewish relations, in Jewish wit. Not a democratic way of thought, as Freud contends, but a certain kind of familiar intimacy is the distinguishing and decisive mark of Jewish jokes. The closeness, immediacy, and warmth that exists between priest and penitent, analyst and patient, teacher and student is different, for the intimate relationship of parishioner and priest, of student and teacher includes a certain measure of respect. 17 Eastern European Jewish intimacy, stemming from the high moral density of life with people in the shtetl, excludes respect. To define this intimacy then isolates an aggressive component in this genre of jokes, in which, for example, there is mocked a too quick and artificial adjustment to the capital of Berlin and its manners. With the addition of this aggressiveness, he writes, we are approaching the core of that intimacy whose character we tried to define. Yet we cannot grasp its peculiarity. The derisory aggression expresses, somehow, not bitter hostility and estrangement, but confidence and intimacy. More than this. It is precisely that familiarity which results in the courage to criticize, to attack, 
But how about that? Intimacy as a premise of aggression? That is psychologically difficult to grasp. 18 in this genre of joke aggression does not produce estrangement, but puts an end to it, cancels it. A pathos of distance will not be tolerated in this group of jokes. 19. What he's saying here is that the famous Jewish social impu. Dense there is no faithful translation of the Yiddish heart word, chutzpah works at once to destroy aggressively the artificiality of western passing and to restore the old familiarity of the pre-emancipation shtetl Jew. The ambiguity of the European social distance relation of respect is overcome and dissolves in the Polish Jews as it as the Jewish conviction of the unreconstructed yet beneath the civil appearance of Jews who are passing that Freud turns into a science. In psychoanalysis, the id is the functional equivalent of the id in social intercourse, on the train, the discovery of a shared ethnicity legitimates abandoning the later acquired, higher, more refined forms of gentile social intercourse. Yiddish kit is old equalizer. For Freud, the id is old equalizer. The whole business of courtship and the sexual courtesies deriving from the feudal court are confronted, by Freud, with the reality of an erect penis. With Marx, the myth of another set of brout facts is used in an attempt to subvert the hypocrisy of appearance. A neurotic patient I treated was impotent with his wife, relates, except when he first addressed her in vulgar sexual terms. In this downgrading, an emotional mechanism similar to that in the Jewish jokes, is performed in order to bring the object closer to yourself. The significant difference is that in this case the aim is sexual in its nature, while in the Jewish joke social intercourse is facilitated or rather made possible by such leveling. 20 The person can be either downgraded to one's own level, or degraded beneath one's own level. The latter will express sadistic tendencies. What Freud does is to take the mechanisms at work in this genre of Jewish wit and kick them upstairs, turning them into an objective science cites an old Eastern European joking question, how grows man? From below to above, because below all people are alike, but above the one is taller and the other smaller. 21 It is irrelevant in this type of wit whether it concerns a person from an alien culture, read, Gentile, or a Jew who seems to disavow his Jewishness, read, an assimilator. 22 The intention to dissolve aloofness, remoteness, gentility, and the distanciations of respect is the same. Helene, Rosenberg, Deutsch, b. 1884, one of the Freudian pioneers, recalls an incident from her childhood in Przemysl, Galicia, Poland, before the turn of the century, when the Jewish wood dealer, the one-eyed Mr. Stein, barged into the upper middle class Rosenberg apartment without knocking with nobody home but little Halle lying on the dining room couch reading, practically naked but for a light robe, I jumped up and demanded angrily, Mr. Stein, couldn't you knock first? The answer was, why? Isn't this a Jewish house? All the Jewish tradespeople we dealt with had this same feeling of solidarity with us despite the fact that we were members of the aristocracy. 23. That is, the values, feelings, and beliefs of the pre-modern shtetl subculture, to be Jewish fundamentalism, as I like to call it. Ernest Jones remarks that Freud felt himself to be Jewish to the core, and evidently it meant a great deal to him, 24 and notes his fondness for relating Jewish jokes and anecdotes jokes, incidentally, that often turned on a punchline that revealed Jews to be Jewish only at the core, not to the core. Consider, for example, Freud's version of the famous joke about the Baroness Field Schenfeld's confinement, the doctor, who had been asked to look after the Baroness at her confinement pronounced that the moment had not come, and suggested to the Baron that in the meantime they should have a game of cards in the next room. After a while a cry of pain from the Baroness struck the ears of the two men, ah, mon dieu, Kasia Soufrit her husband sprang up, but the doctor signaled to him to sit down it's nothing. Let's go on with the game. A little later there were again sounds from the pregnant woman, mine got, mine got, what terrible pains exclamation mark aren't you going in, doctor? 
asked the Baron. No, no. It's not time yet. At last there came from next door an unmistakable cry of one AA, AA, AA slash the doctor threw down his cards and exclaimed, now it's time. 2R. While Freud's analysis makes no mention of the Baroness's Jewishness, but merely speaks of the cries of pain uttered by an aristocratic lady in childbirth, too for we note that it is her third and last cry that Freud calls the unmistakable cry that discloses her true identity. For Freud the joke demonstrates two things, it shows how pain causes primitive nature to break through all the layers of education and how an important decision can be properly made to depend on an apparently trivial phenomenon. 27 It is my conviction that we have here the prototype of Freud's concepts of sublimation and regression. If so, once again we see how Freud began with a social psychological phenomenon, better, a phenomenon of sociological psychology, namely, the phenomenon of passing, and psychologized it. The French layer is peeled away, then the German layer, finally laying bare the momolotion tea of primary socialization underneath. Freud's primitive nature that breaks through the cultural restraints of a westernized superego is the pre-modern Jew of the pre-emancipated Shtetl. Freud turns it into a quasi-biological id. He well knew that these slips were by no means trivial phenomena, but revelatory of primordial identities upon which cultural strata had been superimposed. In Rick's account of the same joke, the transition from French to German to Yiddish cries is of interest because the return to the mother tongue or to the jargon once spoken restores the emotional at. Once again, Freud's account, as against the story as told by Wittgenstein Jewish wit, see note 15, launders the Jewish Yiddish component. In Rick's version, the Baroness's final cry is A I A I E W E M I A P. 34 A somewhat hysterical rendition of Oi V is M I A O. Woe is me, they is from the German where, woe? Leo Rossen, The Joys of Yiddish, New York. McGraw-Hill, 1968, refers to the protocol of effect governing the intensity and duration of this cry of ancestral woe, p. 273. F the mother tongue that is, Yiddish. Most of childhood and sweeps away all the superstructure. 28 Here we have the paradigm for Freud's concept of the superego, that baggage of secondary socialization, morals, education, language, taste, and effect restraint, needed by Shtetl jury to make, do and pass socially into the modern West. Thus it is that there is a long history behind Freud's view, in the case of the pain of the Baroness, that it causes primitive nature to break through all the layers of education. 29 Education Bildung, is the 19th century German burghers word for rising, as it was the 19th century German Jews word for the mind work of passing. Jacob Katz informs us that a famous Berlin actor, Albert Worm, excelled in representing Jewish characters not only on the stage but in the houses of the Berlin burghers, his favorite piece was his imitation of a Jewish woman who wished to entertain her guests by rendering one of the well-known poems from the German classics. The Jewess makes a tremendous effort to sustain the standard of high German in pronunciation and intonation. At the beginning she does indeed succeed. In the process of the performance, however, she gets carried away and reverts to the common Jew den Dutch she has been trying so hard to avoid. The whole business becomes a fuss. 30 Our conviction that with this Jewish variation of the social parvenu we are in the presence of the, Lockean, sociology of knowledge original of several of Freud's core concepts is confirmed by Freud's own account of his reaction to Austria's declaration of war in 1914. At first, he was elated. For the first time in 30 years he was 58 at the time, he felt himself to be an Austrian. But scarcely two weeks had passed before Freud, as Jones writes, came to himself. Very characteristically he described this by means of a Jewish anecdote in which a Jew who had resided in Germany for many years and adopted German manners returns to his family where the old grandfather, by examining his underclothes, decides that the German part was only veneer 31, my emphasis. Three years before Freud in Vienna used this primordial, 
primitive identity beneath the superimposed identity of the assimilating Jew to construct his ideology of psychoanalysis, Durkheim in Paris was using it to found sociology as a science. In his suicide, 1897, Durkheim's law of positive correlation of the frequency of egoistic suicide with increasing education and reflection collides with the conspicuously low suicide rate of Jews, lower than Catholics and Protestants. For Durkheim the pre-modern, medieval self of his fellow Jews was literally, as he called it, privileged in its immunity to the solvent of modernity. What for modernizing Catholics, even more for modernizing Protestants, had been an imminent, autotelic change was, for Jews, largely accommodative, allowing the mechanical solidarity of Jewish identity to continue relatively undisturbed beneath their modernization process, a kind of sociological. Marinoism, far from being the norm, as it was to become in the form of Freud's normative id, this Jewish resistance to the suicidogenic forces of modernity was, for Durkheim, the anomalous exception. For Durkheim, the exception proves the rule. Unlike the modernizing Protestant or Catholic, the Jew seeks to learn not in order to replace his collective prejudices by reflective thought, but merely to be better armed for the struggle. For him it is a means of offsetting the unfavorable position imposed on him by opinion and sometimes by law. And since knowledge by itself has no influence upon a tradition in full vigor, he superimposes this intellectual life, superpose set by intellectual, upon his habitual routine with no effect of the former upon the latter. This is the reason for the complexity he presents, la complicite de la fichonme. Primitive, primitive, in certain respects, in others he is an intellectual man of culture, un cerebral et un raffine. He thus combines the advantages of the severe discipline characteristic of small and ancient groups with the benefits of the intense culture enjoyed by our great societies. He has all the intelligence of modern man without sharing his despair. Accordingly, if in this case, intellectual development bears no relation to the number of voluntary deaths, it is because its origin and significance are not the usual ones. So the exception is only apparent it even confirms the law. Indeed, it proves that if the suicidal tendency is great in educated circles, this is due to the weakening of traditional beliefs and to the state of moral individualism resulting from this. 32. My Emphasis The Jewish social parvenu, who tried at a bound to bridge the gap between his aspiration and his real social status became a permanent figure on the stage much laughed at by the Gentiles and resented by Jews. 33 It was these value-laden social slips and gaffes, betraying the pariah idiot beneath the awkward parvenu, that Freud was to transform into value-free medical symptoms. I social unease became mental disease. Jews were not mentally ill, they were ill at ease. Psychoanalysis was to be a forensic medicine for a difficult time, the era of it would appear that the formulation of Berger, Berger, and Kellner, that modem structures of consciousness are superimposed upon the human mind is particularly relevant to groups outside the modernizing Protestant mainstream, my emphasis, J and C the homeless mind, modernization and consciousness, New York, Random House, 1973. P 144. T. This is the phenomenon modernization theorists like Robert Bella call neo-traditionalism. J. M. C. T. This insight, regarding the transformation of the social delict into the mental symptom, I learned from Irving Goffman's works, cited throughout. My contribution is to note the powerful apologetic motive at work historically behind Freud's transformation. Jewish Social Emancipation Gaffs defined as symptoms invite neither Jewish shame nor Gentile laughter. In Paris, in the same year as Freud's interpretation of dreams, 1900, and one year before his psychopathology of everyday life, 1901, the Franco-Jewish philosopher Henri Bergson published his book on laughter, Laria. He was working with the same phenomenon, the problem of social maladaptation with its slips and parapraxes. To Bergson, the comic expresses, 
above all else, a special lack of adaptability to society. The comic is that element by which the person unwittingly betrays himself, the involuntary gesture or the unconscious remark. 34. The demonstration of the connection in Bergson between the ridiculous and the unsociable, and of both with the prolongation into the elastic organic solidarity of modernizing society of a pre-modern mechanical solidarity that is, Jewish ethnic identity, which is derived in turn from Durkheim's division of labor in society, a study of the organization of superior societies, 1893, awaits further examination. Hannah Arendt notes how closely the assimilation of Jews into society followed the precept Skirter had proposed for the education of his Wilhelm Meister, a novel that was to become the great model of middle class education. 35 The young burger is educated by noblemen and actors in the presentation of self, as we might say today, so that he may learn to present and represent his individuality, since, for the middle classes and the Jews, that is, those outside high aristocratic society, everything depended upon personality and the ability to express it. The peculiar fact that in Germany the Jewish question was held to be a question of education, had its consequence in the educational philistinism of both the Jewish and non-Jewish middle classes, and also in the crowding of Jews into the liberal professions. 36 This educational program of German idealism, in its effort to spiritualize the middle class, instructed the son of both Berger and Jew in two things, the stage taught him to coordinate his body, practically forgotten in schoolrooms and offices, with his inner being and to make appearance and gesture express some meaning, while the nobleman set the example of a fuller development and use of his personal faculties together with greater confidence and courage. 37. Let us return to the passage in Freud's interpretation of dreams where he first broaches the idea of a psychic sensor which defends there. Arendt finds amusing the close resemblance between the devices by which Jews assimilated into Gentile civil society and Goethe's precepts by which aspiring burger sons advanced to nobleman status, origins of totalitarianism, p. 59, see note 37. Perhaps her point is that it is ironic how knowledge itself can be a means of crashing civil society. This is perhaps what Arendt intends by the term educational philistinism, viz., the depressing vision of education being used to facilitate social assimilation. This European Jewish background is at the root of her otherwise perverse attack on the Supreme Court's desegregation decision of 1954, see her reflections on Little Rock, cited in note 14 self against content centering consciousness by disguising them, just like the politeness which I practice every day is to a large extent dissimulation, 38 a form of effect restraint prevents the expression in behavior of uncivil ideas and effect, or effect expressed coarsely and directly. Freud's earliest reference to the process of censorship is in connection with effects of shame, of reproach, of psychic pain, or the feeling of injury. 39 The next year, in a paper entitled Further Remarks on the Defense Neuropsychoses, 1896, the concept moves a step closer to its meaning in the interpretation of dreams. In this paper, in consequence of the censorship exercised by the repression, there is effected a compromise between the resistance of the ego and the strength of the idea under repression which results in distortion. Freud writes of Frau P., a patient that her words always had the character of diplomatic indefiniteness, the distressing illusion was usually closely hidden, the connection between the particular sentences being disguised by a strange tone of voice, unusual forms of speech and the like. A. Compromiser distortion, my emphasis. Whenever she would recount the threats from her husband's relatives, these threats were always so mildly expressed as to stand in remarkable contrast to the pain they had admittedly caused her. Forty sometimes, especially in discussing neurotic symptom formation, Freud uses the language of compromise. This, too, of course, has social parallels, an interpersonal compromise to mend a quarrel a political or parliamentary compromise in which each side must compromise with others in order to protect one's interests. Repressed material, too, 
must submit to a compromise which alone makes its entry into consciousness possible. 41. In a paper written four years later, Screen Memories, in which he disguises his own memories, imputing them to a man of university education, aged 38, Freud writes of the compromise on the analogy of the resultant in a parallelogram of forces, 42 in which a later unconscious fantasy of lust is toned down into a synthetic childhood memory, it is precisely the coarsely sensual element in the fantasy which explains why it does not develop into a conscious fantasy but must be content to find its way elusively and under a flowery disguise into a childhood scene. 43 The fantasy is transformed expressed figuratively, the raw material is remodeled, 44 and the raw material of memory traces out of which, the screen memory, was forged remains unknown to us in its original form. 4 R. Freud's theory, then, is a theory of the relation of the coarse to the refined, of the raw to the sublime. It aroused indignant opposition by asserting that all men have ids, that is, all men are Jews. His theory refused to the fine arts, that is, to the arts that refined, all autonomy. His theory of sublimation unmasked the autonomy of the fine. Freud knew that his theory offended not so much because it sinned against truth but the matrix of Freud's theory. Because it sinned against good taste. He had fallen in love, Philip Rafe writes, with a coarse galatea. 46. In the emancipation process in the 19th century, the Eastern European Jew had been refined. Freud was very ambivalent about that achievement. As the emancipated Jew moved out from Ghetto and Stuttlen passed into Gentile society, he moved up from Ghetto and Stuttlen passed into middle class Gentile society. In Warsaw, Vienna, Berlin, and Paris, assimilation into Gesellschaft life had not been easy. Ambition, impulse, self-expression, all had to submit to the censorship of western norms, to the tyranny of bourgeois Christian decorum, effect restraint, idea restraint, in real life as in dream life, was the rule. In 1882, Freud writes his fiancée, I have such unruly dreams. 47 a year later, he writes her, in a passage, Ernest Jones notes pregnant with ideas that came to fruition half a century later, particularly in civilization and its discontents 48 that the mob give vent to their impulses, Sichoslben, and we deprive ourselves. We do so in order to maintain our integrity. We save up for something, not knowing ourselves for what. And this habit of constant suppression of natural instincts, he concludes, gives us the character of refinement 49 my emphasis. Of all the connections Freud was later to establish, between sick and healthy, trivial and important, ordinary and extraordinary, the wound and the bone none was so offensive as his linking of the coarse to the refined, or, if you will, finding the coarse in the refined, Freud's metaphor for finding the pariah Jew in the parvenu Jew, or the Jew in the Gentile gentleman. It was this particular unmasking operation of psychoanalysis that gave rise to what Raif calls the vulgar accusations of vulgarity. 50 Freud had encountered Weber's Protestant ethic, but he had experienced it, like others from the subculture of the Stittl or its equivalent, as the Protestant etiquette. It is a task of historical sociology to understand, Verston, that particular inner experience for what it was, and still is. Freud's life work was to make sense of the Jewish emancipation experience. His basic unspoken premise can be put in lapidary if vulgar form as follows, the id of the yid is hid under the lid of western decorum, the superego. Again, put crudely, Freud's psychologism systematically translated the problematic of Jewish social intercourse with Gentiles in the diaspora into problems of sexual intercourse. The public misbehavior of emancipating Jewry, slips and parapraxes, lapses, lapsus lingui and lapsus kalami or public backslidings into Yiddish kiit, the Jewish fundamentalism, revealing the unseemly pre modern Yid were universalized into revelations of every mansid. In the West, Hannah Arendt remarks, the pariah Jew was masked. He concealed his true nature wherever he went, 
and through every hole in his costume his old pariah existence could be detected. 51 Freud, a conscious pariah, was a connoisseur of these holes in Viennese parvenu Jewry. But his was not. To be a Jewish science one of his deepest forebodings, precisely because of his conviction that coiled beneath the highest refinements of the high-minded Goyer lay this same uncivilized and essentially unreformable id. The id, in other words, was a moral equalizer legitimating scientifically social equality between Jew and Gentile in late 19th century Europe. The mind of a moralist had used science to construct a scientific psychology as Marx before him had constructed a scientific socialism. Freud's theory was one more ideology of the emancipation process, joining socialism, Zionism, reform Judaism, assimilationism, and communism. Freud's theory, like Marx's, had its praxis or therapy. It was to be a liberal stoic strategy for living the diaspora. We now turn to it. The Latin word for it, id, was used by Joan Revere in her translation of the German word for it, s, in Freud's The Ego and the Id, London, The Hogarth Press, Limited, 1927. My basic point, however, is not the verbal but the structural parallel between the structural elements in Freud's theory of dreams and the socio-cultural elements in the situation of Jews in 19th century Europe. The id was indeed, as I write on page 112, an imwitting code word for the id, my emphasis. Chapter 2 The Matrix of the Method The method Freud discovered for reaching the unconscious id he called free association. While it developed out of the cathartic method of his colleague Brewer, Ernest Jones finds its source in an essay of Ludwig Born entitled The Art of Becoming an Original Writer in Three Days. Write down for three days in succession, Bourne prescribes, everything that comes into your head, without any falsification or hypocrisy. This seed sprouted twenty years later in the prescription, the primary rule of the psychoanalytic situation, in which the patient was to give his thoughts and feelings absolutely free play, verbalizing everything. Ludwig Bourne, 1786-1837, writes Jones, who had in 1818 adopted this name in place of his own, Baruch Lobb, was an idealist, a fighter for freedom, honesty, justice, and sincerity, and always opposed to oppression. The graves of Born and Hein were the only two Freud looked for when he visited Pere Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. 1. What Freud does is to create a social situation. The analytic situation which is the inversion of the civil society outside the door of his Viennese consulting room. Marx had stood Hegel on his head as a prelude to standing bourgeois society on its head. By the century's end, revolution had failed. The emancipated Jew had become further impjoyized, his internalization of the norms of Western culture had proceeded, in Freud's view, to the point of no return. The censorship that was politeness had, as we have seen, entered his very dreams, disguising the wishes of the uncivilized id. In an address of capital importance delivered by Freud in 1910 before the Second International Psychoanalytic Congress at Nuremberg, the future prospects of psychoanalytic therapy he betrays the socio-cultural secret of the origins of psychoanalytic therapy, its free association method, and the social situation the dyad of analyst and analysant, congruent with its praxis. Suppose that a number of ladies and gentlemen in good society had planned a picnic at an inn in the forest one day. The ladies make up their minds that if one of them wants to relieve a natural need she will say aloud that she is going to pick flowers, but a malicious fellow hears of this secret and has printed on the program which 3i is sent around to the whole party. If the ladies wish to retire they are requested to say that they are going to pick flowers. Of course after this no lady will think of availing herself of this flowery pretext, and other freshly devised formulas of the same kind will be seriously compromised by it. What will be the result? The ladies will own up to their natural needs without shame and none of the men will take exception to it. 2. My emphasis. This just suppose story of Freud is as Philip Reif notes, 
a parody of the reticent manners and morals of the cultivated classes of the 19th century. Freud is that malicious person three who reversed, once again, the usual conception, man's chief moral deficiency appears to be not his indiscretions but his reticence. For Freud undertakes, at least within the modest limits of a fifty-minute hour, to deflower the chaste reticence of bourgeois Christian social life. As one enters the analytic situation one must check one's manners and morals at the door. All rules, of syntax, of morality, of propriety, are to yield to the primary rule of saying whatever comes to mind. On the couch, the polite social conversation of the Gesellschaft with its forced associations is to yield to the indiscretions of the free associations of the impolite monologue of psychoanalysis. Freudianism was to be indiscreet on principle. The therapeutic hour puts an end to decorum. 5. By thus inventing a social situation of minimal inhibition Freud provided a legitimate setting in which Viennese jury, and other honorary Jews could legitimately desublimate, to westernize, and regress to their pre-modern hits. The analytic situation is a teleological suspension of the civil, an epoch of the civility and decorum natural to the West. The analytic situation is an oasis of temporary relief tea for Jewry's discomfort in the cultured state plus the primordial identity supposed to emerge in the permissive format of the psychoanalytic situation is a function of abstaining from the social norms outside that situation. Whereas Durkheim in formulating his program for a science of sociology stipulated that the first and most fundamental rule is, consider social facts as things, Durkheim's emphasis, Freud's manifesto for a science of psychology might well have begun with, consider social facts as nothings. Apropos of the flowery pretext masking coarse natural need, recall the 1899 paper on screen memories in which Freud's own later wish for deflowering a girl, p. 64, is projected backward and toned down into the childhood, screen, memory, p. 63, of snatching away her bunch of yellow flowers, p. 56 plus an oasis in the desert of reticence, as Raif calls it in Freud, p. 332. I. Conrad Kellen remarks that the title of Freud's book is badly translated as civilization and its discontents and suggests this phrase as having the feel of the original. Reflections on Eichmann in Jerusalem, Midstream 9. Number 3, September 1963, 26. This deliberate abstention from the civilities is used as a therapeutic instrument promoting free association, regression, and transference. This rule of civil abstinence, Donald Kaplan writes, prevents the analytic dialogue from lapsing into ordinary conversation. For example, at the end of an analytic session, a cordial good afternoon, or a variation of it, is exchanged as the patient leaves the consulting room. But if the session has been an especially upsetting one, the analyst may feel the impulse to add, till see you tomorrow. If the analyst withholds the impulse, he has abstained. The goal of analysis is to increase the abstinence until the basis of the relationship between analyst and patient is extinguished. 7. If improperly dosed, of course, this analytic incivility can turn the consulting room into an insulting room. Psychoanalysis is, indeed, as Hannah Arendt says, justifying her non use of it, a modem form of indiscretion. 8. But it is also, in a deeper sense, a mirror inversion of the social world, a kind of heresy. C. S. Lewis, in The Personal Heresy, asks, Is there, in social life, a grosser incivility than that of thinking about the man who addresses us instead of thinking about what he says. 9 It is significant that just before Freud constructs his bourgeois picnic in the country, to show how the indiscreet revelations of psychoanalysis, our work of revelation, 10 can bar the flight into illness that is secrecy, that is politeness, and break the spell of the bourgeois civilities. In fairy tales you hear of evil spirits whose power is broken when you can tell them their name which they have kept secret 11, he pits his own revelations against those of Bernadette of Lyod.
Think how common hallucinations of the Virgin Mary were in peasant girls in former times. So long as such a phenomenon brought a flock of believers and resulted perhaps in a chapel being built on the sacred spot, the visionary state of these maidens was inaccessible to influence. Today even the priesthood has changed its attitude to such things, it allows police and medical men to visit the seer, and since then the virgin appears very seldom. Or allow me to study the same processes. In an analogous situation which is on a smaller scale. Suppose that a number of ladies and gentlemen in good society had planned a picnic, 12, my emphasis. In Catholic peasant girls, as in bourgeois ladies and gentlemen, a collective neurosis flourishes, and it is the secondary gain of this illness that keeps it in business, and it is secrecy that keeps this gain from analytic dissolution. The indiscretions of physicians alone can break the stranglehold of these hallucinations from mariolatry to civility. Disclosure of the secret will have attacked, at its most sensitive point, the etiological equation from which the neuroses descend, will have made. The advantage through illness illusory. 13 We may presume to know what Freud had in mind as the secondary gain of the hallucination of an appearance of the virgin to a peasant girl, but what, precisely? The secondary gain is in that collective neurosis which is bourgeois respectability Freud does not explicitly tell us. It is one of his deepest secrets. It is his animus against the sublimation called refinement. It is the grudge against the beauty of the West harbored by the emancipated intelligentsia of jury. Since Solomon Maimon it had been assaulting them, making them look ugly to themselves, in their own eyes, against their own wills. Of the Mrs. K., the teacher in Brownsville who had inducted the young Norman Podhoritz into the mysteries of good taste, into the Western bourgeois Christian culture system, of her the grown man asks, rhetorically, how could she have explained to me that there was no socially neutral ground to be found in the United States of America, and that a distaste for the surroundings in which I was bred, and ultimately, God forgive me, even for many of the people I loved, and so a new taste for other kinds of people, how could she have explained that all this was inexorably entailed in the logic of a taste for the poetry of Keats and the painting of Cezanne and the music of Mozart? 14. My Emphasis Freud's ideas, George Steiner notes, are firmly bound to the expressive and suppressive idiom of the Central European, largely Jewish middle class of the late 19th century in which Freud himself came of age. 15 In one respect, at least, Freud's ideas are even more profoundly subculture bound than Steiner realizes, in the Jewish subculture from which Freud and the majority of his patients had emerged, there was no privacy as such. It is proverbial, Zborowski and Herzog write, that there are no secrets in the Shtetl. It is a joking point rather than a sore point, because basically the Shtetl wants no secrets. The great urge is to share and to communicate. There is no need to veil inquisitiveness behind a discreet pretense of minding one's own business. Isolation is intolerable. Life is with people. They conclude, echoing the book's title. 16. In the 19th century, Eastern European Jewry enters the West and commits a stupendous category mistake, systematically, it mistakes privacy for secrecy. Because, in the gemschaft of their past, privacy is neither known nor desired. 17 The many ways in which European bourgeois culture managed to institutionalize the need to be private in public the decencies, the decorum of public behavior in public places, yes, alas, respectability all this is lost on the Jewish intelli. I take this phrase from Gilbert Ryle. Gentsia of the 19th century. To them, it appears as so much hypocrisy. Insistently, they moralize it. What is for Freud repression, psychologically understood, is secrecy morally understood. Secrecy is the category moral illness, for it provides a hiding place for false motives. 18. For Freud, civility and politeness were not a social reality sui generis. He interpreted them in a moralizing fashion, as hypocrisy, secrecy, reaction formation. The Gemschkaft space of the psychoanalytic situation constituted a counter 
in which direct expressions of effect were rewarded and civil exchanges penalized. You act as if psychoanalysis stood high and perfect, and only our own faults keep us from accepting it, exclaimed Joseph Wertis, stung, as a nice, bourgeois, Jewish American medical student patient, by Freud's unabashed dogmatism. It does not seem to occur to you that it is simply polite to reckon with one's own prejudices, too. An analysis is not a place for polite exchanges, replied Freud, according to Wertis's diary of his psychoanalysis, for October 26, 1934. An analysis is not a chivalrous affair between two equals. 19 A science cannot be bourgeois, he later informed Wertis since it is only concerned with facts that are true everywhere. 20 On December 13, Wertis asked Freud how was one to know if the interpretation of a dream is correct? How does the patient react when it is wrong? I asked. He usually says nothing, said Freud, because it doesn't concern him. But I am accustomed to respond to things that are said to me, it is only polite, I said. Politeness doesn't enter into analysis, Freud said. It is a habit with me, I insisted. Perhaps, I added, I have the wrong idea of the unconscious. To be sure, said Freud, but what you have said has given you away. 21. Freud knew, of course, at once, that he was in the presence of a hopeless case. Politeness out of expediency is one thing, politeness for pleasure is remediable but politeness out of habit, politeness as inner-worldly asceticism, Weber's inner worldly chasquise, and cavected for itself betrays the depth to which bourgeois niceness has insinuated, internalized, itself. Wordis, in effect, is habitually, unconsciously polite. This is not the unconscious Freud had in mind. Wordis is analyst then and there writes him off. The patient has given himself away, betrayed himself as. Unlike these goyim and their politeness, Harry Bogan muses, I didn't have to be polite, except for pleasure. Jerome Wideman, I can get it for you wholesale, New York, Modern Library, 1937, p. 236. Objectively part of the bourgeois or gentile world. Marx's we they cleavage had been more crassly economic, Freud's cleavage is more nuanced, more socio-cultural, as befits the central conflict in the era of social emancipation. Wertis's entry in his diary for January 17, 1935, already noted, is particularly important, he forces from Freud the admission of a differentiation between the moral and intellectual life, on the one hand, in which categories Freud has been making a case for the preeminence of the Jews, and the social life of mixed society, on the other. The entry reads, Ruthless egotism is much more common among Gentiles than among Jews, said Freud, and Jewish family life and intellectual life are on a higher plane. You seem to think the Jews are a superior people, then, I said. I think nowadays they are, said Freud. When one thinks that ten or twelve of the Nobel winners are Jews, and when one thinks of their other great achievements in the sciences and in the arts, one has every reason to think them superior. Jews have bad manners, I said, especially in New York. That is true, said Freud, they are not always adapted to social life. Before they enjoyed emancipation in 1818 tons they were not a social problem, they kept to themselves, with a low standard of life, it is true, but they did not go out in mixed society. Since then they have had much to learn. 22 my emphasis. Not least among the things to be learned beyond the pale was the difficult knowledge that civic betterment doms bijelish for Besserung 23 was to involve more than the exercise of bourgeois rights, the franchise, careers ouvert so talents, etc., it was to entail also the performance of bourgeois rights governing the exchange in mixed society that is, with strangers, of those gifts known in the West as civilities. The rights and duties of the Citoyen integrated the Jew into a remote solidarity with the Gentile West. Political, economic, and legal entitlement involved, as such, no direct, face-to-face, -face, 
social interaction with one's fellow citizens. It was a mediated, not a situated, solidarity, placing little or no strain on the personality system of emancipating Jewry. Its collective representation was the Enlightenment's declaration of the rights of man. Membership in that community came for the asking. But, by this conflict was not to reach final formulation until 1950 when Morris Samuel published The Gentleman and the Jew. T. It would appear that the date 1818 is an error. Prussian Jewry's Emancipation Edict was granted on March 11, 1812. See Sallow W. Baron, The Modern Age, In Great Ages and Ideas of the Javish People, ed. Leo W. Schwartz, New York, Random House, 1956, p. 327 J. M. C. The Matrix of the Method. 1830, and certainly by 1848, the French Revolution was seen, notably by Marx, as a bourgeois revolution. Social solidarity with respectable one bourgeois society was to be consummated in immediate, face to face encounters or not at all. The social skills for negotiating such solidarity must be learned, often, by mingling with members of bourgeois society itself. This was especially difficult for a pariah people closed out from social solidarity with respectable society because it was deemed wanting in respectability in the first place. Chapter 3. Passing into the West, the passage from home. What Howard Morley Sacker refers to as the unconscious desire of Jews, as social pariahs, to unmask the respectability of the European society which closed them out one, my emphasis, was, in Freud's case at least, the conscious desire of a conscious pariah. There was no more effective way of doing this, Sacker continues, than by dredging up from the human psyche the sordid and infantile sexual aberrations that were frequently the sources of human behavior, or misbehavior. Even Jews who were not psychiatrists must have taken pleasure in the fact of social equalization performed by Freud's new thinking. The Bnibrith Lodge of Vienna, for example, delighted in listening to Freud air his theories. 2. But the shocking content of Freud's theory and the shocking praxis of his therapy were far more than an occasion for Freud's Schadenfreude. The shock of Jewish emancipation had come first. Lured by the promise of civil rights, Jews in the 19th century were disillusioned to find themselves not in the pays legal of a political society but in the pays real of a civil society. Lured by the promise of becoming citoyens, they found that they had first to become bourgeois. The ticket of admission to European society was not civil rights but bourgeois rights. The price of admission was not baptism, as Hein thought, but bile dung and behavior. This brutal bargain of Jewish emancipation is structurally built into the theory and praxis of Freud no less than into that of Marx before him. The price to be paid for being cultured is, after all, a doctrinal point of major consequence to Freud, writes Philip Reif. 3. Rafe never notes the connection with the continuing 19th century debate on Jewish emancipation. Only when we ask the vulgar sociology of knowledge question says who? 4. Emphasis in original, of Freud's universalistic formulations, such as, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny can we unpack them into? For example, each of my patients repeats the pattern and problems of 19th century Jewish emancipation. The most cursory glance at Freud's works bears this out. For example, Chapter 1 of The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, 1904, Forgetting of Proper Names, turns on the journey with the Gentile Stranger. I journeyed by carriage with a stranger from Rigasa, Dalmatia, to a station in Herzegovina. We had been discussing the customs of the Turks. I wished to relate, that, these Turks value the sexual pleasure above all else. I refrain from imparting this characteristic feature because I did not wish to touch upon such a delicate, read, course, theme in conversation with a stranger five, my emphasis and, as a result, Freud couldn't bring to mind the name of the painter signorily. One is in danger of forgetting how widespread, up into our own time, 
and not least among Jews, was the association of Jewishness with vulgarity and lack of cultivation, 6 Norman Podhoritz reminds us. Freud's Chapter 2, Forgetting of Foreign Words, opens by revealing again the Jewish milieu from which so much of his material derived, last summer, while journeying on my vacation, I renewed the acquaintance of a young man of academic education, who, as I soon noticed, was conversant with some of my works. In our conversation we drifted, I no longer remember how t, to the social position of the race to which we both belonged. He, being ambitious, bemoaned the fact that his generation, as he expressed it, was destined to grow crippled that it was prevented from developing its talents and from gratifying its desires. He concluded his passionately felt speech with a familiar verse from Virgil about a new generation that would take upon itself vengeance against the oppressors. 7. The aggravation, juries, of Jewish emancipation is the matrix of Freud's material, whether it be jokes, slips, dreams, or patience. He goes to considerable pains to reduce social gaffes and parapraxes to a non-social level. In the same book, he is his own case in point, as he recounts how he and a girl who had caught his fancy jumped up together to get a chair for the girl's elderly uncle when he entered the room. Freud ended up somehow embracing her from behind. It did not occur to anybody, he remarks, how dexterously I had taken advantage of this awkward movement, and concludes. An apparently clumsy movement may be utilized in a most refined way for sexual purposes. 8. My emphasis. Even the classic stalemate of refined polite form, when two people attempting to pass on the sidewalk move simultaneously to right and left and end up as blocked as before, Freud reduces to a coarse sex drive. This barring one's way repeats an ill mannered, provoking conduct of earlier times and conceals erotic purposes under the mask of awkwardness. The so-called naivete of young people and children is frequently only such a mask he concludes, employed in order that the subject may say or do the indecent thing without restraint. 9. My emphasis. One must be delicate about what is coarse with a gentile stranger. See Freud's 1910 essay, The Antithetical Sense of Primal Words in collected papers, see note 15, 4, 184 91. T A case of forgetting improper subjects? J M C. In 1908 Freud wrote Civilized Sexual Morality and Modem Nervousness the quotation marks indicate his irony, which is a critique of bourgeois civil society and the renunciations it demands, sexual gratification postponed long past puberty the institution of monogamous marriage, etc., our civilization is, generally speaking, founded on the suppression of instincts. Each individual has contributed some renunciation of his sense of dominating power, of the aggressive and vindictive tendencies of his personality. 10 Like Marx before him, Freud is convinced that this bourgeois era of renunciation has been a progressive one in the evolution of civilization with the single steps in it sanctioned by religion. 11 But, unlike Marx, he has no hope another stage will inevitably succeed this one, ushered in by revolution. Freud takes a liberal stoic stance, with sublimation his resigned equivalent for Marx's revolution. Freud's clientele was drawn from a new largely Jewish middle class of late 19th century Europe, only recently entering the modernization process. Coming with great expectations, they would remark to Freud, we in our family have all become nervous because we wanted to be something better than what with our origin we were capable of being. 12 Freud's patients, by and large, had not internalized the Protestant ethical equipment that would enable them to ride the late 19th century modernization process. Freud sees neurosis, Raif notes, as the penalty for ambition unprepared for sacrifice. 13 These patients were caught between the shtetl subculture of Yiddishkeit and the Gesellschaft norms of a modernizing Vienna. Hannah Arendt has drawn their portrait in the Jews and society, between Pariah and Parvenu. 14 Freud, in a sense, was their self-appointed intellectual elite, mediating them over into the promises and perils of modernity. Himself a Galiziana, he understood their problems from the inside. 
he built his analytic situation as a resocializing station, as a moratorium for their identity crisis. Though they could recontact their backward past. Though they could learn that they were suffering from reminiscences of the Shtetl. There, uneasy in their refinement, 15 they could hear from Freud the same message Kafka in 1912 told his audience of Prague Jews just before a Yiddish theatre troupe began its performance, before the Polish Jews begin their lines, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, how very much more Yiddish you understand than you think you do. 16 It is significant that it is in this very essay on civilized sexual morality that Freud informs us that the psychoanalytic physician frequently observes that neurosis attacks precisely those whose forefathers, after living in simple, healthy, country conditions, offshoots of rude but vigorous stocks, came to the great cities where they were successful and were able in a short space of time to raise their children to a high level of cultural attainment. 17 As Norman Mailer puts it, psychoanalysis came into being because a great many Arivists arrived during the 19th century. 18. If we turn now to the most celebrated of the psychoanalytical patients drawn from this Arivist German Jewish milieu, Anna O, we learn in privileged detail the remarkable congruence of situation and symptom in the developmental history of psychoanalysis. When, in 1895, in the pages of Joseph Buer and Sigmund Freud's studies in hysteria, literate, progressive Viennese puzzled over the case of Anna O, few realized that this hysterical analyse sound of Buer was Fräulein Bertha Pappenheim, daughter of a newly rich Orthodox Jewish father, Sigmund, of Liechtensteinstress, co-founder of the Sifschul Synagogue in Vienna. Never a patient of Freud's her case was nevertheless to become the catalyst of Freud's psychoanalytic method. From her recorded case history, readers learned tantalizingly little of her social circumstances, Anna was 21 when her breakdown occurred, her parents were nervous, but healthy, she was bright and stubborn, her will relinquishing its aim only out of kindness and for the sake of others, she became ill while caring for her father through his last illness. She remained at home, in bed, where Dr. Brewer found her on his first call in Christmas week of 1880. 19. The first and decisive therapeutic breakthrough occurred in the Pappenheim country home in the following summer in connection with her hydrophobic revulsion at drinking a glass of water despite a tormenting thirst. She had been living exclusively on fruits and melons for six weeks. Under hypnosis, Brewer reports, Anna disclosed the decisive conflict. She spoke about her English governess, whom she did not like and then related, with all signs of disgust, how she once entered, the governess's, room and saw her little dog, that disgusting animal, drink out of a glass. She said nothing because she wanted to be polite. After she gave energetic expression to her strangulated anger, she asked for a drink and without any inhibition drank a great deal of water, awaking from the hypnosis with the glass at her lips. With this the disturbance disappeared forever. 20. My Emphasis Anna O's predicament may thus be summed up, anger strangulated, or censored, by politeness. This, the first symptom ever to be dissolved by psychoanalysis, under hypnosis, by the cathartic method, what Anna O was to christen the talking cue was itself a psychological expression of the socio-cultural ordeal of civility, of that classically Freudian malaise, discontent in civil or bourgeois society, to be later metapsychologically elevated to civilization and its discontents. It behooves us to give a close reading to this bit of case history, it was the takeoff for the psychoanalytical movement. The effect Anna O. The idea of censorship was already present in 1895. See Buer and Freud, Studies in Hysteria, cited in full in Note 17, p. 201. And. Had kept under wraps was neither lust nor disgust, but anger. The desire to give vent to the anger was strangulated not by morality but by politeness. More exactly. The desire to be angry collided not with politeness but with another desire, namely, she said nothing because she wanted, to be polite, which is a far cry from being polite. 
All this occurred in the presence of the Gentile nanny her family had brought in from England and whom she disliked. Under hypnosis, she was able to give energetic expression to this anger, that is, in the absence of the original object of her anger, the Gentile governess, and in the presence of the permissive Viennese, the Jewish doctor, she was able, with impunity, to be impolite. With that, the symptom disappeared. It was from the inspection of this particular sequence of events that Freud was to arrive at his momentous claims. He concluded that his colleague Brewer had made, in the words of Anna Os biographer, two fundamental discoveries out of which psychoanalysis developed, a neurotic symptom results from emotions deprived of their normal outlets, and the symptom disappears when its unconscious causes are made conscious. 21. My emphasis. From this account, it is abundantly clear that the origins of psychoanalytic therapy rest not on a cognitive discovery of fact but on a decision as to what is normative, what is a normal expression for a vehement feeling such as, in this case, anger. In the provincial hinterlands of the Stittlach, from W. R. Hick so many of Anna O.'s parental generation had emigrated into Vienna, the expressive norms of Yiddish kit governing what was a normal outlet for anger were proverbially more relaxed and permissive than the rules regarding effect restraints that prevailed among the upper middle class Viennese whom the new arrivals had chosen as their reference group. Anna's disliked English governess, we may hazard, acted as the carrier of an effect discipline considerably more severe than that which she had absorbed from her parents in the earliest stages of her primary socialization. In this sense, Anna undoubtedly did suffer emotional deprivation in the sense of emotions deprived of their normal, that is, earlier, outlet. Her secondary socialization was an unsuccessful assimilation to outgroup norms, which were experienced as a deprivation. Her parents, moreover, situated between Pariah and Parvenu, were undoubtedly divided in their own minds as to what was a normal and proper expression of anger and what not. This, then, is the family setting which produced an Anna W. Greater than Ho said nothing, to her governess, because she wanted to be polite, who restrained her anger rather than commit an infraction against politeness. But Anna O. had never really internalized and made her own these rules of polite effect restraint. They were ever to be constraints, a matter of conforming externally to the rules of others by concealment and dissimulation a politics rather than an ethics or an etiquette. The politeness which I practice every day, Freud had confessed, is to a large extent dissimulation. 22 It is in this sense that we can say that Anna O had tried and failed to be polite with her governess. She had passed as polite. For what will be later seen as a symptom slash Irving Goffman reminds us, first comes to attention because it is an infraction of a rule regarding effect restraint during daily encounters. 23. Until 1890, I led the life of a daughter of a middle-class Orthodox Jewish family, Bertha Pappenheim, Anna O. writes. 24. After 1890, she would become the first Jewish feminist and a social reformer of legendary integrity. This first lady of psychoanalysis, whose identity as the Anuo of the studies in hysteria was not widely known until 1953, when Ernest Jones hailed her as the real discoverer of the cathartic method, 25 broke her lifetime of silence on psychoanalysis only once. At a board meeting of her Frankfurt home for wayward Jewish girls a board member had suggested that Mania, a Jewish farm girl from Poland who had been abandoned by a white slave dealer at the railroad station in Frankfurt when he fled the police, should see a psychoanalyst. On hearing the suggestion, Bertha Pappenheim's biographer relates, she abruptly stood up and said, her voice emphatic, Nevery not as long as I am alive slash a hush fell over the room. The other women did not understand her dramatic reaction but realized she spoke out of deep feeling. Then she said, let's go on to other matters slash and sat down. 26 Bertha Pappenheim, as Ernest Jones writes, deserves to be commemorated 27 but not, surely, as a doyen of psychoanalysis. It was as a pioneer Jewish feminist that Europe was to recall Bertha Pappenheim when, in 1954, the Bonn government, at the suggestion of Rabbi Leo Beck, 
issued a stamp in her honor in its Helpers of Humanity series. But even as a feminist her implacable independence set her apart. Abortion is murder, she announced to a panel on abortion, meeting at Bad Durkheim, Austria, in 1930, sponsored by her own Federation of Jewish Women. 28 Her reliability as a Jewess was also suspect, a lifetime of unselfish devotion to the welfare of Jewish orphans, illegitimates, and the agony was never to erase the fact that she had had the bad taste freely, and, what was worse, publicly, to criticize the lay and rabbinical leadership of the Jewish community for concealing their dirty linen from the eyes of the goyim. As we read her letters we witness a curious, hidden dimension of Jewish emancipation. In her struggle against the Jewish community's practice of concealing its dirty linen from the goyim, which some Jews justified as required by their minority situation, she found herself dis. An Agana is a Jewish wife who had been abandoned or lacked Jewish legal proof of her husband's death, and so could not remarry. As Rabbi Arnold Jacob Wolf writes, Rabbi Gershom, of Mainz, a thousand years ago began to end Jewish polygamy and its evil effects, Bertha Pappenheim finished his work. Introduction to Edinger, Bertha Pappenheim, see note 22, p. 7. Advantaged by her own kind of concealment, namely, the incompletely internalized restraints of good manners and decorum. Their constraint seems a mocking echo of her restraint. She writes from Budapest in March 9, 1911, of a visit, with a leading feminist of Budapest, to the city's chief rabbi, a tall decorative gentleman in Hungarian clerical garb. He let us wait for a long time. Without a word, like a stone, he let me look at his not noble profile, and talk. When I had finished and asked him to help, in the matter of prostitution, in the interests of individuals and of the entire Jewish community, he said, without a quiver of his eyelids, I'm not interested in this matter. Well mannered, quiet and restrained as a lamb, I tried to say, but, the decorative pastor of the Jewish congregation of Budapest, raised his hand forbiddingly and said, I do not allow myself to be converted 29, my emphasis. Irresistibly, we are carried back 30 years to that young patient of Brewer, Anna Wo, who had said nothing because she wanted to be polite and who could not give expression to her strangulated anger. In May of the following year, she writes from St. Petersburg of the experience of having the fact of her own Jewishness, in the presence of Gentile patrician ladies, become an unmentionable. Of course, she writes. The unquestioning way with which the white slave dealers, procurers, and so on, are called Jews is truly shocking. It would help very little if the Russian committee and some other people would get acquainted with me as with a Jewish woman who feels the shame and tries to work against it. The Jews are supposed to suffer quietly this kind of concealing. I want to vary the expression that everybody who is not against the meanness of our community is for it. One should not imagine that our enemies do not know what demoralization exists in the broad masses of the Jewish people. There, Jewish leaders do not want to look, and speak only about sham ethics and solidarity. I would have liked it if the noble members of our Jewish people had been at the tea table of the Russian princess yesterday and have noticed under the smooth, well-educated forms what I was feeling. 30. My Emphasis. Six days later she writes from Moscow of the Countess Barbara B. who takes her to see Moscow's Whitechapel and who turns out to be anti-Semitic. A fierce but fastidiously polite argument occurs between the two women. Our interest centers in Bertha Pappenheim's ceaseless, anomic monitoring of the gulf between her inner feelings and the social and logical forms, her ordeal of civility. The letter goes as follows. Jewish ethics and aesthetics were completely different, from Christian. I tried to explain that Christian ethics were Jewish as well. Snajimeize it, Jimeize. Jemais. Never, never. I could not convince her about ethics, and about our, alleged, lack of idealism I might have introduced myself as a Jewish woman living for an idea. As to aesthetics, the adaptability and crookedness of our race, I had to be silent, for Countess B. was right. 
she can only see the product of our difficult history. Both of us were deeply stirred. Our contact would have been different had we not been restrained by education, and civilization, had we met outside a speeding car, sick, a Christian and a Jewish woman, in a wilderness, a desert. Physically she would have been victorious, maybe also spiritually, for my enemy was right, they work for the relievement to people, bettering the people, but we Jews watch the demoralization, and the annihilation and destruction of our people with a happy grin. 31. My Emphasis Shortly after, the Russian Countess and the Viennese Jewess place around their substantive differences, it was 1911. The brackets of bourgeois civility, they perform the social rites. The offering of thanks, handshakes, and goodbyes. The Countess, Bertha Papenheim writes, was kind enough to take me to my hotel at 11 pm I thanked her. I said that I owed her thanks for she had given me most important experiences and impressions. She said she would be happy if she had been useful to me. To this, Anuo adds, with that implacable loneliness born in part of a Kantian moral rigorism that plagued the best of the children of the German Jewish diaspora, my thanks were sincere, though I knew that, conventionally and politely, I shook hands with an enemy. 32 As a member of the new Viennese Jewish middle class Bertha Pappenheim, Lucy Freeman writes, had been brought up to be polite to people, she had been carefully taught to live secretly with certain feelings she had not expressed because she felt them impolite. 33 The predicament of the attempt of this generation of emancipated Jews to integrate into a societal community founded neither on the revolutionary idea of fraternity nor on the ethnic idea of tribal brotherhood but on the impersonal liberal bourgeois idea of civility was a circumstance not lost on someone of Freud's background. Freud's patient, Dora, was drawn from the same new Viennese Jewish bourgeoisie as was Anna O as in Anna O's case. Stephen Marcus notes in his sensitive essay Freud and Dora, story, history, case history, normative assumptions were central to Freud's analysis. These norms which informed his interpretations were relatively crude and undifferentiated and Dora resisted their application to herself, Partisan Review 41, Number 1, 1974, 98, 99. Dora's Family Situation as far as I have been able to ascertain, was not even remotely of the classical Victorian variety. Her Jewish grandfather emigrated from Prague to Vienna where he made money and converted to Catholicism. Her father, it would appear, was a socialist leader and physician who, after his marriage, converted to Christianity to save his children from embarrassment, as the story goes. Her home was the scene of a ménage à trois. Her brother was a physicist and radicalized socialist who was to assassinate at a later date a leading Austrian political figure. As youths, her father and Freud, it seems. Freud thus saw the pathos of his patient's predicament, Jews were undergoing emancipation, modernization, urbanization, and civilizational processes all at the same time, even as he himself was. Today, Psychoanalysis looks less and less like a science and more and more like an inspired construct of the historical and poetic imagination, like one of those dynamic fictions through which the master builders of the 19th century, Hegel, Balzac, Auguste Comte, summarized and gave communicative force to their highly personal, dramatic readings of man and society. 34 As we look at the famous picture of the Psychoanalytic Committee in Berlin in 1922-35 Otto Rank, Karl Abraham, Max Ettingen, Ernest Jones, Freud, Sander Fierenstzai, Hans Sachs, we must learn to see them on the colonial model, as a modernizing elite, constructing plausible ideologies for their decolonizing people, for themselves, and for the imperial power. Helmut D. Schmidt tells us that in the great public debate on Jewish emancipation in Germany, 1781 to 1812, the collective names applied to the Jews as a community were nation and colony and sometimes also Jewry, Judenschaft. Zg the fact that Jews in the West are a decolonized and modernizing people, an underdeveloped people traumatized, like all underdeveloped countries, by contact with the more modernized and hence higher nations of the West goes unrecognized for several reasons. 
first, because they have been a colony internal to the West, second, because decolonization has been gradual and continuous, third, because of the democratic manners of the West, only Max Weber called them a pariah people, that is, a ritually segregated guest people, and fourth, because the modernization collision has been politicized and theologized by the charge of anti-Semitism, as, in non-contiguous Western colonies, had had a violent philosophical argument in which Freud behaved very rudely to his philosophical opponent and obstinately refused to apologize, there was even for the moment some talk of a duel, Ernest Jones, The Life and Work of Sigmund Freud, Volume I, The Formative Years and the Great Discoveries 1856-1900 in New York. Basic Books, 1953, p. 43. In his concern to assimilate Freud, in part, to literary modernism, and the case history genre to the 19th century bourgeois novel, Marcus rediscovers Dora as Victorian maiden, p. 103, and finds her family constellation interpretable as a classical Victorian domestic drama, p. 15. This is preposterous. Dora, like Anna O, and like Freud himself, is as embedded in East European Jewish culture as James Joyce is in Irish Catholic culture. The new new criticism of the Adelfri Udiana, in its impatience with the gross details copyright F history, Genesis, and ethnicity, is even more utterly Luftmannschish than the old. It is a bizarre discovery, but one fact which we now know that Freud did share with the stereotype, at least, of Victorian family life is that, on his own admission, his marriage had petered into what was virtually a marriage blank. See the letter of November 6, 1911 November Jung to Freud, in the Freud, Jung letters, the correspondence between Sigmuted Freud and C. G. Jung, ed. William Maguire, trans. Ralph Mannheim and R. F. C. Hull, Princeton, N.J., Princeton University Press, 1974, p. 456. This information has been available heretofore only in the shuffling version of Jones. See Ernest Jones, The Life and Work of Sigmund Freud, Volume 2, Years of Maturity 19,011,919, New York, Basic Books, 1955, pp. 386. 482, n.6. Passing into the West. The charge of imperialism effectively obscures the real nature of the collision, namely, between modernizing and non-modernized peoples. 37. Let us return now, and get perfect pitch on what Freud was up to by a quotation from Eric Heller, he speaks of Freud's campaigns against the decorous lies of a superficially civilized consciousness stubbornly refusing to acknowledge the teeming incivilities beneath the surface. 38 Freud's campaign, then, was not for truth and against lies, it was for shocking truth and against decorous lies. An important feature of Freud's thought, Harold Laswell writes, was its shocking content. It violated the mores especially by insisting on the sexuality of infants and children. William James, with whom Laswell contrasts Freud, was a psychologist who also had many shocking things to say, but when James said them he phrased the point with tact and glided smoothly past. 30 Why this difference? It goes deeper in Freud than nepotism, though Freud did have a romantic bohemian streak that enjoyed shocking the bourgeoisie for its own sake. James too, was deeply rebellious, but he was able to master this rebelliousness in ways that made it unnecessary for him to adopt provocative language or to break the smooth surface of his urbane manner. 40 Laswell contrasts James's tactful modes of expression and balanced presentation of human nature with Freud's countermores modes of expression and Hobbesian presentation of human nature, 41 and he seeks the source of the difference. He finds that Freud was marked by scars from deprivations of respect, partly because of the cultural minority to which he belonged, and partly as a result of the stresses connected with an improving status in the social class system, the respect structure. 42 This led to Freud's acute sense of grievance. 
43 This led in turn to Freud's including in his personality a strong demand upon the self to tolerate no acts of contempt, or other unjustifiable deprivation, without strong counteraction. And the root of this demand upon the self? Laswell finds at least one of its roots in the humiliation that Freud felt as an 11 year old when his father acceded to a humiliating command by an anti Semite. It has often been proposed that if Freud had not given in to his rebelliousness he might have phrased the discoveries regarding sexuality in less flagrantly provocative language 44, my emphasis. If we pursue this suggestion, Laswell does not, and follow its lead, we will in the end discover, I believe, the heretofore undisclosed source of Freud's famous theory of the Oedipus complex. Chapter 4. The Primal Scene. Freud in the interpretation of dreams, in the course of analyzing the infantile material in his own dreams, speaks of Paris and Roma's goals of his early longings. One many of his dreams took him to Rome. As a boy, when he studied the Punic Wars, he had identified with the Carthaginians against the Romans and, he writes, to my youthful mind Hannibal and Rome symbolized the conflict between the tenacity of Jewry and the organization of the Catholic Church adding that the increasing importance of the effects of the anti-Semitic movement upon our emotional life helped to fix the thoughts and feelings of those early days. To the wish to go to Rome, like Hannibal's lifelong wish, had become in Freud's dream life a cloak and symbol for a number of other passionate wishes, three one of which Freud immediately recounts as follows. At that point I was brought up against the event in my youth whose power was still being shown in all these emotions and dreams. I may have been 10 or 12 years old, when my father began to take me with him on his walks and to reveal to me in his talk his views upon things in the world we live in. Thus it was, on one such occasion that he told me a story to show how much better things were now than they had been in his days. When I was a young man, he said. I went for a walk one Saturday in the streets of your birthplace, Freiburg, in Moravia, I was well dressed, and had a new cap on my head. A Christian came up to me and with a single blow knocked off my cap into the mud and shouted, Jew! Get off the pavement! And what did you do? I asked. I went into the roadway and picked up my cap, was his quiet reply. This struck me as unheroic conduct on the part of the big, strong man who was holding the little boy by the hand. I contrasted this situation with another which fitted my feelings better, the scene in which Hannibal's father, Hamilcar Barker, made this boy swear before the household altar to take vengeance on the Romans. Ever since that time Hannibal had had a place in my fantasies. For, my emphasis. The shout that Jacob Freud heard was probably the ancient command that a Jew frequently heard when he encountered one of the goyim in a narrow street or defile, Makmuz Judd. Mind your manners, Jew, whereupon the Jew would obediently step into the gutter, allowing the Gentile to pass. Did Jacob Freud use this ancient phrase when he told his son this story? We do not know. If he did, and it is not unlikely the son by 1900 had forgotten it. But the meaning of the event was clear, and its sting rankled. A later talk Freud had with his half-brother had the effect of softening the criticism of his father over the cap and gutter episode, Ernest Jones notes, but his father never regained the place he had held in his esteem after the painful occasion. The lack of heroism on the part of his model man shocked the youngster who at once contrasted it in his mind with the behavior of Hamilcar. 5 The young Freud was shocked, indignant and, far more important, ashamed, ashamed of his own father. It was only a year after publishing the interpretation of dreams containing the aforementioned episode that Freud published The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, 1901, in which we read the following, Occasionally I have had to admit to myself that the annoying awkward stepping aside on the street, whereby for some seconds one steps here and there, yet always in the same direction as the other person, until finally both stop facing each other, that this barring one's way repeats an ill-mannered, provoking conduct of earlier times and conceals erotic purposes under the mask of awkwardness 6, my emphasis. What does this cryptic allusion to an ill-mannered, 
thought-provoking conduct of earlier times mean? Nowhere are we told. But we are told that manners conceal libido when they do not conceal aggression, the two faces of the repressed id. Later in the same work, he devotes part of the chapter on errors to the motivated errors of his own interpretation of dreams of the previous year. We read. On page 165, of the first edition of Interpretation, Hannibal's father is called Hastrobel. This error was particularly annoying to me. Dot. The error has Dribble in place of Hamilcar, the name of the brother instead of that of the father, originated from an association which dealt with the Hannibal fantasies of my college years and with the dissatisfaction of my father towards the enemies of our people. I could have continued and recounted how my attitude toward my father was changed by a visit to England, where I made the acquaintance of my half-brother, by a previous marriage of my. Although references are hard to locate, Professor Ben Halpin of Brandeis writes me that it is so well known that perhaps it requires no citation, personal communication, April 6, 1972. Father. My brother's oldest son was my age exactly. Thus the age relations were no hindrance to a fantasy which may be stated thus, how much pleasanter it would be had I been bum the son of my brother instead of the son of my father. This suppressed fantasy then falsified the text of my book at the point where I broke off the analysis, by forcing me to put the name of the brother for that of the father. 7. The father who had so meekly submitted to the insults from the enemies of our people he had encountered on the street in Freiburg long ago. F. Now let us turn to Freud's Oedipus complex. On June 16, 1873, the 17-year-old Freud, fresh from graduating summer come lordy from the Spurl Gymnasium, writes his friend Emile Fluss about his matura, the final exam. In Latin we were given a passage from Virgil which I had read by chance on my account some time ago, this induced me to do the paper in half the allotted time and thus to forfeit an exc. That is, excellent. So someone else got the exc, I myself coming second with good. The Greek paper, consisting of a 33 verse passage from Oedipus Rex, came off better, I was. The only good. This passage I had also read on my own account, and made no secret of it. 8. Twelve years later, in 1885 in Paris, Freud goes to see Oedipus Rex. Oedipus Rex, with Maunit Sully in the title role, made a deep impression on him. 9. Why? We are not told. But twelve years after that, in 1897, in the midst of his self analysis and the writing of the interpretation of dreams, he attempts to make sense of the gripping power of Oedipus Rex. He writes to his friend Wilhelm Fliess that only one idea of general value has so far occurred to him in the course of his attempt. Freud made this visit to his half brother Emmanuel in 1875, when he was 19. He never ceased to envy his half brother for being able to live in England, Ernest Jones writes, and bring up his children far from the daily persecutions Jews were subject to in Austria. Jones, Life and Work, see Note 5, 1, 24. Freud's own eldest son, Martin, was to pay his 80-year-old uncle Emmanuel a visit in 1918 in Southport, whence he had retired from the textile business in Manchester. Uncle Emmanuel had become in every possible detail a dignified English gentleman, he writes, and this applies to his dress, his manners and his hospitality. Martin Freud, Sigmund Freud, Man and Father, New York, Vanguard Press, 1958, pages 12 to 13, JMCT Freud had a long memory for such things. Three pages later he recounts how, on a trip from Munich to Rotterdam where he was to take a midnight steamer to England, he missed train connections for Rotterdam and Cologne. Exasperated, he stood on the railroad platform. I pondered whether or not I should spend the night in Cologne. This was favored by a feeling of piety, for according to an old family tradition, my ancestors were once expelled from this city during a persecution of the Jews. Psychic Pathology, see Note 6, p. 183. The Primal Scene. At being entirely honest with oneself, 
I have found love of the mother and jealousy of the father in my own case too, and now believe it to be a general phenomenon of early childhood. If that is the case, the gripping power of Oedipus Rex becomes intelligible, and one can understand why later fate dramas were such failures. 10 It is of capital importance that we do not miss what is occurring in this letter, the very matrix of psychoanalytic theory construction. Freud is putting forth a theory. A theory is offered an explanation of some fact or set of facts, some experience. What does this nascent theory purport to explain? Freud offers to Fliess an explanation of why he, Freud, finds reading and viewing Sophocles' Oedipus Rex such a gripping experience. If you will, Freud is resuming Aristotle's task, in the Poetics, of exploring why Oedipus is the exemplary tragedy in its power to evoke the audience's pity and terror. 11. Freud's explanation is that the Greek myth which supplies the plot of the play, the logic of its episodes, seizes on a compulsion which everyone recognizes because he has felt traces of it in himself. Every member of the audience was once a budding Oedipus in fantasy, and this dream fulfillment played out in reality causes everyone to recoil in horror, with the full measure of repression which separates his infantile from his present state. 12 Almost a month passes. You have said nothing about my interpretation of Oedipus Rex 13 he complains in a letter to Fliess. Once more we must note that Freud is not trying to explain infantile material, about his early relations to his father and mother, dredged up in the course of his self-analysis and dream analysis. He is offering an interpretation of Oedipus Rex a play and proposes a theory to explain the play's power over him and to make intelligible why he should identify so deeply with its hero, Oedipus. It is in the course of that effort that the core of the theory of psychoanalysis is boom. Now let us examine the play itself. Using the Loeb Classical Library translation of F. Store, let us turn straightway to the climactic soliloquy of Oedipus where for the first time he reveals to his queen consort, Jocas to and to the listening audience, the story of his past, the plot of the play. He relates how, having left Corinth for Delphi, where the oracle warns him that he will slay his father and marry his mother, and thus resolved not to return to Corinth and to his foster parents, whom he believes to be his real parents, he sets off with his staff down the road leading in the opposite direction. Then, Lady Comma thou shalt hear the very truth. As I drew near the triple branching roads. See how ingeniously Seth Benardit resolves the apparent contradiction between the triple road, tpnr backslash i, o 56 s, Oedipus speaks of here and the earlier reference by Jocasta, line 733, to the split road, Axe writ section 5 os. Sophocles Oedipus Tyrannus, in Sophocles, a collection of critical essays, ed. Thomas Woodward, Englewood Cliffs, N.J., Prentice Hall, 1966, p. 117j.m.c. A herald met me and a man who sat in a carriage drawn by colts, as in thy tale. The herald in front and the old man himself threatened to thrust me rudely from the path. Then jostled by the driver in wrath I struck him, and the old man, seeing this, watched till I passed and from his carriage brought down full on my head his two-pointed goad. Yet was I quits with him and more, one stroke of my good staff sufficed to fling him clean out of his seat and laid him prone. And so I slew them every one. 14. My Emphasis this passage is from the play the seventeen-year-old Freud busily boned up on to pass his maturer, and saw enacted in Paris in 1885, and read many times, and, avid to break the secret of its hold over him, returned to in the late nineties in the course of plumbing dreams and early memories. The story his father had told him at ten or twelve, I shall argue, bears an uncanny resemblance to the event that precipitated the Oedipus story the chance meeting on the street, the incivility of the threat to thrust, one, rudely from the path. This time the son doesn't take it lying down but, when jostled, strikes back in anger at the driver. 
Then, just as with Freud's father years back, Oedipus is struck full on the head, fitar of caper, but this time, instead of the unheroic conduct of his father meekly fetching his cap out of the muddy gutter, Oedipus in his fury strikes back again and kills his father. Sir Richard Jebb in his note on this passage writes as follows. I understand the scene thus. Oedipus was coming down the steep narrow road when he met the herald, to be known for such by his stave, KRJPV cough, walking in front of the carriage, r slash slash you dot off. The herald rudely bade him stand aside, and Laius, from the carriage, gave a like command. The driver, R-O-A-A-N Carrot, who was walking at his horse's heads up the hill, then did his lord's bidding by actually jostling the wayfarer, Upnofta, Oedipus, who had forborn to strike the sacred herald, now struck the driver, in another movement, while passing the carriage, he was himself struck on the head by Laius. Oedipus dashed Laius from the carriage, the herald, turning back, came to the rescue, and Oedipus slew Laius. Herald, driver, and one of two servants who had been walking by or behind the carriage, the other servant, unperceived by Oedipus, escaped to Thebes with the news. 15. My emphasis. And it is the fateful arrival on the scene of this last surviving witness to the murder that is awaited as Oedipus offers his version of his past. This servant will tell Oedipus whether it was a stranger he slew or his father, Laius. An important structural parallel should be noted, the insulting language and the murder on the road are not part of the spectacle of Oedipus Rex, the episode is not seen, but heard related. Strictly speaking, as Aristotle noted, these events lie outside the tragedy, see pounds w tige, t pow and w. 16 so also, the young boy Freud only heard the hat in the gutter episode from his father's mouth years after it happened, he did not witness it. When his young son asks him, and what did you do? Jacob Freud astounds him with his quiet reply. Contrast with Oedipus's account of his retaliation, and then some against his aggressor. C. M. Bora notes how Oedipus tells of his fatal encounter with Laius, but I, when one led the horses jostled me, struck him in anger, and no doubt he slew Laius in the same spirit. Even in his account of the episode to Jocasta we can see the excitement with which a man of action feels in recounting his exploits, and the thrill of battle which the memory of them revives. 17. It is the contention of my theory that Freud's fantasy of himself as a conquistador, though early in his life identified with Hamilcar and Massena, later, when he came to read, see, and understand Oedipus Rex, identified with Oedipus. The superego and its ideal is formed, as a Freud taught, to compensate for the loss of the parental object Cathaxis. Freud, on the day he heard from his father's lips the story, to him, ignominious, of his father's encounter with an enemy of our people, at that moment in his shame and rage he slew his father, adopting the more heroic ego ideal of Hamilcar Barker. To be ashamed of a father is a kind of moral parricide. Freud presumably experienced not only this rage and shame, but guilt about the rage and shame. He quickly censored these unacceptable feelings, unacceptable to a dutiful son ostensibly proud of his father, he repressed them. Years later he encounters Sophocles' tragedy and it lays a spell on him. As he ponders the strange grip it has on him, he comes to believe that its power lies in the secret correspondence between the play's manifest, overall plot design, the son unwittingly kills the father, marries the mother, and the repressed desire of every son to do just that, to kill his father because he desires his mother. But the idea fix that Oedipus was to become for Freud, I maintain, hinges on a small detail, small, but structurally indispensable for the action of the story, that Freud never mentions in all the countless times he retells the legend, t the whole plot starts from a social insult, a discourtesy on the road, stemming from someone in a position of social superiority, King Laius to the unknown wayfarer, Oedipus, just as the Christian in Freiburg. See Chapter 5, The Guilt of Shame, p. 
pages 58 to 63. T. I must read more about the Oedipus legend, I do not know what yet slash he writes Flies. Origins of Psychoanalysis, C. Note 10, p. 25, A. S. 3. Who forced Jacob Freud into the gutter? In both cases the inferior person is called on his manners by those who have no manners themselves and who use manners as a mask for violence or lust. Recall Freud's unmasking of the stalemate of good form in the street, with each party moving simultaneously from left to right, like Gaston and Alphonse, as, in reality concealing erotic purposes. 18. Behind decorum Freud finds violence. In both stories, the head is struck. Clearly, Oedipus does what the young Freud wished his father had done. It is a forbidden wish, one that Freud cannot admit into consciousness except in sublimated form. He will unmask these goyim. Like Hamilcar's son Hannibal, he will storm Rome seeking vengeance. He will control his anger, as his father had done, but he will use it to probe relentlessly beneath the beautiful surface of the diaspora to the murderous rage and lust coiled beneath its so-called civilities. Imagine Freud's fascination as he watches Oedipus Rex, there is in Oedipus, notes C. M. Bora, a tendency to uncontrolled anger. This appears in his pride of kingship, even in his relentless pursuit of what he believes to be the truth. He is the man who retaliates with force and does not shrink from killing an aggressor. 19 Finally, Freud reaches Rome. He liked the first Rome, ancient Rome, which he contemplated undisturbed. Not so the second Rome, medieval, Catholic Rome, superimposed on the first. I was disturbed by its meaning. He writes Flies on September 9, 1901, and, being incapable of putting out of my mind my own misery and all the other misery which I know to exist, I found almost intolerable the lie of the salvation of mankind which rears its head so proudly to heaven. 20 As we shall see subsequently, for Freud this lie of salvation assumed protean forms. In mid-December of 1883, on the train between Dresden and Rissa, an event occurred which duplicated all the essential elements, except the ending, of Freud's father on the street. Freud opened a window on the windy side of the train to get some fresh air. There were shouts to shut it. An argument ensued. A shout from the background was heard. He's a dirty Jew. And with this, Freud writes his fiancée from a Leipzig hotel, the whole situation took on a different color. My first opponent also turned anti-Semitic and declared, We Christians consider other people, you'd better think less of your precious self, etc. Freud held his ground, challenged one man to a fight. Soon the anti-Semite, this time with ironic politeness, renewed his request, that I close the window. No, I said. I'd do nothing of the kind, my emphasis. The conductor refused to take sides. Finally, another railroad official decided that in winter all windows had to be closed. Whereupon I closed it. After this defeat I seemed to be lost, a storm of jeers, abuses, and threats broke out. Freud turned and again yelled a challenge at the ringleader, who declined to take it up. Then all was quiet. 21 All the essential elements of their paternal encounter repeated themselves, the public place the dispute about the propriety of certain behavior in a public place, the charge of incivility itself made incivilly, like shouting at a child to be quiet, the physical challenge, and the ironic politeness of the Gentiles' renewed request, all with one important difference, Freud's calling their bluff by an open challenge to stand up and fight. Years later, Freud will write his book on Moses, with whom he identifies bestowing on Moses all the indignation and fury conspicuously absent from his father's behavior and prominent in the behavior of the Greek goy, Oedipus, Freud writes, the biblical story itself lends Moses certain features in which one is inclined to believe. It describes him as choleric, hot-tempered, as when in his indignation he kills the brutal overseer who ill-treated a Jewish workman. 22 The impact of such impassioned and indignant conduct a far cry from the ignominious diaspora passivity of Jacob Freud, 
which recalled the fury of Oedipus, was reason powerful enough for Freud to offend the Jewish people by declaring Moses a Gentile. One further detail should be mentioned, the narrow defile f in which Oedipus slayed his father reappears in the life of another of Freud's heroes, Hannibal, son and avenger of Hamilcar Barca against the Romans in the Second Punic War, 218-201 BC. Hannibal in the spring of 217 crossed the Apennines and advanced through the uplands of Etruria, provoking the main Roman army to a hasty pursuit, catching it in a defile on the shore of Lake Trasmanus, Hannibal, destroyed it in the waters or on the adjoining slopes. 23 In more detail, the Roman consul C. Flaminius following, Hannibal occupied the heights on the north, commanding the road from Cortona to Perugia so that when the Roman army had entered the valley, there was no escape except by forcing a passage. 24. Only Carl Abraham among psychoanalysts, to my knowledge, ever developed a public interest in the actual Sophoclean scene of the Paris side, and this was a by-product of exploring the ways the wish to murder the father is concealed in its opposite, the desire to rescue him. In his paper, the Rescue and Murder of the Father in Neurotic Fantasy Formations, 1922, he notes that the murder of Laius by Oedipus does not occur in the royal palace but in the road. This detail cannot be without significance, he writes, and he goes on to suggest that what the road signifies is the female genitalia. In his search for elements in the Oedipus legend which have hitherto passed unnoticed, the road over which father the biblical passage reads, In those days after Moses was grown up, he went out to his brethren, and saw their affliction, and an Egyptian striking one of the Hebrews his brethren. And when he had looked about this way and that way, and saw no one there, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Exodus 2, and 12. T. It is curious that the English word defile means to pollute, to violate the chastity of, and, as a noun, a narrow passage. And Sun Quarrel hardly needs further commentary, he writes. All the concrete details which, to us, cry out for a socio cultural interpretation illuminating why Freud was so drawn to the play are subsumed under the rubric of universal Freudian symbolism. The king and the driver attempt to push away the approaching Oedipus, Abraham writes, in the very area where the text invites the interpretation of social insult. Common sense invites it, two people in one another's path, each refusing to move, trading insults, passions mounting. The king strikes Oedipus. Their symbolical language here is transparent, Abraham writes. The blow on the head is a typical castration symbol. All such symbolism, is easily recognizable to the initiated. To are but what did Freud originally feel when he read or heard the son speak of the blow on the head? When his father's new fur hat was knocked into the gutter by a blow on the head, his father was not castrated. He didn't react with courage, that's all. It wasn't the blow to the head that demeaned the father in the child's eyes, but his unheroic response. It so happens that Abraham, in August 1921, sent a copy of this paper to Freud, before publication, for his advice. In his reply Freud carefully refrains from any overall estimation of the paper, but draws Abraham's attention to an awkward feature of the Oedipus passage which has already caused me a great deal of trouble. You write of the hollow way as the place of meeting, between Laius and Oedipus, and that is just as suitable to us as a symbol of the genitals as it is suitable as a spot for giving way. But the Greek text known to me. Was this the same text the 17 year old had used to pass his Greek exam at the Spurl Gymnasium? Talks of OCNT slash 0s0, which means, not hollow way, but crossroads, at which one would suppose giving way would not be difficult. Would it not be as well to consult a scholar before you publish? 26. My emphasis. I like to think that Freud's scruple, here, for the actual Greek text of Sophocles represents, at a deeper level, his fidelity to those detailed elements in the encounter of Laius and Oedipus that repeated those of his father with the kingly Goim back in Freiburg and that, 
indeed, accounted for the play's grip on him, which is what, in the first place, the Oedipus complex on my theory, was designed to explain, the congruence, namely, between the story his father, in life, told him about the past and the story Oedipus would tell him, on stage, in print, about an event in his, Oedipus, past. If Freud had lived and carried on his inquiries in a country and language other than the German Jewish milieu which supplied his patients, Hannah Arendt writes, we might never have heard of an Oedipus complex. 27 If we recall that Freud's first patient was Freud, that psychoanalysis began with Freud's self analysis, Arendt's statement becomes, I think, in an unsuspected way true. Since writing the above, I have come across two other students of Freud who find significance in the anecdote about Freud's father, but neither makes any close analytic connections with the Greek tragedy. Vincent Brome asks, could it be that, when Viennese medical circles ordered him off the medical pavement because of his sexual theories, he refused to move with such indomitable will because the humiliating picture of his father remained an unconscious driving force within him. Dot because he was not going to repeat his father's weaknesses? Freud and his early circle, London, Heinemann, 1967, p. 245. Henri F. Ellenberger writes that the young Freud was indignant about what he felt was cowardice in his father. An anecdote of that kind illustrates the gulf between the young generation and its elders, and may help he adds cryptically to explain the genesis of the concept of the Oedipus complex. This is picked up once more when, noting the lack of any positive references to his father in the interpretation of dreams, Ellenberger allows us how this makes one wonder whether Freud had not more deep-reaching reasons for this attitude toward his father than just the early childhood rivalry for his mother. The discovery of the unconscious, the history and evolution of dynamic psychiatry, New York. Basic Books, 1970, pp. 423, 452. In 1880, Jacob Ernays, the uncle of Freud's fiancée, wrote a book on the concept of catharsis in Aristotle's Poetics, a fact that reinforces my theory of the close tie between the details of the drama's plot and the details of Freud's father's story. Ibid, pp. 485. 561, n. 280. Chapter 5. The Guilt of Shame. A step in the analysis at this point ought to be spelled out more explicitly. In finding the origin of the Oedipus complex theory in an incident of Gentile insolence told to the young Freud years earlier, and in the son's embarrassment at his father's shameful response to this challenge, I am proposing not a reflection theory of the origin of the Oedipal theory, namely, that a psychological theory of Freud mechanically reflects a sociological incident of his life, and of his father's life but a dynamic theory, I propose that the psychoanalytic theory of the person is itself an active, unconscious suppression, by Freud, of socio-biographical fact, and that this suppressed social shame returns in the more legitimate and, for Freud, more tolerable admission of moral guilt spelled out in the Oedipal theory. Peter L. Berger, in a brilliant account of sociological conversions, speaks of massive social mobility itself as involving, on the part of the children, a kind of moral parricide of the father, a kind of symbolic murder of the parent in a sacrificial ritual of the mind. If there is, as he writes, an embarrassing former self, long left behind, there is perhaps an even more embarrassing former parent also left behind. It is no wonder, incidentally, he adds, that the Freudian mythology of parricide has found ready credence in American society and especially in those recently middle class segments of it in whose lives massive social mobility has been so conspicuous. 1 If it is understandable how the socially mobile would give ready credence to the Freudian mythology of parricide, allowing it, in the sociology of knowledge sense, to pass by knowledge how much more understandable it is that the socially and culturally mobile Freud should have given credence to the Oedipus mythos of Sophocles, finding it so inwardly convincing that he was helpless to resist taking it for knowledge, 
thus transforming Sophocles' tragedy into a cognitive theory of psychosexual development and sending it out into the world as psychoanalytical science. If moves up the social ladder can be experienced as parasitical betrayal, they will be doubly so experienced if they coincide, as they do in the Jewish case, with moves across the cultural divide. It is my contention, based on the texts, that Freud was ashamed of his father's behavior. I further contend that he felt guilt for being thus ashamed, what I call the guilt of shame. Guilt has been studied from every side, and shame has recently come in for its share of attention. Too but nothing has been done, so far as I know, on the guilt of shame. This is a highly specific experience, especially germane to the experience of members of acculturating and assimilating subcultures. It is an effect sui generis and phenomenologically irreducible to either guilt or shame. It is the subjective social psychological correlate of the objective sociological occurrences of social mobility, modernization, alternation, and assimilation, especially as these forces are experienced by ethnics. We experience guilt, usually, when we violate some value that we hold, when we go, actively, against what our conscience tells us, we break a promise, tell a lie, cheat on an exam or on our wives, betray a friend. Shame, on the other hand, is involuntary, we find ourselves embarrassed and ashamed, of ourselves, or of people with whom we are ascriptively identified, parents, marital partners, our own children, fellow nationals or ethnics, etc. Shame is a condition rather than an action. Shame may be about something specific. For example, after the class period is over, the teacher suddenly discovers that his trouser fly had been unzipped all the time, but the effect itself is general, it suffuses one's whole being, one is embarrassed. Nothing had been done intentionally, at best, something had been left undone, for example, unzipped, a specific, guilty deed is, in a sense, alterable, forgivable, retractable. Shame echoes and re-echoes long after the event. Shame is an exposure, not a deed. The next step in this argument is, to be ashamed of another or for another, such as a parent, is an even more shattering experience than to be ashamed of or for yourself. Because of the pervasive and specifically unalterable character of experiences of shame, Helen Lind writes, shame for one's parents can pierce deeper than shame for oneself. No matter how disgusted I am with myself, in some respects one can perhaps change. But the fact that these are my parents, is unchangeable. Shame in a kindred cannot be avoided, says a 17th century proverb. 3. I look on Freud's shame as an example of what Miss Lind calls the special character of shame felt by children for their parents. 4. But filial shame takes a further dimension when it is the embarrassment of the child who has passed beyond the parent socially and, especially, culturally. Jewish emancipation supplied an ideal matrix for such experiences. For a child of immigrant parents there is often acute conflict between the desire to look up to his parents and the shame he experiences for the exposure of their different ways and their uncertainty and unseemliness in a strange land. 5. The ignominious obsequiousness of Freud's father there was, for the son, just such an exposure experience. Helen Lind speaks of the widely felt, if not widely acknowledged, shame of children who become aware that their parents are not secure or at home in their social environment, giving as one of her examples of the object of this filial shame, deference toward other persons on the part of parents, their not knowing what to do in a situation that calls for competence, their smiling acquiescence in the place of strength their ignominious acquiescence, we might add, in place of the courage the child would have wished them to have displayed. Such shamefully submissive ineptitude may arouse in their children pity or protectiveness when they want to give respect, a feeling hard to acknowledge and hard to bear. 6. Why is this specific experience not widely acknowledged? Hard to acknowledge compared to confessions of guilt, and, even when acknowledged, hard to bear. The whole thrust of Lynn's book is to urge confrontation with shame, rather than with guilt 
as the uniquely necessary spiritual exercise for the achieving of modem identity. She opposes this Ericksonian discipline of shame to the Freudian working through of guilt. The answer is, that for the son to own up to shame for the parent, rather than to his parent's guilt, is to admit to parental inferiority rather than to his own wrongdoing. The latter is an admission about his own person, to admit the former is to consent to parental inferiority in the eyes of others, in this case, the general gentile culture. 7 The guilt of wrongdoing is easier to face than the shame of inferiority, especially when seen in a parent. Guilt, we all know, is remediable, meaningful change is possible through subsequent acts of the guilty party, repentance, restitution, or forgiveness in the moral order, apology in the social order. But the experience of being ashamed collides with the opaque facticity of all those others who cannot be changed in their appraisal of, in this case, the parental inferiority, except by revolution, Marx. But, and this is the crucial step, precisely because the parent is blameless, morally, we feel ourselves guilty for feeling ashamed of him, since it is we who have freely chosen these others as the new reference group in terms of which the parent now appears vulgar to us. Our leaving the orbit of the parental subculture is experienced as a free act, assimilation. The distance we thereby put between our parents and ourselves is the very freely chosen condition without which we would not have winced in shame of them in the first place. So, paradoxically, it is we who are guilty for achieving those things, social mobility, refinement, assimilation, in virtue of which we experience our own parents as embarrassing and distasteful to us. To have remained within the primitive togetherness of the parental subculture of our origin would have immunized us against being ashamed of it. Alternatively, to experience shame of that subculture is to admit the guilt of having moved beyond it and so betrayed it. This is the guilt of shame, secretly, we know that we are responsible for being ashamed, not the parents for being shameful, or shameless. Their appearing vulgar to us is the price we must pay for becoming refined. Cultural conversion changes a person's taste. There is an inexorable logic of taste involved in the modernization process not unlike the logic of fate inherent in Greek tragedy. A cultural convert will often rue his first, small, blind steps in a process that leads in the end, one of them writes, to a distaste for the surroundings in which I was bred, and ultimately, God forgive me, even for many of the people I loved, and so, too, a new taste for other kinds of people. All this was inexorably entailed in the logic of a taste for the poetry of Keats and the painting of Cezanne and the music of Mozart. 8. If all of this makes sense, it will be apparent why we are anxious to hurry the initial shame experience into an admission of guilt. We move from the initial effect of shame, which is intolerable relatively, to the meta-effect of guilt about our shame. Writing of George Eliot's character Dorothea in Middle March, Helen Lind notes her eagerness to exaggerate her own guilt rather than to admit, in shame, inadequacy in the possibilities of love or loss of faith in the people and the world she had trusted. 9 Shame, like envy, is a sociological effect par excellence. 10 It is deeply entwined with experiences of meaninglessness and enemy with the brought givenness of social evil. Traditional theodicy can handle moral evil, guilt, relatively easily. But certain cultural evils, irreversible moral distributions of specifically socio-cultural values, the relative superiority inferiority of the deference and prestige dimensions of stratification and the irreversibility of history. For example, we got here first and set up the rules have only revolutionary solutions for the deep kind of woes they set going in people. Otherwise, only shame answers to their facticity. Sin, guilt, punishment, each is, in one sense, an affirmation of order and significance. Shame questions the reality of any significance eleven because it obscurely intuits the irreversible arbitrariness of the conditions that generate it. That is why political revolution achieves its deepest and most secret ambition in the rewriting of history itself. With this as background, we can return to Freud. The parasite Freud committed was committed by Freud's shame of him. 
The opposite of shame is courage. In Sophocles Oedipus Rex Freud sees passive shame reenacted as courage. Courage, Lind writes, is the counterpart of shame. 12 Oedipus Rex enables Freud vicariously to convert passive shame into active courage, avenging himself and his father against both his father and the general culture. Oedipus Rex, in fantasy, solves many of Freud's problems. But everything begins in the shame experience. The following passage by Norman Podhoritz, which I advert to more than once, concludes his chapter The Brutal Bargain of Part 1, A Journey in Blindness, in the autobiographical Making It, see no date. The sentence is put as a rhetorical question to certain others who have no way of understanding the logic it identifies. 6 I. Sigmund Freud. The two traits of the socio-cultural infrastructure of this shame, which structure constitutes its sociological sine qua non, are its arbitrariness and its, historico-temporal, irreversibility. So Freud mutates the shame into guilt, since it is more tolerable because more alterable to want to kill your father than to be ashamed of him. And, besides, Freud in fact does experience guilt as part of the complex emotional complex he suffers, but it is the guilt of shame, the guilt of having thrived the parent, not the guilt of having entertained the forbidden wish to kill him in order to possess the mother, it is more permissible and tolerable to own up, to blame yourself for being a parasite, in fantasy, than to be ashamed of your father, in reality, for his, and consequently your, misfortune in having been born a Jew. So Freud converts the shame into guilt. He transforms the socio-historical givenness of Judaism into the psychomoral takenness of Jewishness. From a misfortune it becomes a problem. From historical tragedy it becomes a solvable scientific problem. After some experiences of shame, Helen Lind writes, we may welcome guilt as a friend. 13. Finally, what about the positive component in the Oedipus complex theory? the socio-cultural core of the lust for the mother which sets the whole thing going. Is this forbidden lust for the mother aspect of Freud's Oedipus complex, its manifest content as culturally tabooed as the guilt at desiring the death of the father aspect, nevertheless Freud's scientific veneer for a latent wish, desire for the gentile girl, the shiksa that, subculturally, is perhaps even more forbidden? I undertake, briefly, in answer the following socioanalysis. Leslie Fiedler in The Jew in the American Novel analyzes the Zion Eros theme that surfaced in the American Jewish novel from Abraham Cohen's Rise of David Levinsky, 1917, to Ludwig Louis Zonstone 1, 1923, and Ben Hecht's Say Jew in Love, 1931. It is in the role of passionate lover that the American Jewish novelist sees himself, Fiedler writes, at the moment of his entry into American literature as Hein had seen himself in the early second generation of Jewish emancipation in Europe, and the community with which he seeks to unite himself he sees as the Shiksa. 14 By Freud's time, at the end of the century, all the strands in the importunate wish behind Jewish emancipation had faltered or failed, Rolf Amagen's social emancipation, Marx's species emancipation Hein's literary erotic emancipation all were seen as illusory utopias. Freud codified this failure in his theory of the problematics of social and sexual intercourse with the Shiksu as Gentile community. But in Freud, Abraham Cohen's view, as Fiedler puts it with regard to David Levinsky, of ghetto Judaism as a castrating force 13 is internalized and psychologized as the castrating father. In Freud the deepest taboo of Judaism, the taboo against intermarriage, the forbidden lust of the Jew for the Gentile shiks the wife or from the Hebrew shiks, blemish, the guilt of shame. The shiksa as the promise of fulfillment slash 16 is rationalized, psychologized, and reinterpreted as the desire for the mother, which desire is held taboo by everyone, of course, not just by Jews. The particularist, ritual taboo of the Jewish subculture, intermarriage, Sion Ubium is reconceptualized, and psychologized, as the universalist, scientific, anthropological taboo on incest.
Another of the tantalizing lures of Jewish emancipation is thus put to rest in the name of universalist science. Freud, in his ambivalence, could, by means of this conceptual stratagem, remain a Jew and, at the same time, not a Jew. In this way, being a Jew could develop from a politico-social circumstance into a personal, individual problem 17, my emphasis, as well as into a universal fate. Thus did Freud seek hiddily to transform a misfortune of history into a universalist science of man. The Jewish problem the ancient Jude and Fraj had been kicked upstairs. Chapter 6 The Ancient Jude and Fraj Freud came out of the Jewish Middle Ages only to enter the Jewish middle classes. Entering a highly developed and developing Europe, coming from behind, like Marx, and all the other intellectuals of the 19th century diaspora, he developed a modernization complex. The very backwardness of Shtetl Yiddishkeit gave its sons a kind of perspective from behind, Arebas, on the civilization of Europe. If you will, a lead of the retarded took the form of the punitive objectivity of the non-member. To accept the achievement of Western modernization at its own self-estimation would have been to downgrade themselves. And who enjoys doing that? Shtetl's scriptivities as they prolonged themselves into the Europe of Jewish emancipation, revealed surprising and embarrassing staying power. What was normal in the Shtetl Gemschkaft looked bad in the West. Jury, in general, was making a scene in Gesellschaft, and everybody knew it, though few would admit it. The Jews were too ashamed, the liberal Gentiles too nice. Marx had declared it openly from the start, using it as the fulcrum of his Marxism. He was rewarded by being called a self-hater, a Jewish anti-Semite. The problem renews itself again and again, as Jewish emancipation occurs again and again. Freud's critique of the developmental vicissitudes of the sexual instinct in the European modernization process was structurally equivalent to Marx's critique of the proud boast of European civil society, as Hegel had rendered it to have overcome the egoism of bourgeois economic self-interest after its emancipation from feudal controls. Marx unmasked this false universalization, claiming that the state had not assimilated these egoistic interests, had not refined them behind their back, so to speak, into identification with the common good of the political community, but that, on the contrary, these individual and group particularistic interests were using the universal state as a means to their end. The tail was wagging the dog. For Marx, Jewish pariah capitalism was exhibit in the failure of the state to assimilate bourgeois society, and for him it revealed, in coarse and unmistakable form, more honestly, so to speak, the very greed that the more spiritual Christian businessmen concealed beneath the proprieties and civilities of their economic and social exchanges. Freud faced in Western Europe, analogously, what Weber calls the erotic sublimation of sexuality. Instead of seeing in it what Durkheim in Paris and Simmel in Berlin were to see, a social institutional transubstantiation of the psychological, Freud saw only sentimentality and moral hypocrisy, Western Christian efforts to refine the irredeemably coarse, a tender-minded looking the other way. Freud's critique of the claims for the development of the sexual instinct becomes a metaphor for his critique of Western development generally. The coprophilic elements in their, sexual, instinct have proved incompatible with our aesthetic ideas. A considerable proportion of the sadistic elements belonging to the erotic instinct has to be abandoned, he concedes, but, lest we mistake his thrust, he adds. All such developmental processes, however, relate only to the upper layers of the complicated structure. The fundamental processes which promote erotic excitation, for Marx read, economic exploitation, remain always the same. Excremental things are all too intimately and inseparably bound up with sexual things, the position of the genital organs, enter urinas et feces, remains the decisive and unchangeable factor. The genitals themselves have not undergone the development of the rest of the human form in the direction of beauty, they have retained their animal caste. 1. And so, Freud concludes, even today love, 2. 
is, in essence as animal as it ever was to, my emphasis. Freud, looking at sexual activity in the West, as Marx had looked at economic activity, finds all its social institutionalization to be so much sublimation, so much superstructural disguise of coarse nature underneath. He asks of his followers that they not be taken in by this superstructure, that they not be suckered by appearances. The basis of all this, Max Weber notes, is to be found in the naturalism of the Jewish ethical treatment of sexuality. 3 To the economic naturalism of Marx, emergent Western capitalism was mere greed all dressed up in Sunday clothes, to the sexual naturalism of Freud, love in the Western world, de rougemont, is it tricked out as eros, is like a yid trying to pass as a goy. This is the fundamental metaphor. Freud finds the sexual instinct in the West essentially untransformed, unassimilated. It is stuck between pariah and parvenu much as the Jew, socially, is between pariah and parvenu. Freud is, so to speak, ego, between it on one side and superego, gentile socio-cultural demands, on the other. He warns against assimilation, against conversion. The idiot is essentially untransformable, in Jew as in Gentile. One cannot, one must not, replace the id by the superego, the Jew by the Gentile, one can, one should, replace the id by the ego, where it was, the shall ego be. Freud sets himself a twofold task, to mediate. Percent. His own people from the darkness of Yiddish Kir to the enlightenment of science, ego that is, to modernize them but warning them against going all the way over to the superego, against becoming Gentiles, that is, to prevent their becoming civilized in the western sense. His other task is to unmask the gentility of the Gentile. Freud, as a transitional figure, a kind of new Moses, will take apart the package of the modernization process offered to his people by the new Egyptians among whom they sojourn, and separate the modernization process from there. Western Christian sublimational, civilizational process. He will use the naturalism of his own subculture as a knife to cut this Western package in two. In the West, the ascetic ethic of Protestantism was in the process of penetrating, mastering, and transforming both the public world of economic and social intercourse, where one performed contracts and exchanged civilities, and the private world of sexual intercourse. In a worldly restraint was to be the great instrument of this transformation. Coarse greed and lust were being gentled. Love taught him shame, and shame, with love at strife, soon taught the sweet civilities, wrote England's 17th century poet laureate John Dryden in Simon and Iphigenia, line 133. The fierce giants of diaspora intellectual Jewry scorn all this emergent bourgeois Christian niceness as so much hypocrisy, as a lure, ultimately, to conversion to that pale Galilean who had taught, so Matthew Arnold was saying, sweetness and light. The Western Christian claimed to have linked decisively the outer with the inner, to have integrated outer conduct, economic, social, and sexual, with the inwardness of feeling and conviction, was rejected by the descendants of Judaism in Galat. Diaspora in the West forced a bitter choice on the emancipated Jewish intelligentsia, ultimately, also, on the Jewish masses, either Yiddish Kiet lacked something and the West had something to offer, or Yiddish Kiet had something and the West had nothing, essentially, to offer. In the former case, assimilation or conversion was in order, to acquire that something, in the latter case, reduction rather than conversion was indicated, that is, an essentially reductive analysis that would strip the apparently superior culture of its apparent superiority, thus elevating the apparently inferior and marginal subculture. In part, such a confrontation of cultures is a special case of the general theme of the spiritual antagonism, Vore Winters writes, between the rising provincial civilization and the richer civilization. An antagonism in which the provincial civilization, read, the subculture of the shtetl, met obviously superior cultivation. With a more or less typically provincial assertion of moral superiority. 4. 
we shall return at other places to this moral theme in the encounter of diaspora Jewry with the West. Generically we call it Hebraism, and its mission to the West is to convict its decadent civilization of corruption by confronting their manners with our morals. Trotsky would later write their morals and ours, this is a version of the international theme. Susan Sontag notes that every sensibility is self. The ancient Jude and Frage. Max Weber, for his part, finds the differences in the diaspora encounter to be ultimately structural and religious in origin. Above all, what was lacking in Judaism was the decisive hallmark of that inner worldly type of asceticism which is directed toward the control of this world, an integrated relationship to the world from the point of view of the individual's proof of salvation, certitude o salatis, which proof in conduct nurtures all else. Again in this important matter, what was ultimately decisive for Judaism was the pariah character of the religion and the promises of Yahweh. An ascetic management of this world. Was the very last thing of which a traditionally pious Jew would have thought. He could not think of methodically controlling the present world, which was so topsy-turvy because of Israel's sins, and which could not be set right by any human action but only by some free miracle of God that could not be hastened. The Jew's responsibility was to make peace with this recalcitrancy, while finding contentment if God sent him grace and success in his dealings with the enemies of his people, toward whom he must act soberly and legalistically, in fulfillment of the injunctions of the rabbis. This meant acting toward non-Jews in an objective or impersonal manner, without love and without hate, solely in accordance with what was permissible. 5. Freud's stance vis-à-vis -vis this recalcitrancy of the id is not to recommend its transformation, assimilation, but precisely to make peace with it. This is Freud's well-known stoicism, and here we find its non-Greek provenance. Freud the Jew rejected the claims of Protestant alchemy to have turned this base sexuality into the gold of love. Lust, no more than greed, could not be set right by any human action but only by some free miracle of God, in which Freud, of course, no longer literally believed, that could not be hastened. 6 The delayed parousia had caused the Calvinists to retract from the end of days the magic of the messianic event in a kind of reversal of prolepsis, back into the present where it became attenuated into the everyday magic of secular Protestant self-control. Freud was a principal disbeliever in the transformative claims of this Protestant magic, sexuality is better left with a professional marriage broker, Shadjan, than to the uplift of a Protestant minister. The Shadjan quite explicitly rated, bargained for, and exchanged all human qualities as if they were commodities which could be given an exact price. 7 Sexual activity, for Freud, remained its old, coarse, recalcitrant serving to the group that promotes it. Jewish liberalism is a gesture of self-legitimization. The Jews pinned their hopes for integrating into modern society on promoting the moral sense. Notes on Camp, in Against Interpretation and Other Essays, New York, Farah, Strauss Fitchiru, 1966, p. 290. Self. In economic activity, for Marx, until the revolution comes, selfish greed, despite its sublimated appearance, remains selfish greed. Max Weber's Quakers and Baptists, who believed that by such practices as their fixed prices and their absolutely reliable business relationships with everyone, unconditionally legal and devoid of cupidity, eight they had become spiritual, who believed, in a word, that by ridding themselves of Jewish haggling they had rid themselves of Jewish cupidity, were, to Marx, only kidding themselves. Their New Testamentary economic behavior spirituality barely concealed beneath its decorum the old sea malata of the Old Testamentary double ethic. The cupidity remained essentially the same, despite the universalism, the fastidiously fixed prices, the vaunted reliability, predictability. I had to laugh at these goyim and their politeness. The character Harry Bogan remarks in I can get it for you wholesale. They act like gentlemen to each other. They're polite all the time so they can be sure one won't screw the other. Well, 
Thank God I didn't need any substitutes for smartness. I didn't have to be polite, except for pleasure. 9 Dutiful politeness, universalistic, equable, reliable even handedness, the belief of the Calvinist in the certifiably religious merit of such economic, as of such sexual, performances does not all to one jot or tittle the rank concupiscence and avarice they serve to conceal. Bourgeois Protestant love may have eliminated haggling from courtship, as bourgeois Protestant capitalism eliminates haggling from economic exchange, but sexuality and avarice endure unchanged. From Solomon Mayman to Norman Podhoritz, from Ralph Van Higgen to Cynthia Ozick, from Marx and Lassell to Irving Goffman and Harold Garfinkel, from Herzl and Freud to Harold Lasky and Lionel Trilling, from Moses Mendelssohn to J. Robert Oppenheimer and Ayn Rand, Gertrude Stein, and Raihian II, Wilhelm and Charles, one dominating structure of an identical predicament and a shared fate imposes itself upon the consciousness and behavior of the Jewish intellectual in Galat, with the advent of Jewish emancipation, when ghetto walls crumble and the shtiklach begin to dissolve, Jury, like some wide-eyed anthropologist enters upon a strange world, to explore a strange people observing a strange halaha code. They examine this world in dismay, with wonder, anger, and punitive objectivity. This wonder, this anger, and the vindictive objectivity of the marginal non-member are recidivist. They continue unabated into our own time because Jewish emancipation continues into our own time. Chapter 7 Sexuality and Christianity, the Refining Process Sublimation is what Nietzsche calls the transformation of coarse drives into refined ones, writes Karl Jaspers. One but sublimation can take place only as a result of inhibition, Nietzsche argued, and this provides a clue to the explanation of the paradox that precisely in Europe's Christian period, the sex drive became love, a more passion, as a result of sublimation. To this is the bone that stuck in Freud's throat. Christian Europe, the Goim, had a corner on romance. The whole phenomenon of courtship and its rituals, as well as courtesy itself, descended from the feudal court. Freud was deeply ambivalent about this sublimation. Herbert Marcuse would later say what Freud never did, that sublimation is repression. The whole program of revolution as de-repression would have been abhorrent to Freud. And yet he felt that he himself was coarse, and that Jews were coarse, and that Christian refinement, sublimation, was hypocrisy. All the Christian differences to women, all the obliquities and courtesies and cunning delays in gratification converted the sex drive into Christian bourgeois love. Or did it? Was the conversion only skin deep? Freud concedes, though grudgingly, that the ascetic tendency of Christianity had the effect of raising the psychical value of love in a way that heathen antiquity could never achieve. 3. Freud looked on sublimation, the conversion of the id, much the way he and other Jews looked on the conversion of the id to Christianity, namely, with considerable skepticism. Much of psychoanalysis can be seen as an elaborate device for catching the refined id in flagranti delicto. Like Augustine before him, but with a different inner meaning, Freud was forever reminding us of the location of our genitals into urinas et feces. Everything preceding or following the sexual act, Emil Ludwig writes, was pretty much of a closed book to Freud. For no one ever called Freud sexy. I look at it this way, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Industrial Revolution under, ultimately, Calvinist auspices took hold of European avarice, one of the seven deadly sins, and organized it in rational bureaucratic forms in such a way that avarice was transubstantiated into something else. Marx, using the pre-modern pariah capitalism of his own people as his model, unmasked the whole thing as disguised greed and egoism. Similarly, feudal Catholicism and, later, bourgeois Protestantism took hold of lust another of the seven deadlies, and institutionalized it, in the course of a long socio-cultural revolution, into love. Freud, entering the West in the late 19th century, using a pre-modern, coarse, pariah model of the sex drive, 
proceeds to unmask the whole thing as at best a pious fraud. Ultimately, the spirit of bourgeois Christian love, that is, choice of partner, courtship, leading to monogamous marriage, depends on delayed consummation the way the spirit of bourgeois capitalism depends on delayed consumption. Freud paid scant attention to sexual foreplay. It either maneuvered the partners toward orgasm, or it was perversion. To Freud's shtetl puritanism, for pleasure, like courtship, essentially, or courtesy, was a form of roundaboutness, of euphemism. To play with sexual stimulation, to postpone the intense end pleasure of orgasm, was a form of goim nakis, of games goim play, endlessly refining themselves. Freud had a choice here. If the rules of that game genuinely transformed the old coarse fuck into something rare and strange, then he, Freud, was missing out on something. They were experiencing something he wasn't. He, most of the time, bore a grudge against their claim. It was another lie of theirs, he felt. In the 1960s the Supreme Court of the United States declared that something apparently pornographic, read, course, is really not pornography if it has redeeming social value, where redemption can be thought of as refinement. To redeem is to save, to save is to refine what is coarse, to give it meaning, to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. To Freud, and to the generality of diaspora jury in 19th century Europe, to become refined, which was what was happening to them, was to become spiritualized. They identified spirituality in the West with refinement and both with the stigma of assimilation. No wonder they were of two minds about it. To the Eastern European Jew this was Reform Judaism, covet or overt, and Reform Judaism, in Eastern European conviction, could no more refine their, orthodox, yid than bourgeois Christianity could refine their, primordial, id. Max Weber goes to the heart of this animus against sublimation when he argues that there, ascetic aversion of pious Jews, and, we may add, of certain of their descendants in the era of Jewish emancipation, toward everything aesthetic was originally based on the second commandment of the Decalogue. But another important cause of aversion to things aesthetic is the purely pedagogic and jussive character of the divine service in the synagogue, even as it was practiced in the diaspora. Long before the disruption of the temple cult, Thus among the Jews the plastic arts, painting, and drama lack those points of contact with religion which were elsewhere quite normal. This is the reason for the marked diminution of secular lyricism and especially of the erotic sublimation of sexuality, when contrasted with the marked sensuality of the earlier Song of Solomon. The basis of all this is to be found in the naturalism of the Jewish ethical treatment of sexuality. Degrees, my emphasis. The concept of marrying because one had fallen in love, Frud's disciple Theodore assures us, was inconceivable to the older Jewish generation in his boyhood Vienna, love is to be found only in novels and plays, was their conviction. Love, which was not considered a necessary condition to marriage within the ghetto and which became so highly valued in the period of the emancipation, six was a highly problematic matter to Freud in late 19th century Vienna. No says decisively, love or romance had no place in the Judengus. Meeting and mating was the Shadjans, matchmakers, doing. Seven a whole genre of Jewish wit turns on the ways the Shadjan would mislabel his product as a broker in the give and take of matchmaking. No individual object choice is legitimated within the shtetl subculture. The love-death linkage of the romantic love complex occurred only at the turn of the century, in authors like Arthur Schnitzler. Eight with Jewish emancipation, there were earlier figures such as the highly romantic Heinrich Hein. But these were emancipated Jews. Unemancipated Jews even today, writes Ernest van den Haag, are characterized by a non-aesthetic, utilitarian attitude toward the body, whether they are religious or not. 9 Alfred Kazin's parents, Van den Haag writes, commenting on Kazin's memoir A Walker in the City, regarded love as a goyish invention, 10 and so, in fact, did Freud, and so, in fact, as it happens, it was. Eros, 
of course, means intermarriage. Freud was not about to become the legitimator of assimilation, yet he was being so used 20 years after the interpretation of dreams. Ludwig Luizon would write Don Juan in 1923, Ben Hector Jew in Love in 1931. Whereas Abraham Cohen's concerns in The Rise of David Levinsky, 1917, had been social and Marxian, the secular Jewish prophet honored by Hector and Luizon, Leslie Fiedler writes, is not Marx but Freud? Psychoanalysis seemed to them one more device for mocking the middle class, one more source for arguments in defense of sexual emancipation. 11 It was also a device for pitting the putative honesty of sexuality against the hypocritical propriety of bourgeois social decorum. If Hecht's own Freudianism was of the vulgar variety, at least one of the preoccupations of his hero Joe Boschier, Nieb Nushbaum, was quintessential Freudian. Boschier, who had changed his name, who had surrounded his self with such delicate Sigmund Freud? Mannerisms that his personality has almost lost its Semitic flavor, Twelve was a Don Juan who delighted for a night or two in his physical conquests, so long as one thing held his interest, the varying mannerisms with which women surrendered their bodies fascinated him. He studied their disrobings and listened avidly to their first honest murmurings of passion. Then their slow return to planes more polite was a process which also held his studious eye for the brief humanizing and revelatory phase of sex. He felt a deep social delight. Then, Boschia lost most of his interest in copulation 13, my emphasis. Freud disbelieved in romantic love. There is an old Yiddish proverb, Sie haben sich bidlib, er sich unzik, they are madly in love, he with himself, she with herself 14 that expresses his skepticism. For Freud, Courtoisy is a decoration of sexual intercourse in the same way that courtesy decorates social intercourse. His deepest urge was to strip both of their courtliness. He experienced both as a hypocritical disguise, analogous to Marx's superstructure, that must be stripped away, like any appearance, exposing the reality underneath. In bourgeois Western lovemaking, for play, love play foreshortens the ritual of courtly love into the space-time requirements of the bourgeois bedroom. Freud and his psychoanalytical heirs make short shrift of the rules of courtly love, in the pathos and longing of such love they see the practice of coitus interruptus. They see the courtesy and gentleness, which were the essence of the courtly attitude, serving as a reaction formation against underlying sadism. The culture of which courtly love was symptomatic, concludes one analyst, had not achieved full genitality. 15. Both Marx and Freud unmasked the sublimation that was courtly love. Both had a resentment against it. It was so refined, so spiritual, so un-Jewish. The young Leslie Fiedler, commuting daily from Bergen Street in Newark to the Bronx campus of Niu would carry his descent into the classroom itself by writing Marxist interpretations of courtly love. 16 Fiedler's Love and Death in the American Novel, 1966, continues those early Marxist interpretations under the auspices of Freudianism. One senses from the start in the verse of courtly love, he writes, a desire to mitigate by ritualized and elegant foreplay a final consummation felt as brutal, read, course or else a desire to avoid entirely any degrading conjunction with female flesh. 17. Love as an aesthetic exhilaration and as a romantic feeling, Ernest van den Haag notes, never made much of a dent on Jewish attitudes toward the body or toward the opposite sex. Love as sweet suffering was too irrational. If you want her, get her. All forms of courtship which do not end in marriage are seen not as pleasures in themselves, but rather as exploitations, misuses, she takes his money, or he is just using her. 18 This tradition continues. One senses, for example, that it is sexuality and Christianity, the refining process. With considerable relief that sociologist Peter M. Bloy eventually finds a way, in his excursus on love, of translating, as he believes, 
without residue, the whole romantic love complex into the tough-minded, homanzen, utilitarian exchange system. 19. Courtship is the act of paying court or wooing. It involves the attentions and tendernesses of a man to a woman whom he desires to marry. Read Freud's deeply beautiful letters courting Martha Bermays from 1882 to 1886, The Courtship of Sigmund Freud, as it might be called. 20 His practice of love far outruns the legitimations available in his subculture. Yet, is it not apostasy to give their meanings to his experiences? So, with Martha safely in the marriage bed, he cuts back to the essentials of ancestral Yiddish kiit, in non multiplicanda prata necessitatum. It is a claim of this analysis that Freud had considerable awareness of the interrelations among the institutions of Western culture. Romantic marriage is one institution, along with the institutions of capitalism and libera, democracy, to which Christianity, especially Protestant Christianity, gave strong religious sanction. 21 Freud sensed, I think, the inner meaning nexus between European love or romantic sexual intercourse and European civil society or courteous, later, civil social intercourse. In both types of intercourse, sexual and social, distan rations are introduced that are absolutely foreign to earlier, pre-modern Gemschkaf types of sociosexual wideness. For three generations in the 12th and 13th centuries troubadours and menziners sang of a faithful love service to a high-minded and exacting lady by a frustrated and sorrowful lover, she does not grant him the amorous reward he covets but only approval, reassurance of his worth, the great lady accepts him as a being worthy of her attention, Herbert Moller writes, but only at the price of behavioral restraint and refinement of manners that is, at the price of courtois behavior. As contemporaries put it, he adds, courtoisy is the result of courtly love. 22 The full meaning of this restraint is not revealed until the 19th century, when the thesis-antithesis dualism of the 18th century enlightenment is sublated in Hegel's Enlightenment Romantic Synthesis, Christianity, by secularizing itself into refinement, emerges as a secularized spirituality. By refining substance into subjectivity, Karl Loeth claims, Christianity produced a revolutionary reversal in world history. 23. Consider, for example, Longfellow's Courtship of Miles Standish. Chapter 8. Rooting Out Roundaboutness. Even today when Cynthia Ozick writes her story Envy, or, Yiddish in America, with Edelstein of Minsk enraged at the American-born sons of suburban Jewry, she depicts assimilation as a seduction to the values of courtly love, mutes, mutations. What right had these boys to spit out the Yiddish that had bred them, and only for the sake of Western civilization? Edelstein knew the titles of their PhD theses, literary boys, one was on Sir Gull and the Green Knight, the other was on the novels of Carson McCullers. One and Edelstein's great rival Ostrava, who has such a good press, whose Yiddish translates well, and who draws crowds to his poetry readings at the Y, gets the ultimate put down, Ostrava was courtly. To Edelstein in a letter writes, please remember that when a guy from Columbus, Ohio, says Elijah the prophet he is not talking about Eliyahu Hanif Eliyahu is one of us, a folksmensch, running around in second hand clothes. Theirs is God knows what. The same biblical figure, with exactly the same history, once he puts on a name from King James, comes out a different person. The late Susan Torbs noted that the Old Testament has had the benefit of the most sublime spiritualization teeth through centuries of Christian interpretation. For bourgeois Christian love is just such a spiritualization of course sexuality. This literal level is the unspiritual level, it is the course, given Old Testament. It is like the id, understood carnally, kamalata, but, as a preparation for the New Testament, it is read spiritually, spiritualita. To refine, in psychoanalytic tradition, is to repress, to aim inhibit. The repressed impulse, which was now unconscious, was able to find means of discharge and of substitutive gratification, writes Freud, 
by circuitous routes and thus to bring the whole repression to nothing. 5. These byways and divagations of lust and rage must be found out in their secret places and exposed to the full light of day and human reason. How could I have explained to Mrs. K, writes Norman Podhoritz, that wearing a suit from de Pino would for me have been something like the social equivalent of a conversion to Christianity. Making it, New York, Random House, 1967, p. 26. T. As Irwin Edmund writes, more and more cruel and crude appeared the Old Testament in comparison with the New. Reuben Cohen enters American Life, The Minotaur Journal, 12, No. 3, June to July 1926, 252. Rooting out roundaboutness. This Enlightenment streak in, especially, the early Freudian movement is caught at the full tide of its animus against the enjoyment of the Jew by the heroine of Susan Torbs's novel Divorcing. Of Sophie Blind's father, Rudolf Landsman, M.D., a leader of the movement in Budapest, we read. It is wrong to teach a child to say thank you. Papi always said, raising his index finger if anybody in the family or the maid or the shopkeeper asked her to say thank you. Oh mama was no exception. Sometimes Papi stopped in the middle of a sentence to correct himself, just as he stopped to correct anybody else. Papi belonged to a movement dedicated to rooting out hypocrisy and roundaboutness whose leader was a man called Freud. When you asked for something you mustn't say, do you have? Or could you give me? Or I would like to ask you. No, there was no getting around Papi, Sophie wouldn't get that piece of chocolate till she said, give me. She cried. Why is it so difficult? Papi laughed. I want some chocolate, she said sullenly. Is that so? Papi said and walked on, poker faced. Her father believed that the discovery of this new science was the most important event in human history, he was doing something that would change all mankind. G. The first Freudian parental generation was at considerable pains to see to it that their children remained untempted by the forbidden fruit of the diaspora. Sublimation, courtesy, romance, none of these had an inner rationale in Freudianism. Sublimation was stopgap, furtive evasive, hypocritical, roundabout subterfuge. But gradually, as the children of the pioneers began breaking the taboo and discovered traff, the things that can reach us only through the beautiful circuit and subterfuge of our thought and desire seven enormous in our conflicts were set going and cultural tragedies occurred. In Berlin, at the time, the circle of Georg Simmel's interests included the handling of precisely such non stuff as was under Viennese ban. Simmel, 1858-1918, explored the traff, salon society, sociability, coquetry, Goethe, discretion, manners, the stranger, conversation, Christian love, tact, social games, social, parties, hierarchy, the aristocratic motive, faithfulness and gratitude, fashion, adventure, the aesthetic significance of the face, 1901. Social Impetunity, ate the pathos of ruins. If Freud in Vienna was writing sentences that began, but if the patient observes there. See also the magnificently rendered scene on p. 200 of Divorcing, see note 6, which ends the following section. It concerns the only patients of her father about whom Sophie liked to hear him talk, two Kafkaesque sisters the whole of whose lives is exhausted without residue in the sheer exchange of social civilities, good morning, goodbye, how are you, etc., and sequelly to the civilities, which are more civilities of the same order. Bourgeois or Christian civility, obliquity, here carries the burden of nihilism. Rule, a free association, and so overcomes his reticences, nine simul in Berlin, intermarried, emancipated, was interested precisely in the rules of reticence and how they could be observed. Simmel leaves the mainstream of the diaspora intelligentsia and becomes the father of the phenomenological family, of those diaspora intellectuals who, sick unto death of unmasking the goyim, decide to abstain, for a time, 
from the Everestay Grands Profondas in order to take on faith the system of appearances goim take at face and that are constitutive of their everyday lives. The phenomenological family includes Hussel, Seller, Landsberg, Dietrich von Hildebrand, Kraus, Max Jacob, the Steins, Edith, Hussel's secretary, and Gertrude, Leo's sister, Bernson, Bergson, Suzanne Langer, Wittgenstein, Sitz, Gervich, Gustavich Heiser, and their present day intellectual heirs, Morris Nittenson, Richard Gilman, Susan Sontag, and Harold Garfinkel. More will be said in another place about this family of diaspora intellectuals. In Simmel, the tragedy of his acculturation, which went hand in hand with his social assimilation, grounded his brilliant insights into the tragedy der culture. In this tragedy, the autonomy of the cultural, of the stockpile of Western objective spirit including cultural appearances, when assimilated as Bildung, ends by converting the cultural aspirant to the exigencies of its own symbolic forms. See Theory and Tragedy of Culture, in Rudolf H. Wingartner, Experience and Culture, The Philosophy of Georg Simmel, Middletown, Connecticut, Wesleyan University Press, 1962. Pages 71 to 84. Chapter 9. The Temptation Scene. Freud in Vienna tries mightily to remain neutral between his Gentile Swiss followers and the Jung, on the one hand, and Karl Abraham of the Berlin Psychoanalytic Society on the other. But clearly he regards Abraham as one of our own and Jung and the Swiss as guests of the movement whom he needs but suspects. With the publication in 1965 of the Freud Abraham letters all this was confirmed, despite the fact that some letters were omitted and most were abridged, censored, to put it less politely, one Susan Sontag writes, for, as the editors say, reasons of discretion. To the psychoanalytic movement was always discreet in public, in the civil society of the general culture. Still, we learn much. Abraham has sensed deviationism among the Swiss and desires to bring it into the open. Freud urges Abraham to exercise courtesy toward Jung, and asks him to Please be tolerant and do not forget that it is really easier for you than it is for Jung to follow my ideas, for in the first place you are completely independent, and then you are closer to my intellectual constitution because of racial kinship while he is a Christian and a pastor's son finds his way to me only against great inner resistances. His association with us is the more valuable for that. I nearly said that it was only by his appearance on the scene that psychoanalysis escaped the danger of becoming a Jewish national affair. I hope you will do as I ask. 3. My Emphasis Gentile proselytes were extremely important to Freud for another reason, only they could sure up his self-doubts that psychoanalysis might not be, as its adherents claimed, a science at all, having discovered no new truth, but a social-cultural movement of diaspora Jews who, as social pariahs, only dared say what Gentiles had known all along but, due to their gentility, had been unwilling or unable to mention. If the latter should be the case, psychoanalysis reduces in the end to what Freud half feared it might be, a counterculture adversary to the bourgeois Christian ethos of civility and respectability. The Abraham letters are valuable even in censored form, for with Abraham, unlike with Ernest Jones, as Sontag notes, Freud is able, without embarrassment, to refer to his sense of his Jewishness and the special vantage point he felt it gave, and also to confide his fears that, without adherence among the goyim, the people, psychoanalysis would be just a Jewish science and a casualty of anti-Semitism. 4. Abraham, too, notes the ethnic kinship he feels with Freud, and, after identifying the completely Talmudic technique of apposition of a paragraph in Freud's book on wit which strangely attracted him, he remarks the staying power of pre-emancipation modes of thought. After all, our Talmudic way of thinking cannot disappear just like that. 5 By July 1908 Abraham writes that Jung seems to be reverting to his former spiritualistic inclinations. But please keep this between ourselves. 
6 Freud replies by again urging tolerance, since on the whole it is easier for us Jews, as we lack the mystical element, 7 but reassures Abraham, may I say that it is consanguineous traits that attract me to you. We understand each other. But still, Abraham should have shown greater delicacy of feeling by keeping his quarrel with Jung in a latent state. Freud speculates that the suppressed anti-Semitism of the Swiss is deflected from himself to Abraham, and assures Abraham that if he, Freud, had not been Jewish, his innovations would have met with far less resistance. 8. Here we come to an important matter, essential for the understanding of post-emancipation intellectual Jewry and the kinds of ideology it generated, Marxism, Zionism, Freudianism, this is the conviction as a formulated by a Viennese contemporary of Freud, Theodor Herzl, that, on the whole, Gentiles come in two and only two varieties, namely, Verschamt und Unverschamt Antisemiten, Avert and Govert Antisemites. 9 Any wide reading in Freud puts it beyond doubt that he too shared this conviction of the founder of Zionism, that he believed, as Bacon puts it that anti-Semitism was practically ubiquitous in either latent or manifest form 10, my emphasis. On November 7, 1938, in England, Freud received three visitors, Joseph Leftwich, I. N. Steinberg, and Jacob Meatless, and told them, basically, all are anti-Semites. They are everywhere. Frequently anti-Semitism is latent and hidden, but it is there. Naturally, there are exceptions. But the broad masses are anti-Semitic here as everywhere 11, my emphasis. In the broad masses everywhere, as in the Polish and Ukrainian peasantry of the Pale, anti-Semitism is overt and takes the form of pogroms, in the middle classes, anti-Semitism is covert and takes the form of politeness. This is one route, there are others, equally important of the ethnic-specific animus of Freud and Eastern European Jewry generally against Gentile civility, they define it as a, middle-class, mask-concealing anti-Semitism. They define it as refined anti-Semitism, polite anti-Semitism, as a reaction formation against the coarse anti. An exception Freud cited here was the Catholic Count Heinrich Kaudenhof Kalagi, J.M.C. Semitic or hostile component of their own. Gentile, id, which defense against socially unacceptable antisemitism sometimes refines it all the way over into its opposite, that ideal mask for antisemitism, called philosemitism. And situations defined as real are real in their consequences. Thus we have Freud defining the resistance of the Swiss contingent to psychoanalysis as suppressed antisemitism. Note that he chooses his words carefully suppressed not repressed anti-semitism that is, an anti-semitism consciously held in check by their, what? Perhaps prudence, fear, bourgeois or Christian niceness. What you will. But the Zurichers took a long time performing their apostasy, and Freud hesitated to make the break open and irreparable, then only Jones would remain of the original Gentile members. If Jung wishes. He can be of extraordinary service to our cause T and I fully understand your wish to keep him, my emphasis, Abraham writes Freud. 12 But the young Abraham differences continue, and Freud hates to be forced to take sides openly, just because I get on most easily with you, and also with our colleague Fierenstzai of Budapest, he confesses, I feel it incumbent on me not to concede too much to racial preference and therefore neglect the more alien Aryan. 13. 26 years later, in 1934, with the beginnings of Nazism looming, he writes Oscar Pfister, Switzerland is not one of the hospitable countries. There has been little occasion for me to change my opinion of human nature, particularly the Christian Aryan variety. 14. Then, once more, the troubling matter of formulating his differences with the alien Aryan Swiss comes up. After a visit from Eugen Bliela, professor of psychiatry at the University of Zurich, and his wife, who spend a Friday evening with the Fruds, Freud writes that they both were very kind, insofar as his unapproachability and her affectation permit. 
They both tried to take me by storm and persuade me that I should not talk of sexuality, but should find another name for what does not coincide with sexuality in the popular sense. All resistance and misunderstandings would then cease. I replied, Freud writes Abraham, that I had no use for such household remedies. 15. My emphasis. It is all there, the bourgeois, polite, social formality, his unapproachability, the hypocrisy, her affectation, the attempt of the bourgeois gentile to bribe him to clean up his coarse language and settle on a polite euphemism for his coarse guillotine, sexuality. This Ostjude would not convert, that is, refine. He would remain unhousebroken. When four months after this temptation scene with Bleela, in his second letter to Pastor Fister, February 9, 1909, Freud remarks, almost parenthetically, that you are aware that for us the term sex includes what you in your pa. And Jones had entered the circle through his marriage to a Jewish woman, T note that Freud in his reply reassures Abraham by telling him that Jung adheres unreservedly to the cause, my emphasis. A psychoanalytic dialogue, C note I, P. 5. J. M. C. Toral work call love, and is certainly not restricted to the crude pleasure of the senses, my emphasis, the issue of sheer terminology becomes all the more revealing. 16 But suppose Bleela had been right, suppose a name change would have made all the difference between resistance and acceptation? I am absolutely convinced, using all the Verstein I can corral, that Freud experienced this visit and Bleela's proposal as an invitation to a sellout, that he experienced it subjectively as an act of proselytization, religious proselytization, they were offering to perform rhinoplastic surgery on his id, the sexuality he discovered behind symptoms. What he heard from these awfully kind goim was, only change your name, and we'll accept you. Let us, do a nose job on you. Then we'll accept you, that is, your id theory, your id please, that's all we ask, and it isn't much, really, is it? Freud could have said all or nearly all he had to say without creating trouble for himself, Stefan Zweig writes. Had he but been willing to draft his genealogy of the sexual life in more cautious, roundabout, non-committal phraseology? Had he been prepared to hang a verbal fig leaf in front of his indelicate convictions? They could have smuggled themselves into recognition without attracting disagreeable attention. It might have even sufficed had he been willing. To use instead of the blunt term libido the politer epithet eros or love. But Freud, scorning the minor courtesies, and inspired with a detestation for half measures, used the plainest possible words and would consent to no circumlocutions. 17. Freud's proud and moving refusal was, literally, a refusal to apostatize from Yiddish kiit, and from the functional equivalents, in Galat, of Yiddish kiit. It is precisely here that we find the inner link between the earlier Freud and the later Freud of the metapsychological works of 1928 and 1930, the future of an illusion and civilization and its discontents. Freud's sexual fundamentalism is legitimated by a religious fundamentalism. This latter indicts as dishonest Protestantisms, and, for that matter, Reform Judaism's sublimation of Jehovah into a God without thunder. Freud writes. Where questions of religion are concerned, people are guilty of every possible kind of insincerity and intellectual misdemeanor. Philosophers stretch the meaning of words until they retain scarcely anything of their original sense, by calling God some vague abstraction which they have created for themselves, they pose as deists, as believers, before the world. They may even pride themselves on having attained a higher and purer idea of God, although their God is nothing but an insubstantial shadow and no longer the mighty personality of religious doctrine. 18. The id may not make itself acceptable by refining itself, nor must the Old Testamentary God by reforming himself, nor should psychoanalysts by assimilating themselves. It is only in this context that Freud's reaction to the death of Alfred Adler becomes intelligible. 
Adler had been born in the Viennese suburb of Penzing and raised largely among Gentiles. Freud's family, in moving from Freiburg to Vienna's ghetto district of Leopoldstadt, when he was four, had come down in the world. In Leopoldstadt Freud, unlike Adler, was socialized among other Jews, as a member of a minority group. Freud's son Martin writes that the Jews who lived in Leopoldstadt in contrast, presumably, to Jews who lived in suburbs like Penzing, were not of the best type. But rents were low in this district and my father's family circumstances were poor. 19 When Adler died in May 1936 while on a lecture tour in Scotland, Arnold Zweig wrote Freud that he was touched and saddened by the news of Adler's sudden death. Freud wrote back on June 22, this letter is omitted from the letters of Sigmund Freud as follows, I don't understand your sympathy for Adler. For a Jew boy out of a Viennese suburb a death in Aberdeen is an unheard of career in itself and a proof of how far he had got on. F the world really rewarded him richly for his service in having contradicted psychoanalysis. 20 This letter has shocked the reading public who mistakenly find anti-Semitism in it, exactly as they find it, equally mistakenly, in Marx. But Freud is here attacking assimilation, which is to say, apostasy, or, to reverse this, Freud is attacking Adler's apostasy from Yiddish Kiit, which is to say, his assimilation. He sees Adler as having yielded, in his break with classical psychoanalysis, to precisely those temptations the smiling Blielers had dangled before him that Friday night long ago in Vienna. In Freud's view, Adler had traded fidelity to truth and to his own true identity for social acceptance among the Goyim. He made the truth polite, he manicured the id in the same way he polished the id, and the world rewarded him richly. For the world we must read the Goyim just as in Freud's 1914 letter to Abraham, our letter also omitted, this time from the Freud Abraham letters, where he hesitates to contradict Abraham's sus. We can see from this statement of Freud how wide of the mark the usually accurate Cynthia Olzik is, when, in the whole birth catalogue slash she declares that Freud's Selbstas was of a piece with his hatred for his inherited faith. He despised Judaism, he lacked, the courage of connection. Miss, 1, number 4. October 1972, 59, 60. Later, this slur becomes that Apocras Sigmund Freud, in Usurpation, Esquire 81, No. 5, May 1974, 173. T. Rank's biographer, Dr. Jesse Taft, notes Dr. Jones's careful inclusion dash in Volume 2 of Life and Work, 1955. See note 18 for other details, p. 160, of the fact that Rank came from a distinctly lower stratum than the others in the psychoanalytic movement. Jesse Taft, Otto Rank, A Biographical Study, New York, Bellican Press, 1958, p. 8. J.M.C. 8 Leaders of the Swiss Gentile Fister in as much as Abraham had been so right before on Jung, I have been warned against contradicting you in the judgment of the people slash 21. The official historiography of both Marxism and Freudianism is consistently reformist, Bernstein refines Marx as Jones refines Freud, Jones's life and work is a devotional work. So to refine them, to censor them, is precisely to deny the social coarseness of these conscious pariahs and their coarse ideas, a coarseness to which they clung with religious fidelity because it alone was warranty against their embjoyizement, their becoming respectable. Yet it has happened. In a 1971 New York Times magazine piece on Alfred Adler, for example, in which Freud's letter, see above, to Zweig on Adler's death is quoted. Freud's reference to Adler as a Jew boy out of a Viennese suburb is bowdlerized into a Jewish boy. Slash 22, my emphasis. Ease up on Jung, Freud again pleads with Abraham in 1909, our Aryan comrades are really completely indispensable to us, otherwise psychoanalysis would succumb to anti-Semitism. 23 by 1910 he writes that our cause is going very well and is no longer restricted to my four eyes only. 
T24 Freud was suffering a version of the particularism universalism dilemma that the post-emancipation intelligentsia experienced, if this evangel, psychoanalysis, is accepted by the goyim, that proves that it is universally true, but if it is universally true, it is no longer mine or ours. Like the Judaism that Paul diasporated among the goyim, it was universalized, upgraded, beautified with the help of Hellenism. But by then it no longer belonged to us, it was theirs and, in fact, in that spiritual mirror we looked rather bad and carnal, the letter against the spirit. Freud did not want psychoanalysis to remain an in-group, intra-ethnic secret for four eyes only. Yet he knew in his heart that, as it spread among the nice bourgeois Christian goyim, it would be cleaned up. It would assimilate. But not while I'm alive, he thought, he must have thought. When Jung finally seceded from the psychoanalytic movement, all Freud's secret self-doubt was awakened, not his fear of anti-Semitism, but his personal fear that his movement might be, in fact, not a scientific but an ethnic, minority movement and hence, understandably, without much power to convert members of the bourgeois Christian majority or to hold them after winning them over. Ernest Jones told J. W. Burrow that after Jung's defection Freud never really trusted a Gentile again. 25 I was struck, Freud writes to Abraham, by the complete analogy that, of course, the people hardly carries the thrust of Freud's meaning. He intended something considerably less appetizing. For example, a goy blib to goy means once an anti-Semite, always an anti-Semite. See Leo Rosen, The Joys of Yiddish, New York, McGraw-Hill, 1968, p. 142. J.M.C. Plus the editors of the volume in which this letter appears inform us that the then current German saying, originally from the Hebrew, was that a secret should be restricted to four eyes only. Abraham and Freud, Eds, A Psychoanalytic Dialogue, C Note 1, p. 92, N. 1. The Temptation Scene can be drawn between the first running away from the discovery of sexuality behind the neuroses by Buer and the latest one by Jung, Freud then quickly draws the startling conclusion, that makes it the more certain that this is the core of psychoanalysis. 26 But Freud knows that this observation cuts both ways, if the opposition, resistance, to psychoanalysis on the part of the Swiss stems from sociology of knowledge factors such as their religion and ethnicity, is not the advocacy of psychoanalysis correspondingly particularistic? Does it not stem from the same sociology of knowledge factors? To be even-handed, one should ask whether the sanctimonious Jung and his disciples 27, as Freud labeled the apostates, have not to write to their sanctimony equal to the right of Freud and his disciples to their unmasking of sanctimoniousness. But the inexorable logic of the meaning of each gentile defection was not lost on Freud, it put in increasing jeopardy the plausibility of the claim of psychoanalysis to be a universally valid science and exposed it both to the charge of vulgar anti-Semites that it was a Jewish science and to the scientific explorations of sociologists and historians of ideas and culture with an interest in subcultural and countercultural movements. The dilemma bugging Freud despite all his cocksness, the dilemma underlying the question of whether psychoanalysis was to be considered a cultural movement like Marxism, Marx, after all, had decked out his Weltanschauung in the pompous scientifically of scientific socialism, or a scientific enterprise, boiled down to the following, had Freud seen something others had not seen, or was he saying something others saw but would not say? For Feuerbach, Karl Loeth writes, the fundamental exponent of sensuous natural corporeality is that organ which is not mentioned by name in polite society, although by nature it has great significance in the history of the world, the natural sexuality of man. 28 Was Freud revealing a secret of nature, or was he breaking a secret of polite society? Was Freud being truthful, or being vulgar? Odd, as it may seem, Freud himself, I think was never really sure of the answer. Why not? In part, because he never clearly formulated the question. 
In his resistance to the systematic study of multiple discoveries in science, Robert K. Merton draws an obvious parallel with the resistance to psychoanalysis when, he writes, adopting without cavil the Freudians' version of their own history, when amply available facts, having far-reaching theoretical implications, were experienced as tea unedifying or unsavory, ignoble or trivial and so were conscientiously. After Hegel's synthesis, Loweth notes, Feuerbach's massive sensualism must have seemed a step backward, a barbarization of thought. From Hegel to Nietzsche, see note 28, p. 80. T note the facile positivism Merton unexpectedly falls into here, on one side we have the ample, available, pure social facts, waiting only to be registered on some indifferent sensorium, on the other side we have experience with its subjective value bias for or against these autonomous facts, in this case, against, JMC. Ignored. It is a little like psychologists having once largely ignored sexuality because it was not a subject fit for polite society. A gentleman would pass by in silence. 29 Again, the issue is fudged, did the psychologists largely ignore what they already knew? Or were they ignorant of what they refused to know? What was the inner thrust of psychoanalysis, to Chuches les Fez? Or to Epaites les Bourgeois? To see a scientific fact or to create a social scene? To see human nature or to change Western society? To explore truth or to create meaning? The Jew of emancipation, writes Howard Broats, having deserted the synagogue but not being socially accepted by non Jews lived in a kind of demi-monde with other Jews of his type. The compensation was that their thought was uncontrolled, particularly by such social demands as a gentlemanly code. They were free to develop. Psychoanalysis. 30 How is the lifting of the social demands of this code related to the content of psychoanalysis? Chapter 10. Freud's Jewishness. Many students of Freud have tackled the question of Freud's Jewishness. The Wasp Philo Semite, think of Edmund Wilson on Marx into the Finland station, for example, usually begins talking about Old Testament prophets in their lonely crusade against corruption and hypocrisy. Philip Heath and Lionel Trilling transform this Jewish prophetism into a psychological moralism in their versions of Freud. Reif, for example, considers him an ascetic, psychological Jew, with an animus against Catholicism one whose objective, like Hannibal's, was to bring down the mighty rooms of our ascetic civilization. To the Semitic mystique of this great Jew Mank was an elitist mystique by which he turned an objective disadvantage into a subjective advantage. 3 This is all true, but too much lonely psychologism prophetism, and too much French. We learn much more about Freud's Jewishness if we turn to a product of the Block Publishing Company, Earl Edelman's Judaism and Sigmund Freud's World, 1965. We would learn a good deal about post-emancipation Jewish intellectual prophets if we were to take our cue from the recent scholarship on Old Testament prophetism. Studies show that if the Israelitish prophets were not exactly company boys, they were nevertheless a good deal closer to the Jewish community than their reputation would lead us to believe. For Gilman, for example, suggests that the social location of Freud's prophetism, the essence of his Jewishness, was his convivium with other Jews. Yiddish Kiti's life is with people, a social and sociological, and not primarily a psychological moral, phenomenon. The same applies, of course, to Irish Kiti. Goish Kit etc., Gilman speaks of Freud's community activities with other Jews. Many of his important theories were delivered before the fraternity of Jewish students and the Bnei B'rith organization. Most of the colleagues in his movement were Jewish, including Alfred Adler, Wilhelm Stiekel, Max Kohain, Rudolf Lohuenstein, Barbara Lowe, Van Chies, Sander Fierenstzai, A. A. Brill. Otto Rank, Paul Federn, Joseph Brewer, A. J. Stoffer, Wilhelm Fliess and Theodor. But whatever the reasons, historical, sociological comma group bonds did provide a warm shelter from the outside world. 
in social relations. Sigmund Freud? With other Jews, informality and familiarity formed a kind of inner security, a weak feeling, illustrated even by the selection of jokes and stories recounted within the group. It is what Freud called the clear awareness of an inner identity, the secret of the same inner construction. 5. My emphasis. If Jews are, as Max Weber observed that they were, a ritually segregated guest people, pariah people, zero a distinctive hereditary social group lacking autonomous political organization and characterized by prohibitions against commensality and intermarriage originally founded upon magical, tabooistic, and ritual injunctions, seven then they remain faithful members of the community of Yiddishkeit even after emancipation to the degree that they live their social lives among their own, avoiding, consciously or unconsciously, commensality, canubium, and convivium with the goyim. The post-emancipation imjoyizement of the Jewish community, its life in the Euro-American Jeselschaften, forced their pre-modem identity to go psychologically underground. Emancipation is at the root of the moral Maronism that even secular Jewish intellectuals, from Freud to present day figures like Harvard sociologist Daniel Bell, are constrained to practice. Even in the universal otherhood, the societal community of the Goyim, Jews can recognize the tribal brotherhood of their lost convivium. I was Berm in Galat and I accept, now gladly, though once in pain the double burden and the double pleasure of my self-consciousness, the outward life of an American and the inward secret of the Jew, writes Bell. I walk with this sign as a frontlet between my eyes, and it is as visible to some secret others as their sign is to me. 8 The American outward life, the inward secret of the Jew as sign between the eyes visible only to some secret others, presumably other Jews, etc., etc. This is pretty heady stuff from a secular Jewish intellectual, a Harvard sociologist, in late 20th century. But it is perfectly understandable as an account of the way the structural differentiation involved in the emancipation modernization process is experienced by an articulate member of the second generation of Eastern European Jewry. This differentiation is experienced, social psychological ally as doubleness, as the double burden and the double pleasure of self-consciousness, of alienation. The diaspora prescription runs. Be a man in the street, a Jew at home. The old unitary Jewish ethnic solidarity prolongs itself in Galat, but as a private experience shareable lonely with others who have the same inner construction. Sometimes, in partibus infideliem, it is magically, uncannily revived, in the very midst of the cool civil nexus that binds the goyim into their self-consciousness has become the humility of the Jews, Sona Rudikov notes in Jewishness and the Younger Intellectuals, a symposium, Commentary 31, Number 4, April 1961, 352, JMC. Freud's Jewishness? Solidarity of the surface, in the very heart of the sociable Jusselschaft, across a crowded room, you know that somehow you share a primordial solidarity of the depths. I believe the links holding Jews together, in the words of Edmund Burke, writes Jacob L. Talman, to be as invisible as air and as strong as the heaviest chains, and the Jewish ingredient to be as imperceptible to the senses yet as effective in results as vital energy itself. 9 This isn't Henry Ford talking, come back to life retooling the old protocols of the elders of Zion for another go-round. It is Professor Talman, of Hebrew University, Jerusalem, trying to locate and define the staying power of an uncanny pre-modem nexus. 10. Almost 40 years earlier Freud, in a speech prepared for delivery at the Bnei Brith Lodge in Vienna, explained his early joining of that group as the irresistible attraction, for him of Judaism and Jews, of the many dark emotional forces, all the more potent for being so hard to group in words, as well as the clear consciousness of our inner identity, the uncanny intimacy that comes from the same psychic structure, die heimlich geht der in seelis and construction. 11 The most common translation of heimlich geht in the literature of psychoanalysis is the uncanny. In 1919, 
Freud wrote a 39-page paper entitled The Uncanny Twelve which exactly catches the psychological coefficient of the ambiguous sociological solidarity experienced by Jews in the modernizing period of the emancipation, namely, an unfamiliar familiarity, an open secret, an us in the midst of them uncanniness. Everybody knows that Freud, and Bell and Talman after him, are not talking of Judaism in some religious denominational sense which is the only culturally legitimate, that is, respectable, definition of religious identity the West supplies. What is most inward in their Jewish self-definitions is precisely what cannot become outward and legitimately Anglo-American, namely, the particularist inwardness of the ethnic nexus. The Western value system refuses to legitimate publicly this primordial ethnic tie as ethnic tie. As exotica, yes, it has cultural rights. Hence its stubborn, residual reality is forced underground, and, when it travels above ground, it is forced to assume the fictive identity of a denominational religion. Conservative Judaism serves this function in America. The Eastern European ethnic tribal identity dissolves only when, as, and if the social structural milieux that maintain its plausibility dissolve. In the meantime, the rights of segregation the magically derived taboos on connubium, commensalism, and convivium, listed in the order of their staying power, are more or less observed in Galat. In the meantime, Jews join the Vienna Lodge of Nybrith, like Freud, or give lectures before the Jewish Graduate Society at Columbia or Hillel at Harvard and publish them in the American Jewish Committee's commentary magazine, like. See Marshall Sclair's analysis on P. 205. Bell. In the meantime, Jews tend to marry other Jews, eat with other Jews, live among other Jews, socialize with other Jews. Sociological studies indicate that this pattern continues to be the case. In measuring the relative degree of residential concentration of the major socio religious groups in the United States, for example, Gerard Lenski finds that while white Protestants rank with Catholics as the most widely scattered and the least concentrated, Jews and black Protestants are the most concentrated. The fact that the coefficient for the Jewish group, dot 39, was even higher than for the Negro Protestants, 37, is especially remarkable, Lenski writes of this finding. Since Negroes are so severely limited in their choice of residential areas both by finances and by outgroup hostility, one can only conclude that the magnitude of the coefficient is one more indication of the strength of the communal spirit, among Jews. 13. If this is so in America in the latter half of the 20th century, it was all the more so in Fred's Europe at the end of the 19th century. Jews whatever their degree of occupational and cultural assimilation, lived, that is, socialized, apart from Gentiles. Social interaction on both sides of the Jewish-Gentile line took place with one's own kind. Social cleavage persisted. This is the Jewishness into which Freud and other secular Jewish intellectuals were socialized. In 20 years, circa 1900, in his father's assimilated Berlin house, According to Gershom Scholem, the authority on Jewish mysticism, he never met a non-Jew. The paradoxical coexistence of assimilation with social apartness seems to have struck him early. 14 It was this paradox of social apartness, of having no cross-cutting social ties with the Gentile community, that encouraged Freud's audacity. When he lobbed psychoanalysis up over the social barricades of his Jewish enclave and into the precincts of the Gentile, opposition was inevitable. Social cleavage had preceded intellectual cleavage. One of the reasons that Jews have been a major focal point of conflict, writes the author of the Coleman Report, is that there have seldom been cross-cutting lines of cleavage which tied various segments of them to other persons in society. 15. Freud preferred the company of other Jews. If, as Nathan Roten Stray each notes, a Jew is a Jew when he is with other Jews, one G then Freud remained a fairly full-time observant Jew. Freud's Jewishness was the company he kept. Chapter 1-1. The Locus of Freud's Originality. Freud, is, one keeps forgetting, 
the great liberator and therapist of speech. Stephen Marcus I. Freud was at once proud and deeply troubled by the fact that it was he, a Jew, who had discovered the sexual etiology of the neuroses. He used this ambivalence effectively. Defending psychoanalysis against its enemies in his 1925 paper The Resistances to Psychoanalysis, he concludes by saying, finally, with all reserve, the question may be raised whether the personality of the present writer as a Jew who had never sought to disguise the fact that he is a Jew may not have had a share in provoking the antipathy of his environment to psychoanalysis. One might expect Freud at this point to consider such a charge, which, in vulgar form, ran psychoanalysis is a Jewish science, beneath contempt and to refuse even to reply. Instead, he goes on as follows, nor is it perhaps entirely a matter of chance that the first advocate of psychoanalysis was a Jew. To profess belief in this new theory called for a certain degree of readiness to accept a position of solitary opposition, a position, he concludes, with which no one is more familiar than a Jew to, my emphasis. Note that Freud here does not link the content of psychoanalytical theory to the fact of his Jewishness, but rather connects his readiness to advocate and profess belief in it to his Jewishness. The Jew, being a social pariah, stands, in a sense, outside the condition of cultural hypocrisy that prevents the ventilation of the question 3 of sexuality, my emphasis. For if psychoanalysis offends men's narcissism by its theory of the power of the unconscious over the conscious ego, for and if its theory of infantile sexual life hurt every single person at the tenderest point of his own psychical development namely, in their private fantasies of their sexually innocent, asexual, childhood, then by its theory of the instincts psychoanalysis offended the feelings of individuals in so far as they regarded themselves as members of the social community 3, my emphasis. The Jew, as a non-member of such a community, and thus immune to its sanctions, could dare to be unrespectable. Freud, when he first professed the theory of sexuality, found himself, as Jones notes, in increasing opposition to his respectable colleagues and seniors. 6. Freud was disturbed as well as proud that it was he, a Jew, who had discovered the sexual etiology of neurosis, for the following reason, it opened up the whole troubling question of his originality. Was he the first to discover this sexual etiology, or the first to publicly mention it? In a word, behind the question of Freud's scientific priority lies a prior question, which can be put as follows, was he the first to see something or the first to say something? These are two very different kinds of priorities. In the former, a scientific discovery in the traditional sense has occurred. In the latter case, a socio-cultural breakthrough has occurred, if you will, a social invention rather than a scientific discovery. If psychoanalysis is the former kind of discovery, it was made by a scientist who happened to be a Jew, but if psychoanalysis is the latter kind of event, it belongs to the history of society, not of science and it will have been no accident that a social pariah was the first to mention the unmentionable. Which was it, scientific discovery or social breakthrough? Freud broaches this touchy matter publicly and explicitly as early as 1914 in his paper on the history of the psychoanalytic movement, in which he discloses the parentage of this scandalous idea of the sexual etiology of the neuroses 7 which provoked the reaction of distaste and repudiation. 8 he had consoled himself for the bad reception of his idea by the thought that, anyway, it was a new and original idea. But, one day, he recounts, certain memories collected in my mind which disturbed this pleasing notion. The idea for which I was being made responsible had by no means originated with me but had been imparted to him by no less than three people whose opinion had commanded his highest respect, Brewer, Charcot, and Crowback. 9. Sometime between 1881 and 1883, while Freud was walking with Breuer in Vienna, the husband of a patient came up to Breuer and spoke to him privately. Breuer remarked to Freud as they resumed their walk that these things are always secret stalkov. Freud continues, astonished, I asked him what he meant, 
and he answered by telling me the meaning of the word alcove greater than, marriage bed, for he did not realize how extraordinary his remark had seemed to me. T10 note in this remark the word secret and the fact that the information is conveyed by Butu. A parallel exists to the sexual etiology problem was Freud's discovery of the significance of everyday slips of the tongue to be viewed as scientific acuity? Or as social deviance that broke the gentleman's agreement of the goyim to indulge, in Kenneth Minogue's words, in a polite conspiracy to accept forgetfulness and slips of the tongue as insignificant accidents? Kenneth R. Minogue, The Liberal Mind, New York, Vintage, 1968, p. 120. Plus Brewer, a respectable member of the Jewish professional class in Vienna, could still write 25 years later, I confess that plunging into sexuality in theory and practice is not to my taste, but adds, the Freudian revolution having intervened, but what have every taste and my feeling about what is seemly and what is unseemly to do with the question of what is true. Letter to Auguste Florel, quoted in Lucy Freeman, The Story of Anna O, New York. Walker, 1972, p. 192. Freud by means of a metonym, marriage bed stands for sex problem and that this euphemism is itself in French, the language of the sexual and social class secrets, as though German were too respectable a language for forbidden things. The second time Freud heard the sexual etiology idea mentioned was in 1885 while Charcot was explaining certain neurotic symptoms of a female patient to Boardel, may eyes, Dan Steak has pales kissed two jewers lachos genital, two jewers, two jewers, two jewers. As he said this, Freud report, Charcot hugged himself animatedly, jumping up and down in his own characteristic lively way. I know that for one second I was almost paralyzed with amazement and said to myself, well, but if he knows that, why does he never say so? But the impression was soon forgotten 11, my emphasis. In the light of such testimony from Freud, we see how precisely wide of the mark is the easy assertion of Susan Sontag that the project of Freud and the early pioneers of psychoanalysis was to see something that had not been seen before, because it was not known to be there, 12, Sontag's emphasis. Freud thus undergoes a triple amazement upon hearing Charcot's remark, he is amazed at the genital etiology of neurotic symptoms, he is amazed that this etiology is known, by Charcot, anyway, and he is amazed that this knowledge is never said, publicly, loudly, by Charcot. And most importantly, the scientist's why is aroused in Freud only by this last astonishment, namely, why does he never say so? On the basis of what Freud himself tells us here, we must not wonder that he questioned whether his essential contribution was in having seen something or in having said something. A year later, 1886, after he had begun medical practice in Vienna as a private docent for nervous diseases, the distinguished Viennese gynecologist Krebeck sent Freud a note asking him to take charge of a woman patient of his. Later, he took Freud aside and informed him that after 18 years of marriage she was still a virgin. The husband was impotent. The sole prescription for the malady, he added, is familiar enough to us but we cannot order it. It runs. Rx penis normalis dosim repetita. It is perhaps not insignificant that this was the period in which Freud developed a consuming interest in the neurology of aphasia. A year after Charcot's inability or reluctance to use words about what he knew, Freud was lecturing on aphasia to the physiology club in Vienna. In 1891, he published his first book, Aphasia, and dedicated it to Brewer. C. Jones, The Life and Work of Sigmund Freud, Volume I, The Formative Years and the Great Discoveries, 1856-1900, New York, Basic Books. 1953, p. 213. Regarding aphasia, Jones notes that this remarkably original work in many ways foreshadowed the psychological theories, Feudal was soon after to develop. Life and Work, Volume 2, Years of Maturity, 1901-1919, New York, 
Basic Books, 1955, p. 5. I had never heard of such a prescription slash Freud concludes, and would have liked to shake my head over my kind friend's cynicism. 13 Once more, Freud hears the secret. It is said, but said privately, and in a cynical joking manner, and, once more, in a foreign language. Even here, euphemism and distanciation are at work. Later on, in 1893, the same problem comes up. In a letter to Flea S., Freud had opened the whole topic of the sexual etiology of neurosis. Flea S.'s reply confuses him. Has he discovered something, or is he merely mentioning something already known but unmentionable? Has he found a scientific truth, or merely, merely? Violated the bourgeois code? Now for the sexual question. I think you could express yourself more graphically on this. The way you refer to sexual etiology implies a knowledge on the public's part which it has only in latent form. It knows, but acts as if it did not know 14, my emphasis. A year later, 1894, Freud W. Tights that he is regarded in Vienna as obsessed, they regard me rather as a monomaniac, while I have the distinct feeling I have touched on one of the great secrets of nature. 15 Secret of Nature? or secret of bourgeois society? Something deeply repressed? Or civilly inattended to in polite society? In the sciences of man, are these two orders of secret separable? One thing we do know, Freud is in the process of using the antagonism of others as proof of the truth of his contentions. But how much of this resistance is merely a social bourgeois resistance to his having mentioned unmentionables in public? rather than resistance to disclosing a secret of human nature. Again, how separable are these two processes? There is something comic about the incongruity between one's own and other people's estimation of one's work, he remarks to Flea S. 16. By October 1895 he has become quite sure of himself, of his theory. I recently perpetrated three lectures on hysteria in which I was very impudent, he writes Fleas. I shall be starting to take pleasure in being arrogant, particularly if you continue to be so pleased with me. 17 Do we hear the sound of epitism in that disclosure? By March 1896 he is bogged down in his work on the neuroses. He is still less sure of the stature, if any, of the truths he has discovered than of the meaning of the hostility they arouse. I am met with hostility and live in such isolation that one might suppose I had discovered the greatest truths. 18 What a strange remark! Freud was openly using resistance to his claims as an index of their nature and merit. Freud said that after he had gained an understanding of the functioning of resistance in psychoanalytical treatment, it was his environment's rejection of him that gave him insight into the full significance of his discoveries. 19 My emphasis. Three weeks later he lectures on dream interpretations to the young people of the Jewish academic reading circle. I enjoy talking about my ideas at the moment, nevertheless, a void is forming around me. 20. But the sexual etiology of neuroses, the id behind the symptoms, has a companion problem in Freud's conviction that he had discovered a component of innate hostility in the id. This instinct, like sex, also violated the bourgeois optimism of liberal Christians and respectable Viennese. I have found little that is good about human beings on the whole, he writes the Swiss pastor Oscar Pfister. In my experience most of them are trash, no matter whether they publicly subscribe to this or that ethical doctrine or none at all. Then he adds, addressing Pfister personally as a Protestant minister, that is something that you cannot say aloud, or perhaps even think, Though your experiences of life can hardly have been different from mine 21, my emphasis. Here we have the same structural problem about the aggressive instinct as we had with sexuality. Has Freud made a scientific discovery here? It would seem not, for he asserts with confidence that Fister's experience is identical with his own, namely, that people are trash. The difference between Freud and others 
between Freud and this Gentile Protestant who in a sense represents the Swiss or Gentile branch of the psychoanalytic movement, is that Freud allows himself to say the shocking things that all of them, presumably, have experienced. Perhaps, he speculates to Pfister, the bourgeois Christian censorship goes so deep, perhaps you cannot even think the awful truth about people that you have undoubtedly experienced. Eight years earlier he had written to Pfister on the publication of the pastor's analysis of hate and reconciliation, saying that it suffers from the hereditary vice of virtue, it is the work of too decent a man, who feels himself bound to discretion. 22 Freud was not bound to such discretion. He could tell secrets forbidden in polite society. He is furious at what he himself believes to be the truth of Jung's statement about his, Jung's, secession from the movement, relayed by von Moerald through Pfister, that Jung does not reject me, and graciously allows me my place, but merely corrects me and makes me fit for polite society one salons for Hig, 23. For Freud, then, the question of the genuineness of his originality was entangled with doubts about the priority of his discovery of the role of sex in the etiology of neurosis. His obsessive concern over the race for scientific priority, who got the first question mark is crossed by his anxiety over the nature of his scientific originality, who got where first? Has he merely rediscovered what Brewer, Charcot, and Crowback had discovered earlier? Is his sexual etiology idea a case of cryptomnesia, that is, of unconscious plagiarism? Or is his priority simply a case of appropriating as his own intellectual property something everybody knew all along but? It has been suggested that Jung's increased emphasis on the collective rather than the personal contents of his patients' productions may have been due to a reluctance, on grounds of delicacy, to publish personal material my emphasis. Avis M. Dry, The Psychology of Jung, A Critical Interpretation, New York, Wiley, 1961, p. 297. Had the decency not to ventilate? Am I the last to know but the first to say? The egregious concern exhibited so frequently by pure scientists in the matter of priority a disconcertingly unedifying finding which Robert Merton brilliantly recoups to serve as the linchpin of his sociology of science, became, in Freud's case, an obsession. The lofty Freud of Ernest Jones's bowdlerized life and work of Sigmund Freud, who was never interested in questions of priority, which he found merely boring, 24 is restored to historical reality by sociologists impudent enough to do some counting. In point of fact, Merton relates, Eleanor Barber and I have identified more than 150 occasions on which Freud exhibited an interest in priority. 25 In this interest, Merton contends, Freud exhibits attention and ambivalence typical of the role of the creative scientist. But Freud's abiding concern with priority, the fact that he oscillates between the poles of his ambivalence toward priority, 26 is not reducible to the general case of the ambivalence of men of science, to the inner conflict bred in them by their commitment to two potentially incompatible values, the impersonal humility that promotes the advancement of science and the personal vanity that seeks the rewards of priority, of having their priority of discovery recognized by peers. 27 Freud's ambivalence about his priority in discovering the sexual etiology of the neuroses is clearly overdetermined, and this for a very curious reason, if Freud's originality stems uniquely from his Jewishness, as he more than suspects it does, why was it, he asks Pastor Pfister, that none of all the pious ever discovered psychoanalysis? Why did it have to wait for a completely godless Jew? 28 Then the recognition and validation of this priority is uniquely dependent upon the goim who man the reward system of establishment science which he is trying to crash. In Freud's case, the ambivalence of the Jew thus coincides with the ambivalence of the scientist, the one reinforces the other. Freud hungers for recognition of his scientific revolution from the very custodians, the Swiss Gentile psychiatric establishment of Jung and his circle of what, to Freud, is normal science. Once more, the problem recurs, what has been discovered here? 
wherein lies Freud's originality. In his scientific contribution as a theorist or in his social location as a Jew? Has he discovered a hitherto unknown sexuality and aggression beneath the civil surface of the Burgerliche Gesellschaft? Or does his originality lie precisely in his vulgarity? In his committing the indiscretion, for those not bound to discretion, like Jews and other social pariahs, of speaking the unspeakable truths that all goyim already latently know are so? If the former is the case, Freud the scientist, who happens to be a Jew, has discovered a secret of human nature. If the latter is the case, Freud the Jew, who happens to be a scientist, has told a secret of civil society. If, in the natural sciences, as Whitehead has said, everything of importance has been said before by someone who did not discover it, 29 Perhaps in the social sciences everything of importance has been discovered before by someone who did not say it. The roots of Freud's anxiety of influence run deep. Priority in the social sciences, like creativity in the humanities, may be as much a matter of naming as of knowing. The commodity in which poets deal, their authority, their property, Harold Bloom writes, turns upon priority. They own, they are what they become first in naming. T30 The impending defection of his Swiss goyim will push Freud's ambivalence over his originality to a personal crisis over his identity which, in its crude form, will echo the worst charges of the anti-Semites, am I an original scientist or am I just a vulgar Jew? The organized skepticism of the scientist, however incompletely internalized in Freud, conspires with the corrosive self-doubt of the emancipated Jew to make the existence of actual anti-Semites all but otios. Besides, the quality of the anti-Semitism supplied by the Gentile community, afflicted as it is with invincible goyish capitude is inferior, secular intellectual Jews of stature are thus obliged, no bless oblige in this as in other matters, to provision themselves. No anti-Semite can begin to comprehend the malicious analysis of his soul, Norman Mailer informs us, which every Jew indulges every day. 31. All this explains why Freud so needs his Swiss goyim. To Freud the scientist, they satisfy his need for assurance that one's work really matters, 32 to Freud the Jew, their allegiance is a continuing reassurance in which not only the outside world, as Freud contended, but Freud himself is reassured that psychoanalysis is not a Jewish science. The presence of Goyim in the leadership of psychoanalysis as ideology, as a movement, is important as a warranty that it transcends ethnic interests, in terms of public relations it is a balanced ticket. But for psychoanalysis as a science, the Gentile presence is something more than a public relations strategy. It is a pledge, not least for Freud himself of its scientific generality. For Freud, like most diaspora intellectuals, is inwardly unsure as to just what part of his work stems from his being a Jew, and what part from his being a scientist. Jews are always forced to generalize about their problems, explains a grandson of old Avram Glickman in Dan Jacobson's novel The Beginners, because they never know just how much is Jewish in them. And how much is common, ordinary, human necessary, and, we should add, how much is goyish.33. We learn from an earlier letter, in which Freud criticizes Fister's. I wish to thank John Wacker for help and influence in the formulation of this idea. T. The source of this quotation, Bloom's The Anxiety of Influence, C. Note 30, is a brilliant book. Read it. In Bloom, modernist poetry finds its malrocks. T. But, as to the indiscreetness of psychoanalysis, however, Freud betrayed no puzzlement over its parentage, it was of Jewish descent. Account of a psychoanalysis for omitting the minute details, that when Freud asked Fister why the discovery of psychoanalysis had to wait for a completely godless Jew, what he meant by that phrase was a completely indiscreet, impolite Jew. Freud writes, discretion is incompatible with the satisfactory description of an analysis, to provide the latter one would have to be unscrupulous, give away, betray, behave like an artist who buys paints with his wife's housekeeping money or uses the furniture as firewood to warm the studio for his model. 
without a trace of that kind of unscrupulousness, he concludes, the job cannot be done. 34 Psychoanalysis, it is clear, was designed to be socially unrespectable. But was that fact proof positive that it was scientifically respectable? Or, to push the problem to its deepest level, was the question of the scientific respectability of the Geist Sudsenschaffen in the bourgeois Christian era ultimately separable from the question of their social respectability? Were social appearances, in some unprecedented and troubling way, criterial of objectivity in the new sciences of man? That is, in the present case, was introspective evidence about the institutional meanings of bourgeois civil society scientifically respectable evidence if the introspector, Freud, was a self-proclaimed outsider to that society and unsuccessfully that is, inappropriately, socialized in it? In the experience of another Victorian, Charles Dickens, the social and the psychological were virtually indistinguishable. The close correlation of his person with his society and its cultural values made him inward to his age. This good fit, in Dickens, between the social and the psychological, writes Michael Wood, is why Dickens could read Victorian society by looking into himself. 35 What society did Freud read by looking into himself? into a self early and appropriately socialized in the lingering values of the subculture of the shtetl? Did such introspection yield insight into personalities institutionally integrated with the modernizing values of the West? If the answer is no, then to accept Freud's introspective evidence as valid was, in effect, to accept the representation of what was outside civil society, the social pariah. By shifting to the vertical axis, as the psychological underside of civil society, Europe's social pariah, the id, becomes in this way everybody's psychological pariah, the id. With Jewish emancipation, the ecological base of Judaism, its tribal we are here and you are the horizontal differentiation, was, in principle, subverted. Desegregation occurred, 36 and with it, among the exception Jews of the early generations of emancipation, there occurred the transformation of Judaism into a personalized, marketable, monogram Jewishness. 37 This shift was, in reality, a shift from the horizontal plane, life is with people to a vertical representation of Jewish identity, with the pre-Western Ostjud repressed, censored, in a kind of latter-day renewal of Maronoism, and stashed down at the lowest, earliest stratum of the self. Psychological segregation replaces social. The locus of Freud's originality. Geographical segregation, internal restraints replace external constraints. Durkheim would incorporate the insights of this assimilation process into his sociology, as Freud did into his psychoanalysis, Parsons would later hail it as the discovery of internalization. Freud took the next step, in a bold stroke. This conquisted or overcame the subjective opaqueness of the civil society of the Gentile by installing an idiot in the personality system of each of its members. By this daring imputation, by this forced conversion, so to speak, the outsider became insider, or, more exactly, the social outside which was duly became the psychological underside of gentility. In this way, Freud was able to bridge the apparently contradictory propositions of, the Jewish outsider, Durkheim about the subjective opaqueness of social phenomena and of, the Gentile insider, Weber about the possibility of Verston. 38 In one stroke, Freud, a new Moses in his own fantasy, passes his Jews into the Gentile Gesellschaft and converts his Gentiles into honorary Jews. Chapter 12. Excursus modernization and the emergence of social appearance. Freud was cruel and brutal in the way he treated defectors from the psychoanalytic movement. Significantly, if he theologized the Gentile defectors, Jung had relapsed into earlier spiritualism he became a sociologist when he explained the Jewish defectors, Adler was a Jew boy from a Viennese suburb who made good among the Goyim. But to both sorts of secessionist he was unforgiving and incivil. Philip Raif handles this scandal, Freud's coarseness must always be cleaned up, by saying that Freud would not suffer the false civility of separating ideas from men. 
one but just such a differentiation of men themselves from the ideas they hold is exactly what civility is, true civility. It has an old theological pedigree in the Christian separation of the sin from the sinner, go, sin no more, Jesus said, and a Greek philosophical pedigree in the ban on the argument to mad hominem. If this be not true civility, what is? And besides, Freud knew exactly what civility was even though it was not part of his mental furniture and he was unable to practice it. Civility was a bourgeois right observed by the goyim and occasionally even useful against them. I was delighted with your remarks about Grodek, he writes the Protestant minister Oscar Pfister. We really must be able to tell each other home truths, that is, in civilities, and remain firm friends, as in this case. Too later he bursts out, having minded his manners too long, with, and finally comma let me be impolite for once, how the devil do you reconcile all that we experience and have to expect in this world with your assumption of a moral order. 3 He admires the way Fister handles the opponents of psychoanalysis, well, I admire your ability to write like that, in such a moderate, affable, considerate manner, so factually and so much more for the reader than against your Freud's attitude, Jung said in 1925, was the bitterness of the person who is entirely misunderstood, and his manners always seemed to say, if they do not understand, they must be stamped into hell. Quoted in Henri Ellenberger, The Discovery of the Unconscious, New York, Basic Books, 1970, p. 462. Modernization and the Emergence of Social Appearance Opponent. I could not restrain myself. But, as I am incapable of artistically, sick, modifying my indignation, of giving it an aura pleasurable to others, I hold my peace for, my emphasis. Freud's personality, formed in the Eastern European Jewish home and nurtured in Leopoldstadt, felt ill at ease in society. He enjoyed the thrust and parry of home truths, that is, in civilities. Society, the Gesellschaft, is the place where social appearances emerge, respectability is one such, and become autonomous, that is, subjectively opaque, and where one is constrained to take account of them in one's behavior. Insofar as we internalize the constraints of social appearance into restraints, we become members of the societal community. Let us take a concrete example from one of Freud's letters to Abraham. On September 29, 1908, he writes Abraham in Berlin to confess a transgression against you, namely, that I actually was in Berlin for 24 hours without having called on you, since, what with crossing from England with his brother Emmanuel and seeing his sister Marie, Mitzi, who lives in Berlin and between the two camps of fond relatives I saw as little of Berlin as I did of you. And so he asks Abraham, and this is the crucial point, to forgive the appearance of unfriendliness involved 5, my emphasis. Family and relatives, the primary Gemschkaften, know all about 1, where you are, why you are there, deed and motive for the deed or the non-deed. The stranger, even a relative stranger like Abraham, does not. Freud passes through the Gesellschaft that is 1908 Berlin. He leaves a wake of appearances in his train. To make oneself accountable for one's appearances before strangers is the first step to social modernization. In the Gesellschaft, whether we will it or not, we create a new, non-intentional life around ourselves, the unintended appearances of our purposeful social action. There is a between period, when we try to shrug off these appearances, I didn't intend that, so I don't care. But then Freud's thoughts might have run something like this, I would have visited Abraham if I'd had the time. Indeed, I know that, but does he? Suppose Abraham hears from a colleague who passed you on the street, who says, Freud was in Berlin yesterday. I passed him on the street. He might mistake your not seeing him for your not liking him. Gradually we are won over to a new stage, almost an ethical mutation, we own up to our accountability for our intentions, our actions, and the appearance of our intentions and actions. A whole new dimension, the appearance of the ethical, is born. 
It is a dimension trivialized by the rules of etiquette, but nonetheless real for all that. To become modem, then, is to become civil, which is to say, caretakers of our social appearance, and at once we are in their, frankly, very odd business of writing letters to our Abrahams and begging them to forgive the appearance of unfriendliness. We no longer shrug off these visual echoes of ourselves. This is the new social reality principle CT. That emerges with the modernization process as its social coefficient. Let us call it the civilizational process. Freud was aware of the autonomy of social appearance to some extent, but it had no theoretical interest for the psychoanalytic movement. The whole realm of social perception as such, of the ethic involved in making appearances congruent, of the snobbery involved in perceiving discrepant appearances, think of Abraham characterizing one of his opponents in the Berlin Society for Psychiatry as a very pushing member, B, whose conversion to Christianity has proved only partially successful, 7 think of Freud's remark on the death of Adler, all of this mode of social perception was occurring but was never itself thematized. To break into this mode of perception is, ipso facto, to break into the life of society, not polite society necessarily, though polite society carries these structures into their play form, as Simmel was to show. These are the rituals of appearance, these are the rites de passage that carry us from traditionary into bourgeois Christian modernizing consciousness. With this circumspection of appearance, this discipline of appearance, this practice of the presence of the generalized other as an innerworldly ascetic, modernity is born. We intrude, we trespass by our non-intentional appearances into the lives of others in the Gesellschaft, as they intrude into ours. Forgive us our appearances, Freud might as well have written, as we forgive those who have appeared against us. This was the essential discipline of the diaspora. Moses Mendelssohn had preceded Solomon Mayman to Berlin in the mid-18th century. Mendelssohn and his circle were busily trying to master the exigent appearances. For a long while they were posers. Mayman arrived straight out of the Stuttl, I was shy, and the manners and customs of the Berliners were strange to me, he writes. The odd mixture of the animal in my manners, my expressions, and my whole outward behavior, with the rational in my thoughts, excited his tea imagination more than the subject of our conversation aroused his understanding. 8. With Freud the discrepant profile read the other way. Outwardly he was very controlled, but inwardly he was a wild Galiciana. Freud's was the first generation of his family born outside Galicia, Austria took Galicia from Poland in the partition of 1772. Martin Freud writes of his grandmother Amelia, Freud's mother, that she came from East Galicia, adding. It might not be known that Galician Jews were a peculiar race, not. This is the only piece of evidence we have that Abraham had a sense of humor. It must not be mislaid. T referring, not to Mendelssohn, but to one of the circle of his Berlin Haskeller, Enlightenment, J.M.C. I.O.U. Only different from any other races inhabiting Europe, but absolutely different from Jews who had lived in the West for some generations. These Galician Jews had little grace and no manners, and their women were certainly not what we should call ladies. They were highly emotional and easily carried away by their feelings. But, although in many respects they would seem to be untamed barbarians to more civilized people, they, alone of all minorities, stood up to the Nazis. These people are not easy to live with, and grandmother, a true representative of her race, was no exception. She had great vitality and much impatience. 9. Freud, in marrying the cool Martha Bernays, a Sephardic Jew, was marrying up endogamously, as Marx married up exogamously in marrying Jenny von Westphalen. She brought status, Yikus, into the marriage as the daughter of the chief rabbi of Hamburg. Let us stand back and make some summarizing statements before we move on. We have seen the earliest works of Freud as outcomes of his encounter with Western civility, 
the politeness he is forced to observe every day becomes the agent of censorship transforming the wishes of his id into wish fulfillments disguised so as to be acceptable to that more assimilated aspect of his self that has internalized the moral and taste norms of the bourgeois Christian West. This insight becomes his great interpretation of dreams. The method or praxis for reaching this id and circumventing the vigilance of the goyim, always on the lookout for Jewish misbehavior, is the method of free association. Freud creates a social space congruent with the practice of this therapy, the secret, neutral space of the analytic situation, in which both the moral norms of a precedent dyad, the confessional, with priest and penitent, and the civil norms of everyday life are suspended to create an entirely new social relation. In this situation, verbal vice and social indecorum are encouraged as a privileged communication, the generic legitimating ceiling is science, the specialty, medicine. In this situation, Goyim Mankees can regress back to their presivilidid and then come forward once more, in a controlled re-socialization, a controlled re-assimilation stopping short of any illusions of total change or conversion. For Freud these fifty minute hours are the villities of his wished for social revolution that utopian picnic of which he daydreamed where none of the ladies will have to excuse themselves with euphemisms in order to relieve themselves because there will be no euphemisms, no roundaboutness, and hence no need for excuses. The analytic situation inverts the social situation, Freudianism was to be indiscreet on principle. The therapeutic hour puts an end to decorum. Ten shortly after he had introspected his own dreams. Freud turned to the social faux pas of diaspora jury, the awkward lapses and parapraxes that were to become the psychopathology of everyday life. In the meantime, he had discovered through introspection, in the course of trying to make intelligible the curious bewitchment that the play Oedipus Rex exercised over him, the Oedipus complex. He believed he had discovered that an early forbidden, incestuous desire for sex with his mother had been repressed into unconsciousness out of fear of his father, who would castrate him in punishment for that wish. Our socioanalysis of this theory itself finds its origin in Freud's repression of the forbidden shame and murderous rage he experienced when his father told him how he had meekly acceded to the command of an enemy of his people to mind his manners and had had his brand new fur hat knocked into the gutter in the bargain. Reading and seeing Sophocles play subsequently facilitates the re-emergence of a forbidden conquistador I'll wish in the culturally legitimate form of identifying with a Greek hero who responds to an exactly similar encounter in an exactly opposite way, the play supplies a kind of rite de passage for Freud, in which an identity change occurs through a new identification with a new father figure Oedipus, who, as luck would have it, is also a son and who, further, Mirabile Dick II, kills his father in a rage. If, as Ernest Jones writes, Freud's father never regained the place he had held in his esteem after the painful occasion when he told his twelve-year-old boy how a Gentile knocked off his new fur cap into the mud and shouted at him, Jew, get off the pavement, eleven first Hamilcar, son of Hannibal, and then Oedipus, son of Laius were to replace this submissive father in Freud's campaign against Rome, the Holy Roman Empire. Much of the material that Freud dredged up during the introspection of his didactic self-analysis was, clearly, misleading. He believed he could extrapolate universally to all other childhoods, the Oedipus complex was universal, and to all of Western social reality and institutions. His private introspection, he believed, gave him an unshakable prize on social reality. But introspection, as Peter L. Berger notes, is a viable method for the discovery of institutional meanings. And, the understanding of social reality, on Lil after successful socialization 12, my emphasis. It is only after successful socialization, successful socialization, we should add, that the apparently contradictory propositions of Dirk Bim about the subjective opaqueness of social phenomena and of Weber about the possibility of verse and 13 can be bridged, Berger concludes. Durkheim's homo duplex 14 is, paradoxically, a good many leagues further down the road to assimilation, 
successful socialization than is the homo triplex of Freud's three psychic institutions. Freud and his descendants habitually extrapolate from the Eastern European Jewish case to man in general. Stanley Diamond, for example, notes that, given Freud's conception of the universal function of ritual, it is of great interest that Freud was a Jew. As in so many other instances, Freud universalized on the basis of the socially particular. Nowhere is this more evident than in his brilliant hypothesis about the nature of ritual, applicable, when viewed functionally, to the traditional European Jewish milieu, but misplaced when applied to the primitive ritual drama. 15. Chapter 13. Reich and Later Variations. Politically, Freud was a liberal. Diaspora liberalism may be defined as the endeavor to institutionalize neutral social territory between the Jew, the it, and the Gentile world, the superego. It was the ego, the putatively neutral instrumental ego, that would hold its own neutral scientific ground by playing off the id against the superego, the superego against the id. Freud had no desire to use psychoanalytic theory, much less the psychoanalytic situation the decorum free consulting room, as a staging area for launching a revolutionary drive against the gentile civil society which was its milieu. In a long life, at the end of the first century of Jewish emancipation, he had settled his accounts with the gentile superego. There would be no revolution from below. The superego, he had found, as Donald Barr writes, is as savage as the id, but on the side of decorum, one Freud opted for a standoff. Freud himself stood polarized between the subculture of the id, id, and the incompletely internalized culture of the goy, the superego, between pariah and parvenu. There was a small margin of self-determination which, as Philip Raif has observed, amounts merely to a skill at playing off against one another the massive sub-individual, id, and super-individual, superego forces by which the self is shaped. To Freud's famous formula, where it was, the let ego be was both a call and a warning to diaspora Jewry, and to non-Jews, by extrapolation, that they come up from Yiddish kit but not try to assimilate to Goyish kit. It was to be the great compromise of classical 19th century liberalism, but retooled for emancipating Jewry. On Freud's theory of the psychoneuroses, Every symptom making up the various syndromes of his neurotic patients involved precisely such a compromise, each of the ten defense mechanisms, from isolation and reaction formation to projection and sublimation, was involved in the production of compromises that would disguise the id, enabling it to pass as normal. Three modernizing Jewry had repressed the processes involved in the forced march into normal gentility that it had undergone upon entering Europe when the unconditioned wish of a Mayiman, or a Marx, collided. It is Freud's daughter who finds that to his nine methods of defense we must add a tenth, sublimation, or displacement of instinctual aims. Anna Freud, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense, see Note 3, p. 47. I.O. 4. With the demands of Gentile restraint structures. Freud creates in the psychoanalytical situation a moratorium, a decompression chamber, an epoch of the gentile attitude, in which these defensive processes are reversed, a passage back into consciousness is forced for the instinctual impulses or effects which have been warded off and it is then left to the ego and the superego to come to terms with them on a better basis. 4. Within the scientifically legitimated precincts of this psychoanalytic interstitial social situation, with the social pressure of Western civility provisionally abated, checked at the door of Freud's insulting room, with Gentile politeness suspended for the interim get of an analytic hour of uninhibited yet institutionalized vulgarity, Freud's Jewish patients could take time out from the hard praxis of passing to let the air out of the thing they could stop behaving and live a little. Bracketed outside, of course, the public authority of the real world of the reality principle of the Gentile continued its reign unabated. Once out there again, plagued by Gentile exigency, all would be once more compromise but conscious, knowing, illusionless compromise. 
you may suspend ethics and still have a tolerable world. But when you eliminate also the appearance of the ethical, namely, manners, nihilism is born. Freud was resentful enough to try this experiment, cautious enough to limit it. He compromised. James Joyce, analogously, broke the bourgeois novel's conventions with his version of free association, namely, the monologue inter eura. What for Henry James had been the terrible fluidity of self-revelation became for Joyce a technique of deliberate vulgarity. Joyce and his Dubliners, like Freud and his Shtetl Jews, coming from behind in the 19th century, had to make a wilderness in the clearing of bourgeois Christian respectability so that their Irish and Jews could breathe. But both operated within a restricted context, the novel form and the form of the psychoanalytical situation. Both constructed imaginary gardens with real toads in them five named Anna O and Leopold Bloom. Psychoanalysis was to be an ideology, a compromise strategy, for living the diaspora, the price of emancipation, repression and sublimation, was to be paid, and paid in full, but consciously, and without adopting any of the illusory ideologies that the Gentile needed to console himself with for the renunciations exacted by civilized life. This hybrid which is Gentile, civil society is no genuine synthesis of id and superego, of nature and values. Its mediations between these hateful contraries, like the mediations of Hegel's system which reflected them, were illusions, lies that pretended to overcome the conflict. But like the ultimate lie of salvation that informs them all, they only paper over inescapable conflicts. We must live this compromise and not destroy it, we do not know what might erupt on its destruction, but we must live it consciously, as far as possible, and without illusion. The inner, ethnic resonance of Freud's liberalism was twofold. On the one hand, he was playing the typical role of the advanced intelligentsia of a recently decolonized people, he was part of an elite, mediating them over the hill into modernity sacrificing as little as possible of their traditional shtetl past, their idiotish key it, this is the culture broker aspect of liberalism, with the neutral instrumental ego of the mediator negotiating between plural interests, interest group liberalism, within a given framework of public values, the imperial, gentile order. But also, like a lawyer, the analyst was a double agent, representing both public gentile authority, the reality principle and the private, subcultural interests of his client, the wishes of the pleasure principle. 6 He stood, as I have said, between id and superego, between tradition and modernity, between pariah and parvenu. For all his fierceness, then, Freud represented the compromise that was to become diaspora liberalism. He turned his face against the wholeness hunger, a great regression boom from a great fear, the fear of modernity seven that covertly drove certain of the diaspora intelligentsia to seek a radical social fulfillment of their primodem wish, Marx, Lassalle, Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky, Emma Goldman, Jerry Rubin, and Abby Hoffman. Freud kept a close watch on the political radicals and revolutionaries. After all, his schoolmates Heinrich Braun and Victor Adler were both active in politics. 8. It was not till the early thirties that Freud fully realized that his own movement contained an analyst, Wilhelm Reich, who had gone back to Marx and contracted political fanaticism 9, as Jones calls it, a situation that led to Reich's estrangement and expulsion, in 1934, from the movement. In 1933 Rye had been expelled from the German Communist Party for an incorrect view of the causes of fascism. Thus Reich's attempt to marry two of the diaspora ideologues, Freud and Marx, ended in his separation from the two movements speaking in their names. Rye soon left for exile in Scandinavia, one thinks of Marx and Hein in Paris, then Marx in England, whence in 1939 due to the efforts of his American translator and friend the New York psychiatrist Theodore P. Wolfe, he left for the United States, settling in Forest Hills. T. Berman Senior, Galicia, in 1897 to middle-class Jewish parents, 
a mother who eventually killed herself and a father who raised cattle for the German government, Rai had an odd childhood. His was a parvenu family, proud and much more identified with German culture than with their Jewish heritage. Neither Wilhelm nor his brother, Rob. The author of this concept, Peter Gay, Wimar Culture C Note 7, uses wholeness hunger with a wider generality of reference than I do. I make it an analytical tool for understanding the Jewish emancipation. T. I was myself for a short time a patient of Dr. Wolf. The price then, late 1940s, was $25 an hour. I still have the cancelled check. Ert, David L. Kind reports, were allowed to play with the peasant children or with the Yiddish speaking children of the ghetto. Ten after World War I, while still a medical student, he became a practicing psychoanalyst in Freud's circle in Vienna. He was soon to show his independence by innovating theory and technique which, while originating in Freud, ended Freud's conservative, stoic liberal compromise and detonated the dynamite of social critique still bound in Freudianism. Rye became in his own eyes a revolutionary Prometheus, he considered himself Freud unbound, and his appeal went well beyond psychoanalytical circles. Rye appealed to many for several reasons, he combined the psychological and the sociological, depth psychology and radical politics. He was a theoretical materialist who created nevertheless a formalist therapy in which the content of analysis, dreams, free associations, slips, became less important than how content was expressed, the adverbs of content, hand clasps, mannerisms, dress, gait, physiognomy, and so forth. But Reich's most important contribution, his most famous was his delusionary discovery of organ energy, was in therapy, he analyzed the latent character resistance before tackling the patient's symptoms. Resistance to the primary rule of psychoanalytic candor, the ethic of honesty, Rye believed, took the form of character resistance. The defense is against insight into the infantile sources in the id of the patient's current pathology anchored themselves in the very physiology of the body, in stiff upper lips, in the tendency to grin and bear it, in evasive movements of the eyes, in shielding the genitalia by crossing the legs, in the last stronghold of retreating anxiety, a rigid pelvis. Most important of all in Reich's appeal to the Freudian left eleven is the application he made of his idea of character armor. He called the rigid surface of the neurotic personality character panzuung, character armor, a kind of hard cuticle defending the ego against the urgent, vital sexuality repressed within and clamoring for release through revolutionary praxis. The analogy here to Reich's namesake and heir, Charles Reich, is no accident. In Reich II, Charles, the masculine genitality of Reich I's thirties protest has been tenderized into the soft androgyny of the American seventies, where ingenuous green shoots of the greening of America make their way up through the civilities of the Gentile Gesellschaft of consciousness to consider a social event among professional people, a dinner, cocktail party garden party, remember Fred's picnic? Or just a lunch among friends, right who asks us? Everything that takes place occurs within incredibly narrow limits, he continues. The events are almost completely structured around conversation. No one pays any sensual attention to the food, the mind-altering experience of the drink, or to the weather, or to the nonverbal side of personality. They do not strive for genuine relationships, but keep their conversation at the level of sociability. 12 in Rai 2. Io. The grief of Rai High is audible once more. In 1947 Summerhill TSAS Neil witnessed a social visit to Rai High at Organon, Maine, by former staff, down from Canada and dropping by, the guests depart, poor Rai sat silent in a corner with a face full of misery. When we were alone he said, Neil, I couldn't go through an afternoon like this again. Jesushkaft's conversation just means hell to me. Thirteen years before, in 1912, Franz Kafka had written, Conversation takes the importance, the seriousness and the truth out of everything, I think. 14. The name Rai gives to, Rai 2s, 
consciousness too is Karaktrama, and in his great work Character Analysis his first and archetypal example of it is politeness. If, for instance, a patient is very polite, Rai writes, while at the same time he brings ample material, say, about his relationship with his sister, one is confronted with two simultaneous contents of the psychic surface, his love for his sister, and his behavior, his politeness. Both have unconscious roots. Analytic experience shows, he maintains, that behind this politeness and niceness there is always hidden a more or less unconscious critical, distrustful or deprecatory attitude 15, Reich's emphasis. So, he advises the therapist, do not interpret the incestuous material, but, seizing the initiative, go after the politeness itself. Were one to wait until the patient himself begins to talk about his politeness and its reasons, one would wait forever, the patient will never talk about it himself, it is up to the analyst to unmask it as a resistance. 16 It is Reich's contention that, since politeness immediately turns into a resistance, all content passing through it takes the impress of its form. To remain with the example of politeness, he writes, not, I should think, a difficult resolve for Reich, the neurotic, as a result of his repressions, has every reason to value highly his politeness and all social conventions and to use them as a protection. 17 It is more pleasant, Reich concedes, to treat a polite patient than an impolite, very candid one, since the latter tells the analyst the unpleasant things which politeness would otherwise censor. Rye goes on to give eight examples of the kind of aggressive utterance that remains hidden behind the armor of politeness, telling the analyst that he is too young or too old, that he has a shabby apartment or an ugly wife, that he looks stupid or too Jewish, that he behaves neurotically and better go for analysis himself, 18 and so forth. One must avoid, he warns the therapist, any decreasing interpretations of the unconscious as long as the wall of conventional politeness between patient and analyst continues to exist, 19 especially with obsessive compulsive characters who have converted their hatred into politeness at all cost. 20 in his descriptions of these latently, that is, characterologically, restrained patients, these good, over polite and ever correct patients. 21 Wright turns obsessively to the wearers of the all-pervading, nice, bourgeois smile, there are inner and outer smiles, those who are always armored, who smile inwardly about everything and everyone, 22 and those whose resistance expresses itself in formal aspects of the general behavior, the manner of talking, of the gait, facial expression, and typical attitudes such as smiling, deriding, haughtiness, over-correctness, the manner of the politeness or of the aggression, etc. 23, Reich's emphasis. Both the inward smile of the bourgeois interior and the relentless social niceness of the bourgeois exterior were fair game for Reich's revolutionary therapy. Freud's therapy had remained to the end a talk therapy. Indeed, notes George Steiner. Freud's raw material and therapeutic instrument are no less verbal, no less rooted in language, than the art of Balzac or Proust. This is such an obvious point that it was long overlooked. Psychoanalysis is a matter of words, words heard, glossed, stumbled over, exchanged. 24 Freud could only ask you in words to leave your good behavior outside the analytic situation. Reich's technique of vegetotherapy ended the verbal era in psychoanalysis, if good behavior had anchored itself in the body's musculature, Reich directly attacked it by literally laying his hands on it and trying to break this armor plating into little, free-floating pieces which would then stream toward the last line of defense, the pelvis. Reich, like Freud before him, and like Charles Reich after him, constructs a tripartite model of man that recapitulates in its layering, once more, the historical phylogeny of Jewish emancipation. He begins at the end, with the cultured Philistinism of the passing parvenu. Thus, what is called the cultured human came to be a living structure composed of three layers. On the surface he carries the artificial mask of self-control, of compulsive insincere politeness and artificial sociality. With this layer, he covers up the second one, the Freudian unconscious, 
in which sadism, greediness, lasciviousness, envy, perversions of all kinds, etc., are kept in check, without however, having in the least lost any of their power. This second layer is the artifact of a sex-negating culture, consciously, it is mostly experienced only as a gaping inner emptiness. Behind it, in the depths, live and work natural sociality and sexuality, spontaneous enjoyment of work, capacity for love. This third and deepest, representing the biological nucleus of the human structure, is unconscious and dreaded. It is at variance with every aspect of authoritarian education and regime. It is, at the same time, man's only real hope of ever mastering social misery. 25. Reich's Emphasis. This Reichian model of patriarchal, authoritarian man and family was influential among the Frankfurt Circle of Diaspora intellectuals, Eric Fromm, Theodor Adorno, and Herbert Marcuse. Log. Sigmund Freud. Here, in Reich's third layer, we have the ancestor of Charles Reich's consciousness 3, natural sociality versus artificial sociability. Reich carried Freud out of the consulting room and into the streets of the 1930s and 1940s, attacking the insincere politeness and artificial sociality of the civil society of the Gentile that Marx had attacked long ago with his call for a gemschaft grounded in man's species being. Rye refused the brutal bargain of assimilation, he rejected the price in social misery and social discomfort of becoming a member in good standing of bourgeois or gentile Europe. The cultivated European bourgeoisie of the 19th and early 20th century, he writes, had taken over the compulsive moral forms of feudalism and made them the ideal of human behavior 26, my emphasis. Invited to become citizens at the time of emancipation, Lured by the promise of a kind of Greek polis, the emancipated Jew found himself in the meshes of a bourgeois and secularized Christian society defining itself in universalist terms. As Freud and Herzl before him, Reich sees Europe's civility and its bourgeois Christian restraint as a hypocritical facade disguising anti-Semitism. The forces which had been kept in check for so long by the superficial veneer of good breeding and artificial self-control he writes, now borne by the very multitudes that were striving for freedom, broke through into action, in the concentration camps, in the persecution of the Jews. In fascism, he concludes, the psychic mass disease revealed itself in an undisguised form 27, Reich's emphasis. The culture camp flatant in Freud assumes, in Reich, overt and undisguised form. The seeds of paranoid thinking in Reich later to flower in his conviction of a ubiquitous emotional plague, are already in evidence in the Reich of the thirties and forties. Herzl's dictum that all Gentiles come in two and only two forms, overt and covert anti-Semites is reformulated by Reich into his 1942 declaration that there is not a single individual who does not bear the elements of fascist feeling and thinking in his structure. 28 The seeds of paranoid thinking begin and it is of the utmost importance that we understand exactly where they begin, in his violent encounter with that seemingly most superficial of things, the polite civil surface of western social intercourse, hello, goodbye, nice to see you, beg your pardon, would you mind if I, my view, on the other hand, is rather that. It is this surface of the Bijalishtja Sushkaft that bugs and infuriates each generation of shtetl Jewry emancipated into the West. Somehow, this civil surface is nothing, a mere appearance, a mere concern for how one looks before someone, anyone, a stranger, this civil, polite surface is nothing, yet, somehow, mysteriously, everything. It seems to carry, in secret, secularized form the very meaning of European civilization. Reich's is a classical, almost textbook case, of the violent encounter of the tribal society of the shtetl with the civil society of the West as it takes bourgeois. Form in 19th and 20th century Europe and Anglo-America. Freud had pulled his punches, his vaunted bourgeois liberalism. Reich refused and his principal delict of incivility eventually became the tort for which he was imprisoned in March 1957 in the federal penitentiary at Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. 
he died there of a heart attack on November 3, 1957. Irving Goffman, in our own day, is the first to thematize, to raise to explicit consciousness, this inner link in the West between lunacy and public incivility. 29. Reich paid the price of an ultimate testing of this link. Philip Reif describes Reich's thrust in the following way. On the level of action there is the sham social surface of the superego, where the human appears restrained, polite, compassionate and conscientious. But this hamming by the superego is the rubber glove with which repressions maintain their sterile grip on character. In Reich's terms the tragedy of being moral occurs because the polite social surfaces of character are separated from the deep, natural core by repressions masquerading as the very instincts that they repress. The lesson to be drawn was clear, abolish the repressions masquerading as the very instincts that they repress. This was the therapy and tactic of Reich's feudo Marxism. If, and only if, a therapeutic aim, the dissolution of the superego, could be added to a political aim, the dissolution of the state, could a revolution truly occur? The instincts and the proletariat must triumph together, or not at all. 30. My emphasis. Reich antedated the attempt of the Frankfurt School to amalgamate sociology, Marx, and psychology, Freud, to play the game of relating ideological to psychological process, he was, notes Reich, far more forthright than later players at the same game, say, Eric from In Escape from Freedom 31 Freud's ideology of the emancipation, liberalism wanted an elite management of the id so as to adjust it to a gentile world not a complicity with it to liberate it from that world. Thus for Reich, as Reich tells it, liberalism was understood to function in society as the superego functioned in the psyche, a sham of civility pulled over the reality of conflict, and therefore powerless against doctrines of conflict once these break through the surface of social life. Genuine revolutionary doctrine, on the other hand, functioned in society, as the pure biological impulses do in the psyche. Reactionary impulses come straight from the middle level of the psyche, as reactionary regimes come from the middle classes of society. Fascism was there. Most powerful expression of the political level of the repressed. Unconscious. 32. My emphasis. The sharp impression I wished to convey of our moral condition of the fact that we proudly call our neurotic weaknesses character, is an impression, concludes Reif, more politely conveyed by the Fromms and Hornies. 33 Reich's message, in other words, was the message of pariah effect, homeless in a world it never made. A kind of integrity, and not merely compulsive contrariness, forced him to shape a medium appropriate to his message, the message was, naturally, impolitely conveyed so the man was obviously sick. Is there a man in the house who will stand up and say right out that he wasn't? Character armor begins in politeness, in civility. Character armor, which ultimately, Rye maintains, obstructs the involuntary convulsion of orgasm from the complete discharge of sexual excitation in sexual intercourse, originates in the trivial, everyday exchange of civilities and social intercourse. The impoliteness of total sexual orgasm, its social ostracism, so to speak, becomes with Reich the explicit metaphor, as it was more covertly with Freud, for the vulgarity and awkwardness of the Jew in the mixed company of high gentile social intercourse. The id was, indeed, an unwitting code word for the id. From the 1940s to the 1970s, these ideas of Reich made their way into the texture of urban American culture. Jacqueline Susan in her novel Valley of the Dolls speaks of her wasp heroine as having lived with her good New England family in the same orderly kind of house. Smothered with orderly, unused emotions, emotions stifled beneath the creaky iron armor called manners. 34 The hero of Stanley Elkins The Dick Gibson Show, on a bus late at night between Des Moines and Chicago, makes a pass at the girl in the seat beside him. She shrieks and slaps him, but quite soon they are having a couple of jolly orgasms together. Elkin draws the moral, what a lesson. 
so much for your timidities and reservations, so much for your doubts and reluctances, your equivocations and hesitancies and shields of decorum more heavy than the world. Par for your civilizing trepidations, how many words there are for it, I could go on forever. One smash of passion and poof went appearance 35, my emphasis. Many of the better writers of the second generation of the Eastern European immigration also found that I spoke to their condition, Norman Mailer and poet Carl Shapiro, for example. Paul Goodman combined Reich with Kafka. The hero of Saul Bellows Henderson the Rain King discovers on arrival that his African chieftain possesses the complete works of Wilhelm Reich. In Isaac Rosenfeld's haunting novel Passage from Home, published the year following the English language edition of Reich's character analysis, we read of the hero's stepmother. Hovering over her unwelcome guest, Minna, armed with a smile. 36 Bella recalls that it was only after Rosenfeld had given up the Reichianism which for a time had absorbed us both that he no longer questioned people impulsively about their sexual habits or estimated the amount of character armor they wore. 37. But in depth psychology itself, Wilhelm Reich's air was clearly Fritz Peary's. If Reich used Freud's analytic situation as a revolutionary laboratory and model to transform the Western social situation, much as John Dewey once wanted to use the school to transform, rather than reflect, the society outside, it was left to the late Dr. Frederick S. Peary's to transform Reich's individual analytic situation into Reichian group therapy sessions. In his Isselin Institute gestalt therapy sessions, he struggled to create a social situation that would have all the properties of both a, public, encounter with strangers and a primary, private living with, family type, familiars. If Freud attempts to create in diaspora the shtetl Jew on a temporary, regressive basis, Beeries would recreate the shtetl as a group in all the dense wideness of group effect. If we turn to Perls's gestalt therapy verbatim, all of which is extracted from audio tapes made at weekend DreamWorks seminars conducted by Peary's at the Esalen Institute in Big Zua, California, from 1966 through 1968, we see the original adversary thrust of the diaspora intelligentsia reappearing once more. After the ritual references in his introduction, at this moment it seems to me that the race is about lost to the fascists 38 Peary's gets down to the real business of encounter therapy by saying, I'm not talking about ourselves as social beings. I don't talk about the pseudo existence, but of the basic natural existence. 39 after assuring us, like Eric Fromm, that we are living in an insane society and insisting, but I am not nice my emphasis, he goes on to distinguish three classes of verbiage production in his therapy sessions, chicken shit this is good morning, how are you, and so on, bullshit this is because, rationalization, excuses, and elephant shit this is when you talk about philosophy, existential gestalt therapy, etc. What I am doing now 40, my emphasis. Reich's three-layered personality has acquired two more layers in Big Zua. The first layer is the cliché layer. If you meet somebody you exchange clichés, good morning, handshake, and all of the meaningless tokens of meeting, my emphasis. Behind the cliché layer is the role-playing layer, the VIP role, the nice little girl and good boy roles. So those are the superficial, social, as if layers. We pretend. Peary's continues, to be better, tougher, weaker, more polite, etc. than we really feel 41, Pearls's emphasis. Beneath that is the third layer where we experience nothingness, we feel stuck and lost. Behind this ampass layer lies the fourth, the death layer or implosive layer, Pearls's emphasis, which, when really contacted, explodes into the fifth or explosive layer, we become O. Then tick, capable of experiencing and expressing the four basic kinds of genuine explosive emotions, grief, orgasm, anger, and joy. 42. By the end of 1968, Peary's was coming to the conclusion that workshops and group therapy are obsolete, and we are going to start our first gestalt kibbutz next year. 
the permanent membership of the kibbutz was to have been 30, with the final differentiation, between staff and seminarians, eliminated. The main thing is, the community spirit enhanced by therapy. This Gemschkaft was meant to be a growth experience and we hope that this time we can produce real people 43, Pearls is emphasis. We can gather the direction in which Beres would have taken his kibbutz from the following verbatim segment from an intensive four-week workshop at the Esalen Institute in the summer of 1968. Blair, I have an unfinished situation with you Fritz. Fritz, ya. Yeah. B, quietly angry. I don't know what kind of jest halt bullshit you were trying to pull last night, when I asked you for a match. But all I want is a simple yes or no when I ask you for a match. And not a bunch of verbal messing around until I come up with the right combination of words and you come across with the match. And another thing, if I want a damned sermon on social etiquette, he'll ask you for it. As far as I am concerned, you enter my life space when I get up there on that damn chair and no other time. I'm not interested. F. Gently, so what should I do? B. Just don't mess up my mind when I ask you for a match. You can say a yes or no and that's enough. And he'll let you know. When I want you, and that's up there on the hot seat. F. You made one mistake. You didn't ask me for a match. B, loudly, oh, yes, I did. 99% of the people in America, when you say, have you a match? Those people who are over 10 years old, that is, don't come up and say, yeah, I got a match, or some cute little fucking thing like that. You knew what I meant. Why did you fuck around? Dale, those are all dishonest people. B, ugh. Don't give me that crap, Dale. F. Are you coming to my defense? Dale. Oh, no 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 no. I'm just telling him. Laughter. No, you do fine for yourself. B. Still mad, that's bullshit. That's the just old game, that's what that is. And you can't look at me honestly and say you didn't know that I wanted a match. F. Coily, oh. I knew that you wanted a match. Rye and later variations. B, then why did you pull all that crap? F, because I pull all that crap. Because I am the 1%. Laughter. B, ugh, brother, I want to get out of here. F, that's a good resentment. B, you know. I'm getting so I don't even resent you anymore, laughter. Blair waves an admonishing finger at Fritz, you earn your money when you sit in that chair, and, Fritz mimics Blair's pointing finger, yeah? Bad boy, laughter, you are AO.K, you play rules, I'll play mine. Just don't, my rules are, when I ask for a match, you know, just give it to me. Laughter, give me a straight answer. F, so can you also appreciate what I did? B, of course. Let me tell you, laughter, I'm not alone on the jazz, Fritz. But that doesn't keep me from being damn pissed. The fact that. F. The fact is that the blah, anemic guy you were two weeks ago is now coming out with the real anger. 44, my emphasis. As the 1970s got underway, title to Reich's damned sermon on social etiquette passed from Fritz Peeries to Arthur Janoff. Author of The Primal Scream, 1970. 45 If to dress too loudly is a breach of taste, and if to talk too loudly is a breach of civility, to scream is tantamount to a revolution. In his portrait of Russian Jewish immigrants in England, Robert Kotlowitz in his finely observed novel Somewhere Else depicts the growing frustration of the Pilchik sisters as they find others unmoved by their arguments for revolutionary socialism, so, boys. Anna said in an unnaturally loud voice to Zygmunt and Mendel one Saturday in the sisters' flat. No use playing with theories. You want to change the world, help us change it. Come to our meeting this week. We need young men like you. You don't know how much work there is to do. It won't be easy to socialize this country. 
Everyone has manners. Everyone knows how to behave. Everyone is too nice. They have to learn how to scream. T46. In France, title passed in the 1960s to the anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, as we shall see in part 2. T in his memoir Baltimore Boy, Kotlowitz, born in 1924, recounts how the old synagogues disappeared and how the gnarled, crackling Hebrew of the Bible slowly began its transformation at services into the resonant dignity of English as even Orthodox congregations began to pray more and more in the national language, and with that has come a paling of Jehovah himself into a neat, even featured image of polite dignity, in short, an Anglo-Saxon God. This polite dignity is paralleled by the development in the Baltimore Cantor's son of a polite personality, above board I was a neat, pleasant, well-mannered boy who paid attention to the rules, it was easier that way. Baltimore boy, Robert Kotlowitz, growing up Jewish, ed. J. David, New York, Pocket Books, 1970, pp. 252-243. The story originally appeared in Harper's, December 1965. The secret inner bond between overthrowing property and outraging propriety was clear to the Pilchik sisters. It had not been obvious to Karl Marx. He had to learn the connection the hard way. Like Freud, Marx experienced civility as censorship. This fact supplies the inner link between two ideologies of the Jewish intellectual culture of the diaspora. Freudianism and Marxism. Part 2. Karl Marx and Claude Levi Strauss. Father and Son, Marx vs. Marx. Karl Marx's father, Heinrich, his original name was Herschel H. Levi Marx, was a liberal, cultivated, enlightened lawyer, a convert to evangelical Protestantism. At his bidding, on August 26, 1824, his son Karl and Karl's five sisters were baptized into the Evangelical Church. Shortly before graduation from the Trier Gymnasium, the 17-year-old Marx wrote a commentary on the Gospel of St. John entitled On the Union of the Faithful with Christ according to John 15, 1 14, described in its ground and essence, in its unconditioned necessity and in its effects. Chief among the effects of this union with Christ, Karl Marx writes, is that human virtue itself is gentled, it is no longer gloomy, stoic, difficult, and dutiful. Every repulsive aspect is driven out, all that is coarse is dissolved, and virtue is made clear, becoming gentler and more human one, my emphasis. This early theological work of Marx, as important, in its way, for an understanding of Marxism as the publication of Hegel's theologies Jugendschriften were for an understanding of Hegel, too is structured by the contrast between the highest achievements possible to pre-Christians, crude greatness and untamed egoism and the higher world, which draws us up purified to heaven made possible by the union with Christ described in the Gospel of John. 3 This dialectic of the crude and the refined is central to Marx's thought, once at the University of Bonn, the young Marx's behavior takes a decisive turn, in parental eyes anyway, toward the coarse and the crude. What has been called the struggle with the father for begins. The issue between them was clear, the son had repudiated his father's commitment to the social art, to bourgeois conversation, respectability, and propriety. The smooth parental solution of the Jewish problem did not work for the more passionate and more fastidious son. Because of Marx's deeper acculturation, he was aesthetically revolted by the discrepant profile the parental conversion had bequeathed to him, he shuddered at the grotesque admixture in himself of the Prussian and the Jew. Five to convert was for him to conceal, and to conceal, his high. 2 I 9. Good taste informed him, was to be vulgar. Coarseness reveals, vulgarity conceals, E. M. Forster has told us. Karl Marx's behavior at Bonn University was the despair of his father. First it was his beer drinking, dueling, reckless spending, and general carousing. The son, after a time, ceases to violate the Protestant ethic, 
only to commit a deeper offense. He reads all night, seeking answers, truth becomes more important than sociability, the strength of his convictions offends his friends and family, he is becoming a fanatic, violating the enlightened Protestant aesthetic. The aging father writes his son from Trier, December 10, 1837. God help us! Complete disorder, stupid wandering through all branches of knowledge, stupid brooding over melancholy oil lamps. Going to seed in a scholastic dressing gown and unkempt hair as a change from going to seed with a glass of beer. Repellent unsociability regardless of all propriety and even of all feelings for your father. The limitation of the social art to a filthy room. Meanwhile the common crowd slip ahead undisturbed and reach their goal in a better or at least more comfortable way compared with those who despise their youthful joys and destroy their health in order to snatch at the shadow of erudition, which they would come to possess more easily through an hour's talk with some competent person, and in addition they would have enjoyed the social pleasure of conversation. Zero. Six years later Marx in his first public article attacks the Prussian bureaucrats who, while allowing him to publish any convictions he pleases, insist on their right to censor the manner of expression of these views. In an enlightened bourgeois liberal era, civil society enjoins its members to be moderate. Obsession as such has become disreputable. This form of adverbial censorship is, as we shall see, particularly costly for the secular Jewish intellectual. Another father would later write a son who was in the course of developing strong convictions quite other than those of Marx, your mother and I like very much your attitude of having strong convictions and of not being too bashful to express them. What I meant was that you would have to learn to be more moderate in the expression of your views and try to express them in a way that would give as little offense as possible to your friends. Memo of William F. Buckley, Sr., to William F. Buckley, Jr., age 15, quoted in L. Clayton Du Bois, The First Family of Conservatism, New York Times Magazine, August 9, 1970, p. 28. Chapter 15. Censorship, Persecution and the A.R.T. of Writing. In February 1843 the first political article Marx ever wrote, on censorship, appeared in the Swiss magazine Anecdota. Significantly, Freud's first great work appearing at the century's end, The Interpretation of Dreams, was also to deal with censorship, Freud discovered that, even in dream life, between the forbidden wish and the dream work falls the shadow of the censor. Freud correlated the role of the censor in dream life with the role played by the social censorship of manners in waking life. The politeness which I practice every day is to a large extent a simulation of this kind. One this work of Marx, his political debut, deserves close reading. In it the young Marx notes with fury that the latest Prussian censorship instruction demands that he observe prior restraint not on his political views but on his manners and style of writing, not on what he says, but how he says it. The new Prussian censorship instructions were a liberalization of the original edict of 1819, it instructed the censors not to construe the prior edict too substantively, article 2 of the prior edict was never intended to impede any serious and restrained pursuit of truth, the instruction reads. Immediately, the word restrained triggers all of Marx's rage. Instantly, all the antinomies of Jewish emancipation are set clanging. Jews are to vote as citoyens, but they must also pass as bourgeois, Jews are invited to act in the political arena, but they must behave in the social arena, Jews may do or say anything they wish in the West, with only this proviso, they must do or say it in a seemly and restrained manner. Makes rights. The pursuit of truth not to be impeded is qualified as being serious and restrained. Both modifications point to something outside the content of the pursuit rather than to the matter to be investigated. They detract from the pursuit of truth and bring into. While this article was written in February 1842, it was not published until 1843, because the journal for which he had written his article on censorship, the Deutsche Jabutscher, was censored. Play an unknown third factor, alongside pursuit and truth. 
if an investigation must constantly attend to this third factor, an irritation supported by law, will such pursuit not lose sight of the truth? Isn't the first duty of the person in search of truth that he proceed to it directly without glancing left or right? Don't I forget the substance if I must never forget to state it in a prescribed form? 2. My Emphasis The dream censor imposes evasiveness on the id, Freud later says, the id must learn euphemism, obliquity, and circuitousness to pass the vigilance of the censor. In this way the id is refined, sublimated, civilized. Only as such may it qualify for admission to the consciousness of civil society. Marx is in the toils of his first collision with bourgeois society and its doctrine of expressive prior restraint. He continues. Truth can be as little restrained as light, and in relation to what should it be restrained? In relation to itself? Willem index sui et falsi, truth alone measures truth and falsehood, Spinoza. Hence, in relation to falsehood? If restraint shapes the character of inquiry it is a criterion for shying away from truth rather than from falsity. It is a drag on every step I take, cf, the politeness which I practice every day is. Dissimulation of this kind. Freud, with inquiry, restraint is the prescribed fear of finding the result, a means of keeping one from the truth. 3. Marx's Emphasis Heinrich Marx had criticized his son's social behavior and had invoked the exigencies of bourgeois social form. The father had himself graduated in a generation from civil society to polite society. He feared his son might become a class. Meanwhile, the son was exploring a frontier, he was discovering that, in practice, the line between civil and polite society, between morals and manners, between the how of a thing and the what of a thing, was a very difficult line to draw. He was depressed and infuriated by the fact that, however analytically distinct they might be, the roles of good citizen and respectable bourgeois interpenetrated each other. Bourgeois society even had prior tests, restraints on how the truth you were researching should look when you found it, it's bon mine. Furthermore, truth is universal. It does not belong to me, it belongs to all, it possesses me, I do not possess it. A style is my property, my spiritual individuality, he style, sestihom. Indeed. The law permits me to write, only I am supposed to w tight in a style different from my own. I may show the profile of my mind, but first I must show the prescribed mean. The prescribed mean is nothing but bon mine amor visier. I may be humorous, but the law orders that I write seriously. I may be forward, but the law orders my style to be restrained. Gray on gray is to be the only permissible color of freedom. The official color. The essence of mind is always truth itself, and what do you make its essence? Restraint. Only a good for nothing holds back, says Goethe, and you want to make the mind a good for nothing? 4. Marx's Emphasis, Except on First. Marx was being asked to hold back, to restrain himself. He was unwilling, or unable, it is clear, to do so. Marx, like Freud, with lingering enlightenment optimism, believed he could interpose a neutral free zone between the unrestrained importunity of emancipating Jewry and the restraint system of the Gentile society in the West. Between the Jew and the Gentile superego Freud was to later interpose the neutral instrumental ego of the psychoanalyst. Marx said something analogous earlier by insisting that true restraint does not lie in the language of culture permitting no accent and no dialect. Rather, he writes, turning to the language of universalist rationalism, it speaks the accent of the substance of things and the dialectic of their nature. It is a matter of forgetting restraint and unrestraint, read, Gentile and Jew, and of crystallizing things. The general restraint of the mind is reason, that universal liberality which is related to every nature according to its essential character 5, Marx's emphasis. But, this ritual bow in the direction of the enlightenment over, Marx returns to the fray and to what really concerns him. 
The inherent tension in bourgeois society between truth itself and the problem of saying it like it is. He perceives accurately that the civic society of bourgeois culture will yield on everything except procedures, it will concede all nouns, if it can retain control of the adverbs. Marx returns to the question of the Prussian censorship instruction, its censorship of appearance, rather than reality, of form rather than content, and tries to tear it to shreds. It instructs us, he says, in its mildness, in its assertion that the 1819 edict was not intended to impede any serious and restrained pursuit of truth. Ridiculous! says Marx. The ancient leader to the masculine of Jewish emancipation, the promise of freedom, is held out once more. But Marx this time will read the small print in the brutal bargain of emancipation, be free see I toyons it proclaims, come in any stripe, pursue and speak any truth, only the bourgeois caveat reads, be serious and restrained. Time eo danos et don fearance, I fear Greeks bearing gifts, he writes, quoting Virgil. 6 For I treat the ridiculous seriously when I treat it as ridiculous runs the savage pilpulism of Marx, and the most serious lack of intellectual restraint is to be restrained about a lack of restraint. Then he continues. Serious and restrained. What wavering and relative concepts. Where does seriousness end, and where does levity begin? Where does restraint leave off, and where does lack of restraint start? We are dependent upon the temperament of the censor. Prescribing a temperament for the censor would be just as wrong as prescribing a style for the writer. If you wish to be logical in your aesthetic criticism, prohibit the pursuit of truth in a too serious and too restrained manner, for the greatest seriousness is the most ridiculous thing, and the greatest restraint is the bitterest irony. 7. Marx's Emphasis, of course. Marx then goes for the jugular of the Prussian censorship instruction its implicit claim that, at the end of the road of social research, there sits patiently a value-free truth waiting to be formulated in the official prose of a value-neutral and civil civil servant. All this, Marx declares, proceeds from a completely wrong and abstract view of truth. Even if we disregard the subjective side, he continues. Namely that one and the same object appears differently in different individuals and expresses its various aspects in as many various intellects, shouldn't the character of the object of some influence, even the slightest, on the inquiry? Not only the result but also the root belongs to truth. The pursuit of truth must itself be true, the true inquiry is the developed truth whose scattered parts are assembled in the result and the nature of the inquiry is not to change according to the object. When the object is humorous, inquiry is supposed to appear serious. When the object is touchy, inquiry is to be restrained. Thus you injure the rights of the subject. You grasp truth abstractly and make the mind an inquisitor who dryly records the proceedings, my emphasis on sentence not only. Here we see the matrix of Marx's essay, written in 1843 and published in 1844, on the Jewish question. When the object is touchy he asks, disbelievingly, inquiry is to be restrained. Of course not, is the obvious answer. Such a restraint is exactly the sort extorted by the neutral civil service bureaucrats of a bourgeois state thinking itself to be the universal idea of Hegel. It is with the current essay behind. Note how, with his exclamation marks and numerous italicizations, Marx is already enacting the unrestrained mode of expression frowned on by bourgeois writing codes. This is the first of three manifestos in which Marx makes a public declaration of motives latent, hidden, in most of the diaspora intelligentsia. It proclaims, Jewish emancipation has failed. Liberal reform, gradualism will not work. There must be revolution. Marx's other manifestos are on the Jewish question and the Corn Munist manifesto, Freud's interest, on the other hand, was in the disguises forced on the latent wishes of assimilating Jewry, JMC. Him that Marx will tackle, 
in his long postponed essay on the Jewish question, the two works in which Bruno Bauer wraps the touchy subject of the Jews in a hieratic prose of genteel academic restraint. What then, for Marx, is the status of this new censorship instruction? Is it political? Clearly not, in the old sense of political, anyway. The new norms go, not to the political content of the ideas expressed, but to the restraint of their manner of expression. Is the new censorship instruction, then, moral censorship, legislating morality? The old censorship edict, Marx notes, includes within the purpose of censorship the suppression of whatever offends morality and good conduct. The instruction quotes this from Article 2. But, there, new, commentary, contains omissions in regard to morality. To offend morality and good conduct is now to injure discipline, morals, and outward loyalty. One observes, Marx continues, in his careful exegesis of the new instruction, that morality is morality, as the principle of the world with its own laws, has disappeared and thus the new censorship does not invade this inner realm, whose autonomy it does not recognize in any case. If the norms of the new censorship instruction do not bear on the old matter of political moral behavior, what realm is it legislating for? What has taken its place? Police regulated honorability and conventional good manners have taken its place, nine replies Marx, that is, respectability and public propriety, Marx's emphasis. It is fanaticism, it is obsession that has been tabooed by bourgeois civil society. The qualities of reasonableness, moderation, compromise, tolerance, sober choice in short. The anti-apocalyptic style of life brought into the world by the middle class is experienced by Marx as an iron cage. A man obsessed, he attacks bourgeois civil society whose great cultural triumph is, as Podhoritz observes, precisely that it brought obsession into disrepute. 10. My emphasis. Since truth is decreed by the governmental censors, the reference to the search for truth, inquiry is mere ritual. Marx asks. Is truth to be understood in such a way that it is constituted by governmental order, and is inquiry a superfluous and obnoxious third element which cannot be entirely rejected for reasons of etiquette? For inquiry is understood a priori as being opposed to truth and appears therefore with the suspicious official patina of seriousness and restraint a layman is supposed to display before a priest. 11. Marx's Emphasis Marx then breaks into a metaphor that not only reveals the nature of I am reinterpreting here, of course, the famous passage of Max Weber, but fate decreed that the cloak should become an iron cage. Max Weber, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, trans. Talcott Parsons, New York, Scribner's, 1930, p. 181. The censorship instruction but betrays the hidden way he and his colleagues among the Jewish exiles in the diaspora had experienced all the tolerance instructions of the 19th century social emancipation, you are to write freely, but every word is to be a curtsy before liberal censorship, which lets your serious and restrained words pass. By no means should you lose, he concludes, a consciousness of humility 12, my emphasis. The serious and restrained words of your liberal Hefform Jews will pass, but the mocking impudence of your Shlomi eels, like Hein, will not pass. The serious and restrained words of your revisionist Marxists will pass, but the savage vulgarity of your pariahs, like Marx himself, will not pass into respectable, bourgeois Christian society. In theory, Marx could differentiate the cultural from the social, but in practice, not unlike his follower Mike Gold, he was a hater of refinements of thought, partly because he could not distinguish them from refinements of manners, which he knew to be a petty but joyously 13, my emphasis, and partly because he would not so distinguish refined thoughts from gentle manners, and partly because he knew such thoughts to be indistinguishable from such manners, and hence a petty bourgeois leader. To incorporate mental restraints and discriminations into the personality system went together with internalizing the social behavior constraints of the social system, making up one modernization civilizational package.
In the modernization process the finesses of one system become the nuances of the others, intellectual distinctions breed personal distinction, and vice versa, personality, social, and cultural systems all, allowing for ascertainable lags play suavely into each other. As discrepancies in inter-system profiles are surmounted, a drift to consistency remorselessly sets in, the cunning of the modernization process is at work refining substance into subjectivity. T14. Every word is to be a curtsy, wrote Marx. The ancient idea of charity, feudalized into chivalry in the Middle Ages, secularized into courtesy, and curtsy, in the 17th and 18th centuries undergoing a final metamorphosis in the 19th century into the civility of the emergent civil societies in the nation states of the West, this ancient value package was the collective representation hovering over the secularizing Christian West that rubbed emerging Jewry the wrong way. It caused in them what Eastern European Jewry called juries, trouble, aggravation. For Jews of the emancipation, whether the authors quoted here, see note 13, apply this quotation only to gold, precisely to distinguish his vulgar Marxism from Marx's. I, of course, see the matter somewhat differently. F. This is Karl Loeth's phrase describing the world historical revolution introduced by Christianity, see note 14. I see this revolutionary theological input of Christianity continuing its work of refinement in the secularized incognito of the modernization civilizational package exported to the third world. Observant or inobservant, the core concept that embodies and integrates the whole Jewish experience in the diaspora, writes Ben Halpam, is the idea of exile. A ban of penance. Living in expiatory subjection to the Gentiles. 15 With the dissolution, at the time of emancipation, of the formal, sacral institutions embodying this subjection, namely, ghetto and shtitlin formal, de facto institutions of segregation appeared, sponsored by both Jew and Gentile. Separate but equal facilities were the rule for rank and file Jews. In the neutral spaces of the literary social salons, Masonic lodges, and financial operations, and among bourgeois converts to the evangelical church like Heinrich Marx and his family, there was passing. But questions of capacity, qualifications, civil betterment, and passing readiness were always only just out of sight. The bourgeois question, had they arrived, socially, was always more salient for both sides than the citizens question, had they voted? The new historical situation of Jewish emancipation took the majority of Jews by surprise, writes Jacob Katz, and confronted the Jewish community with unprecedented tasks. The practice of the newly attained political rights required of them cultural and social adjustment 16, my emphasis. In my terms, social interaction ritual, that is bourgeois Christian rights were prerequisite to the practice of civil rights and, ultimately, a condition of access to them. They were, at once, rites of passage and rites of passing. But if the Jew's consuming interest was in acculturation, the bourgeois Gentile observed him for the signs of assimilation, social. It was the Gentile superego that presided over the Committee on Admissions, that set all the qualifications and passed on where the Jews passed, and held all the black balls in its hand. The theological antipathy of the Middle Ages had yielded to the complaints of debtors and creditors of the 17th and 18th centuries, in the 19th century, with the emergence of the social category, social antipathy was mixed with economic antipathy and gradually displaced it among the middle classes. The question stood, are Jews to be admitted to bourgeois society? Like someone importunate for admission to a select private club, one is never quite sure just what are the admission qualifications, or who are the members of the admission committee, or, strange as it seems, whether one really wants to belong in the first place, one does not need to be possessed of ect Jewish self-hate the normal garden variety of social uneasiness will do just as well, to say with Groucho Marx, any club that'll have me isn't worth joining. An early Marx complains to the Gentile Prussian censors, you demand restraint and you proceed from the enormous unrestraint of making the civil servant a spy of the heart, 
an omniscient person, philosopher, theologian, the Delphic Apollo. On the one hand, you force us to acknowledge unrestraint, on the other, you forbid us unrestraint. 17 Offensive Utter Answers and defamatory judgments on individuals are not suitable for print, Marx quotes from the instruction. Not suitable for print. He exclaims. Instead of this gentle phrasing we should have liked to receive objective definitions for what is considered offensive and defamatory. 18 Marx quotes the hope of the instruction that political literature and the daily press will gain a more dignified tone through the good offices of its censors' vigilance and attacks the romanticism of the spirit. The romantic indefiniteness, and, sensitive inwardness, Marx's emphasis, of such ambiguous norms of preventive prudence. 19. The last matter Marx turns his attention to is the clause of the censorship instruction urging the appointment of censors who can overlook with self-confidence and tact minor objections in a piece of political writing which are not justified in view of the purport and direction of the entire article. Marx fairly explodes, the content as a criterion for censorship already disappeared, as we have observed, now the form disappears too. All objective norms have been abandoned, the personal relationship is left, and the censor's tact may be called a guarantee. What, norm, can the censor violate, then? Marx asks, his emphasis. Tact. But tactlessness is no crime. 20, of the Nazi final solution, Trevor Roper writes that it was a dirty business, everyone agreed. But, it was bad form. Contrary to the German, inborn gift of tactfulness, to discuss the details. 21. Marx, himself fabled for a tactlessness verging on the heroic, has, in this, his first public article, worked his way to the structural elements of the problem of 19th century Jewish emancipation, on the one side we have the petitioning emigrant from, ultimately, the back country T of the shtetl seeking to pass into the West into its political and social systems by means of education and interpersonal skills, into its streets and public places, into its professions, as, in this case, Marx inaugurating his career as a political journalist, and everywhere urged to show restraint in his pursuits, of career, of money, of, in this case, truth, on the other side we have the immigration officials staffing the custom houses, the censors the Gentile Western superego, instructed to use tact in what it will allow to pass. Tact, the dictionary tells us, is delicate perception of the right thing to say or do without offending. 22 to Marx, such a directive, couched in terms of restraint and tact, is the ultimate in arbitrariness, based on haughty conceit of a police state. The censor, is prosecutor, lawyer, and judge in one person. 23 A curious police state, nevertheless, it legislated not criminal laws, but tactlessness is no crime, nor civil laws, nor morals, but manners. Marx had been emancipated into the modern, but you always liberal era of civil society. Not having undergone in his upbringing. Prior restraint, as we say today in freedom of the press litigations, T. The late Sir Louis Namia called the Russian Pale the hinterland of world jury. The blessings of a properly installed Protestant ethic, he would encounter and experience the informal sumptuary legislation of a Protestant etiquette as a heteronymous tyranny. Later, in another battle over censorship, Marx replies to an attack on his critique, in the Rhenish Zetung, of the debates in the Rhenish Diet on freedom of the press. The Colonus Zetung in turn attacked the left Hegelians for their assaults on Christianity and reproved the censors for the blameworthy forbearance they had shown in allowing the newer philosophical school, and I quote from Marx's reply, to make the most unseemly attacks upon Christianity in public papers and other printed writings not intended exclusively for scientific circles. 24 Marx makes short work of the assumption of this liberal leading article that science is on the side of Christianity and that the religious faith of the ordinary reader should not be exposed to the doubts aroused by public religious controversy. In fact, he writes, 
the truly believing heart of the great masses is probably more exposed to the corrosion of doubt than the refined worldly culture of the few 25, my emphasis. This cryptic remark, one more example of the onslaught of pariah jury against refinement as such means that while the crude religious beliefs of the masses, in miracles, etc., are in open collision with scientific findings, thus creating real crises of faith, the refined liberal Protestantism of the elite enables it to escape such a real clash and hence to escape the anxiety of real doubt. But the liberalism of the Cologne paper is in the end, according to Marx, less concerned with whether the investigations of Christianity in the public papers be scientific or unscientific than it is with another requirement, in Marx's words, even if it is attacked by unscientific investigations in all the papers of the monarchy it must be discreet and quiet. Marx once more brings the matter of seemliness to center stage, it is decorum, and concern for appearances, and fear of scandal, and deference to good taste that prevent philosophical and religious ideas from entering the so-called unsuitable terrain of newspapers. Attention must be paid, Marx insists, to the cry of life of ideas which have burst open the orderly, hieroglyphic husk of the system to become citizens of the world. 26. One more time Marx will turn his attention to censorship and the special meaning it had for him and shortly thereafter his paper, the Renis Zetung, is suppressed and Marx goes into exile in Paris. On the day he becomes editor-in-chief, he replies to charges by an Augsburg paper that, as he writes, makes the faux pas of finding there. See a parallel attack by Irving Howe on Hannah Arendt for printing her unseemly attack on the Eichmann trial in a public magazine not intended exclusively for intellectual circles. Irving Howe, The Nez Vyorker and Hannah Arendt, Commentary 36, No. 4, October 1963, 318 ff. Renis Zetung to be a Prussian communist. The reader may decide, Marx rejoins, whether this ill-mannered fancy of the Augsburger is fair. After we have presented the alleged corpus delicti 27, my emphasis. He counters their charge that his paper has presented dirty linen with approval by asking whether his paper should maintain that communism is not an important current issue because it wears dirty linen and does not smell of rose water. Marx recalls that the Augsburg paper itself, in the person of its Paris correspondent, has been seeking to assimilate certain socialist communist ideas to monarchy itself and, in the process, of course, laundering communism. This correspondent is a convert who treats history as a baker treats botany. The real offense then, of Marx, is thus understandable. The Augsburg paper will never forgive us for revealing communism to the public in its unwashed nakedness. Now you understand the dog irony Marx tells his readers, with which we are told that we recommend communism, which had the happy elegance of being discussed in the Augsburg paper 28, Marx's emphasis. To seek to appropriate socialist communist ideas 29 into bourgeois liberalism, Marx holds, much more into monarchy, is to refine away all their coarse power, to endow them with the happy elegance of bourgeois chit chat in the family newspaper. Communism is dirty linen, Marx declares, which must indeed be laundered if it is to pass in respectable journalistic circles. We know already, in outline anyway. What will happen when Marx puts his hand to writing on the Jewish question, we know that he will wash dirty linen in public and that, in so doing, he will violate not only the Gentile commandment of public decorum, opening himself to the charge of vulgarity, but he will also violate a powerful low unwritten commandment of Jewish life, thou shalt not reveal in group secrets to the Goyim T30 opening himself to the charge of anti-Semitism. In one stroke, he will have become a double pariah, unfit by reason of vulgarity for the polite society of Gentiles. Vulgar anti-Semitism, after all, was not salons for Hig and persona non grata with the Jewish community because he had told truth in a hostile environment. J31. In October and November 1842 he published his analysis of the Cruelwood theft laws passed by the Rhenish Diet, sitting in Düsseldorf, 
against peasants who gathered fallen branches in the forest to use as fuel. Then, in early 1843, he began a series of articles on the economic distress. Marx is not by any means a communist at this time. T. Thus did Professor Seymour Leventman, co-author of Children of the Gilded Ghetto, Lycan, in a letter to Commentary Magazine, see Note 30. Attacks on Philip Roth's Goodbye, Columbus to earlier attacks on his book for having violated this taboo. This is Hannah Arendt's explanation of why the organized, and the not so organized, Jewish community came down on her heart for her Eichmann in Jerusalem. What I had done according to their lights was the crime of crimes, I had told the truth in a hostile environment slash as an Israeli official told me, see note 31. 23.0. Of their Moselle vintages. Later, he was to recall these two articles as his first embarrassed effort to deal in detail with material interests. 32. Finally, on March 18th, the following announcement appeared in his paper, the undersigned declares that as from today he has resigned from editorship of the Renis Zetung due to present censorship conditions. 33. The paper shuts down on April I and on June 19, 1843, Marx marries Baroness Jenny von Westphalen in the Protestant church at Krasnach. After a honeymoon trip to Rumpfatz, Switzerland, the couple return to the home of his mother-in-law at Krasnach. The Marx works on on the Jewish question and the critique of Higvia's philosophy of right. As he writes, he is preparing his departure from Prussia. Why will he leave? Because, he writes Rug that summer. He is allowed only to use pins instead of a sword in his fight for liberty, I am tired of this hypocrisy and stupidity, of the boorishness of officials, I am tired of having to bound scrape and invent safe and harmless phrases 34, my emphasis. The expressive norms of verbal propriety embodied in the Prussian censorship instruction were experienced by Marx as a form of persecution, persecution by propriety. To have continued to write would have been to bow and scrape and invent safe and harmless phrases, that is, to practice the bourgeois form of what Leo Strauss has called writing between the lines. 35 This technique of esoteric writing, in which a hidden truth is deliberately concealed like a stowaway among the plausible baggage of exoteric opinion shipped to the vulgar, was repugnant to Marx. Besides, the form of censorship emerging in the liberal era addressed itself more to the manner of statement than to its content. In a man constitutionally incapable of understatement, such censorship was intolerable. He refused this form of moral Marinoism as his ticket of admission to the cultural system of bourgeois Christian Prussia. How rare the fortunate times, Marx had concluded his article on the Prussian censorship instruction, quoting Tacitus in which you can think what you wish and say what you think. The months at Krasnach with the Westphalans following his honeymoon with Jenny were to be one of those fortunate times. Taken up with working on his 150-page critique and his reply to Bauer on the Jewish question, these months in 1843, prior to the Paris manuscripts of 1844, are the decisive months in Marx's intellectual development. His practical experience for the first time flows directly into a theoretical critique. Just as his own struggles with the censors. Provided Marx with at least part of the experience which underlies his long and bitter attack on the bureaucracy in the critique, 36 so his observations of newly emancipated Jewry entering civil society, the Bergelische Zuschkaft gave him the empirical grip which underlies his long and bitter attack on Hegel's presumed reconciliation of bourgeois and Citoyen in the modem state. In the latter's philosophy of right. Intending to revise his critique, Marx wrote an introduction to it and published it in the same issue of the yearbook in which he published on the Jewish question. The original motivation nexus, to use a phrase of Leo Strauss, of Marx's call for the abolition of private property lies in this early struggle with public propriety. Cultural education spread, Horkheimer and Adorno write, with bourgeois property. 37 Bourgeois propriety spread in the wake of bourgeois property. Bourgeois bildung, in the large sense of the restraints of the Protestant expressive aesthetic, 
with its sense of mine and thine, with its fears and privacies, the whole envelope of precious space enclosing each differentiated bourgeois individual like a sacred mandala, ticketing him against intrusion, all of this Marx experienced as emasculating, domesticating, taming. France, at least, he had learned, allowed one to say the unsayable. He would take his heterodoxy there. There, in self-imposed exile from Germany, he would address himself to the Jewish question. The ancient Jude and Frage. Decisions made in coming to terms with the Jewish question could then be used in settling his accounts with the bourgeois Christian West. In October 1843 he left with Jenny for Paris. On the Jewish question was published in Paris, in February 1844, in the only issue ever to appear of the Deutsch Franz Osses Jobitscher that was edited by Marx and his friend Arnold Drug. 38 In that issue Parisians read the opinions that were to become an abomination to Marx's fellow Jews, a delight to anti-Semites and a source of continuing embarrassment to members of the revolutionary Marxist movement, both Jew and Gentile. Let us consider the actual, secular Jew, not the Sabbath Jew, as Bauer does, but the everyday Jew. Let us look for the secret of the Jew not in his religion but rather for the secret of the religion in the actual Jew. What is the secular basis of Judaism? Practical need, self-interest. What is the worldly cult of the Jew? Bargaining. What is his worldly God? Money. Very well. Emancipation from bargaining and money, and thus from practical and real Judaism would be the self-emancipation of our era. Christianity arose out of Judaism. It has again dissolved itself into Judaism. From the outset the Christian was the theorizing Jew. Hence, the Jew is the practical Christian and the practical Christian has again become a Jew. Christianity overcame real Judaism only in appearance. It censorship, persecution and the art of writing was too refined, too spiritual, to eliminate the crudeness of practical need except by elevating it into the blue. Christianity is the sublime thought of Judaism, and Judaism is the vulgar practical application of Christianity. 39. Marx's emphasis. Even though in 1843 the bourgeois taboo against revealing in public even presuming such a revelation were true, the ignominious group behavior of minorities, including one's own, was much less strong than it was to become subsequently, nevertheless, Marx's essay, as we have noted, embarrassed his friends, pleased anti-Semites, and enraged Jews. Yet for all its shock value, Marx's book review of Bauer's two works on the Jewish question merely re-argued in mid-19th century form a question that had been publicly argued in the previous century, are the Jews congenitally unsociable and rude, or are they this way as a result of having been segregated into ghettos? Such was the form of the question, notes the Franco-Jewish historian Leon Poliakoff, over which argument raged in the 18th century, on the eve of the emancipation. 40. Was Marx an anti-Semite, that is, a Jew-hater? Was he a self-hating Jew? Was what Ben Halpern calls the vulgarity of Marx's references to Jews 41 and Edmund Silberne Marx's anti-Semitic vulgarism 42 truly anti-Semitism? Or vulgarity? Or both? If both, was it vulgar anti-Semitism as opposed to polite anti-Semitism? Was Marx vulgar? Were the Jews Marx referred to vulgar? Suppose they were, then are Marx's vulgar references to them and their vulgarity anti-Semitism? Or vulgarity? Or both? Suppose on the contrary, that the Jews Marx referred to as vulgar were not vulgar but that, believing them to be vulgar, he made vulgar references to them and their presumed vulgarity? Was he in that case an anti-Semite? Or vulgar? Or both? These questions carry us to the core of Marx and Marxism and place in our hands the key to his savage assault on the bourgeois Christian taboos of respectable 19th century European civilization, an assault renewed in its savagery, if not in its thrust, by another intellectual of the Jewish diaspora at the end of the 19th century, Sigmund Freud.
In that very fourth decade in which Marx published on the Jewish question a teenage Ferdinand Lassau was also struggling with the Jewish question as framed in the public discussion of Jewish emancipation. Lassau had a strong interest in Reform Judaism, and his desire was strong to make the Jews a respected people. 43 He wanted to be their Maccabean vindicator. 44 At 19 he writes to his mother. Following Robert Payne's translation, in Marx, New York, Simon and Schuster, 1968, pp. 93. 95, I have changed noble and common in the version quoted here, see note 39, to refined and vulgar, respectively, J.M.C. That Jewish misfortune, however, as it appears here, namely as brokenness and inconsistency of the human spirit, is the aesthetically ugly. 45 The choice Lassau was to make, between left-wing revolution and reform Judaism's liberalism, was governed by his answer to a prior question, was the sorry social look of Jewry in the West the outcome of long confinement and persecution by the surrounding Gentile culture, or was it the product of largely indigenous forces working within the Jewish subculture? Lassau thus struggled to make up his mind about his own identity, was he, in the West? to be a pariah or a parvenu? All his life he wavered in his answer. Marx never did. While Marx's decision to be an outlaw took final intellectual form only in the years 1843-45, the years of his marriage to the aristocratic Gentile Jenny von Westphalen, his critique of Hegel, and his manifesto on the Jewish question, the years which were the most decisive in his life. Isaiah Berlin writes 46 This decision itself has earlier roots. As with Hobbes, as Leo Strauss notes, on with any great thinker, for that matter, the later formulations of Marx tend to disguise the original motivation nexus, the fundamental attitude that lies at the core of his doctrine. 47 Marx's father, long before Karl Reed Hegel, had presented his son with the essentials, on a behavioral level of what Karl Loeth calls Das Problem der Bejulegen Gesellschaft, the problem of bourgeois society. 48. Chapter 16. The Marxian Zine, Property and Propriety. Marx's primal scene was thus very much a Jewish Zine, rooted in his Jewish experience. Just as the core of Freud's psychoanalytic theory, the Oedipus Complex is a universalization of his father's social humiliation, so, I contend, the core of Marx's scientific socialism the insight that the determining realities of the socio-economic substructure are masked by the cultural ideology of the superstructure was discovered as a Jewish experience. When he attacks Bauer's theological interpretation of the Jewish question, Marx does so as a debunker, let us consider the actual, secular Jew, not the Sabbath Jew, as Bauer does, but the everyday Jew one, Marx's emphasis. Here we have the earliest version of the substructure, superstructure dichotomy. It is not a spatial, higher, lower dichotomy, but a temporal, longitudinal dichotomy, the workaday weekday Jew versus the Jew of the hieratic seventh day or Sabbath. Gentiles like Bruno Bauer who defined the Jewish question in terms of religion were ideologists. They were idealizing the problem, just as Hegel had done in his reconciliation of state and civil society. Even left Hegelians like Bauer had fallen for the romantic solution embodied in Hegel's system. Hegel's system was an elaborate theodicy, a secularized Christian theodicy, papering over the contradictions of the liberal civic era it was designed to legitimate. Chief among the accursed contradictions veiled by the Hegelian speculative identity as first Feuerbach, then Marx, was to note, was the supposed synthesis of civil society and the modern state. Instead of the state assimilating private interests to its common good, private interests, individual and group interests, were using the state to further their own ends. Feuerbach and later Marx saw Hegel's idealization as an attempt to remove this contradiction from sight to through the techniques of sublimation, abnubilation, and idealization. Marx decided to reverse this process, taking the group interest most familiar to him, that of emancipating Jewry. 
he brought to light the contradiction between its bourgeois commitments to its own aggrandizement and its citizens' commitment to the common good and the public interest. What to liberalism, especially as it became pluralistic liberalism, might have passed for an ardent ethnic narcissism, too. Marx was an unsightly discrepancy between official ideology and the self-serving fact. He refused to allow Hegel's romantic liberal idealism to remove this contradiction merely from sight, he was to propose radical revolutionary praxis as a way of removing it from reality. The Jewish question was thus to serve Marx as a model in his demonstration of the failure of the bourgeois state to transform its bourgeois members into universalistic citizens. The contradictions in Hegel's system reflect the contradictions in the Prussia of his time. In 1843 Marx was engaged in unmasking Hegel's philosophy of right writing his critique concurrently with his exposing the realities of the Jewish question. There was an inner connection between Hegel's political pseudosynthesis and Bauer's theological idealization of the Jewish question, both studiously avoided the reality of vested collective interests, at the level of ethnic and class interests, running counter to and exploiting the public interest. This was to be the enduring problem of bourgeois society, das Problem der Bejuligen Gesellschaft. It is thus that historian Gertrude Himmelfarb can maintain that Marx's essay on the Jewish question is neither a youthful aberration nor an eccentricity but that if one reads the whole of the essay rather than snippets and quotations, it becomes a formidable argument. Integrally related to the rest of his thought. It is a horrendous and odious essay, she adds, but it is also an intellectually impressive statement of his vision. 3. The empirical ingredient in this vision was the stubborn staying power of Jewish particularism, it was this that first revealed Hegel's beloved community to be ein illusoris gemschkaft, an illusory halfway covenant. Duty, then, rebutted Hegel's dream of the state assimilating and subletting into itself all egoistic interests, individual, family, guild, transforming civil society into a new community. It wasn't just the enduring Gullus Jew for with his haggling and sharp practices nor the phenomenon of social dissociation even when Jews enjoyed political equality 5 that troubled Marx. What enraged him was ideology, that is, the fact that particularistic interests could be masked by abstract and universalistic legitimations, whether political, religious, or economic and that academic theorists such as Hegel and Bauer could be taken in by these ideologies. Marx's first debunking job was to debunk the Jewish question, to divulge the everyday Jew beneath the Sabbath Jew of the liberal academic discussions of the Jewish question. This, I believe, is the ethnic provenance of Marx's concept of ideology. As Helmut D. Schmidt writes, Jewish interests were firmly entrenched on the side of the Manchester School of laissez-faire. As a group the Jews had nothing to gain from state interference in private enterprise and they stood to lose a good deal by the fall of liberals from political power. So they fought back mainly through the press, 1848-1874. There. Power was not exactly measurable but recognizable. What made their power appear sinister to their enemies was the fact that the Jews were anxious to hide it for fear of arousing yet greater hostility. Thereby they increased the impression of all sharing in a conspiracy particularly as they defended their interests in the name of lofty principles not as Jews but as Germans. 6. My Emphasis The Enlightenment, the French Revolution and the emancipation had presumably liquidated all group and corporate interest, in principle anyway. The Jewish Kihila was over. Collective existence was at an end. All men were only individuals. Schmidt writes. By the terms of the Jewish emancipation it was impossible for Jews to defend their political or economic interests as Jews. The reality of their collective existence was never adequately taken into account by the political philosophy of 19th century Europe in whose political categories there was no real place for them. 7. My emphasis. Liberalism could never handle the de facto existence of Jewry as a collective problem. All through the 19th and 20th centuries secularized Jewish intellectuals arrived at an identical choice point, 
either to legitimate this observed de facto ethnic segregation of emancipated Jewry via nationalism, their Zionist ideology, or to delegitimate it by subsuming and universalizing it under a class variable, the communist and socialist ideologies. Bundist socialism would try to do both, even slight shifts in the factors involved could convert a communist into a Zionist, as happened in the case of Moses Hess. But in almost every case, whether the road taken was communism or Zionism, the initial quarrel of the secular Jewish intellectual was not with the larger society, but with the behavior, or misbehavior, of his fellow Jews. The anti-Jewish denunciations of Marx and Born, Hannah Arendt writes, cannot be properly understood except in the light of this conflict between rich Jews and Jewish intellectuals. 8. Oftentimes the rich Jews were relatives, and then the conflict between rich Jews and Jewish intellectuals was a family quarrel. Two examples of this are Helene Deutsch and Haim Zitlowski. In the case of the pioneer psychoanalyst Helene Deutsch, who moved from the ideology of socialism to Freudian ideology, the quarrel began as a family quarrel. First let me confirm what the reader must already suspect, she writes, opening the chapter on her mother in confrontations with myself, for most of my childhood and youth I hated my mother. Nine many pages later we learn why, I hated my mother's bourgeois materialism. 10 Helene Deutsch's ability publicly to confess hatred for her Jewish mother was, it seems evident, a factor in her not having to transfer that hatred to Western bourgeois society, that is, in her not becoming a communist. This is suggested by Dr. Deutsch herself when later she tells of meeting Rosa Luxemburg at the International Socialist Congress in Stockholm in 1910. I found out that Rosa Luxemburg was born into a Polish Jewish bourgeois family, as I was, and that throughout her life she had maintained a close, typically Jewish attachment to her relatives. But when she was only 15, burning with indignation against the evils of society, she had joined the Socialist Party. It is interesting to note how she transferred her adolescent rebellion from her family to the whole of bourgeois society. Dot. Rosa's rebellion was transferred outside the family circle. 31. Haim Zitlowski left his little Jewish village of Yushak, in Russia, when he was 16. Why? He was a young socialist revolutionary and he wished to be a Russian among Russians, one of the people, Intola. Also, he wanted to extricate himself from the bourgeois atmosphere which caused conflicts between my parents and me and where each year the desire for worldly pleasures grew and orthodox observance receded, my mother uncovered her hair and my father began to wear his coat shorter. In place of the old spiritual ideals came the thirst for luscious living and luscious earnings. Material wealth became their idol. From this bourgeois atmosphere I had to escape. But in the summer of 1883, the year Marx was buried in Highgate, he returned to his natal village of Yushak, where the Jewish question confronted his universalistic socialism in a form Marx never encountered, in the form of his own family, loved ones, and relatives. In the foreground emerged the Jewish question, he writes, confronting me like a sphinx, solve my riddle or I will devour you. 12 The riddle was, as Zitlowski realized, that while the philo-Semitic liberal solution to the Jewish problem only led to Jewry's further embuismment, the socialistic solution was objectively anti-Semitic and would destroy his people. We quote him at length. The philo-Semitic solution of the Russian Jewish press, demanding equal rights and justifying Jewish merchantry and its achieve. It is perhaps a researchable hypothesis that in a Gentile environment, insofar as one's family and ethnic group are forbidden objects of public criticism and hostility, aggression will to a corresponding degree be transferred to the, Gentile, out-group, where it is permitted, even legitimated, by ancestral adversary categories, and that where, on the contrary, one can openly detest and be ashamed of one's parents for being vulgar, for this is the burden of Dr. Deutsch's chapter on her mother. One is freer to espouse more individualistic ideologies, such as psychoanalysis. Mentz for Russia, could not impress me. In fact, it revolted me. 
I sensed it as an absolute contradiction to my socialist ideas and ideals, which had a pronounced Russian populist, agrarian socialist character. Samuel Solomonovich Plyakov built railroads for Russia. Those railroads were, according to Nekrasov's famous poem, built on the skeletons of the Russian peasantry. My uncle Michael in Ushak distilled vodka for the Russian people and made a fortune on the liquor tax. My cousins sold the vodka to the peasants. The whole town hired them to cut down Russian woods which he bought from the greatest exploiter of the Russian peasant, the Russian landowner. Wherever I turned my eyes to ordinary, day-to-day -day Jewish life, I saw only one thing, that which the anti-Semites were agitating about, the injurious effect of Jewish merchantry on Russian peasantry. No matter how I felt, from a socialist point of view, I had to pass a death sentence not only on individual Jews but on the entire Jewish existence of individual Jews. 13. Zitlowski's Emphasis Zitlowski, like Marx, turned his eyes to ordinary, day-to-day -to -day Jewish life to the Altag Jew, not the Sabbath Jew, and saw the much that Marx had seen a generation earlier. And he realized that universalistic socialism was a version of assimilation and that it meant the complete disappearance of the Jewish people, and that Marx's was the most logical and consistent solution to the Jewish problem. The most logical, yet for me, he adds, psychologically impossible. I was happy and comfortable in my Jewish world. Jews were closer to me, more my own kind, than many Russians with whom I was good friends and closely associated because of our common views. Why fool myself? After all, he concludes, I was a Jew. 14 Zitlowski had answered the riddle of the Sphinx. Liberalism was a poor ideological solution to the Jewish problem because of its elision of the open secret of its de facto collective dimension. Socialism and communism, recognizing the collective problem, omitted its particularist Jewish dimension. Combining his two loves, Zitlowski opted for Yiddishist socialism. Unlike the observant Jew, the secular Jewish intellectual, Moses Hess, Relvan Higgin, Lassall, Marx, Freud, Herzl, knew how the emancipating Jews, especially the pariah Ostjuden, the Gillis Jews, looked to the average bourgeois Gentile. And he cared. And he was embarrassed and ashamed. How did they look? Let us follow the Fabian Mrs. Sidney Webb, nay Beatrice Potter as she makes her way into London's East End in 1889, the to observe the look of newly arrived Polish Jewry. It is six years after Zitlowski returned to his Russian village. It is Shabs. You enter, the heat and odor convince you that the skylight is not used for ventilation. You seal the swaying to and fro of the bodies. Your eye wanders from the men, who form the congregation, to the small body of women behind the trellis. Here, that is, in the women, certainly, you have the Western world, in bright colored ostrich feathers, large bustles, and tight fitting coats of cotton velvet or brocaded satinette. At last you step out, stifled by the heat and dazed by the strange contrast of the old world memories of a majestic religion and the squalid vulgarity of an East End slum. 15. As her study concludes, Beatrice Potter turns to East End business practices, of which she lists many, and finds them shocking. The Eastern European Jew keeps the laws and keeps the peace and performs his contracts, but nevertheless something is missing. The reader will have already perceived, she writes, that the immigrant Jew, though possessed of many first-class virtues, is deficient in that highest and latest development of human sentiment, social morality. He totally ignores all social obligations other than keeping the law of the land, the maintenance of his own family, and the charitable relief of coeligionists. 16 What Beatrice Potter here sees as a Jewish social deficiency, an ethnic delict, Marx, only six years dead, transformed into a symptom of a general deficiency, bourgeois capitalism. This is Marxism's primal scene. The Jewish economic scene which Marx had incorporated into his essay on the Jewish question 46 years earlier, 1843. Marx had universalized it. Beatrice Potter reparticularized it. 
both turn their thoughts to the Anglo-Jewish economist David Ricardo. For the English Fabian, Ricardo is suddenly seen, in a startlingly new perspective, not as the supposed economist of her own decorous bourgeois English business people, but as an economic anthropologist of the pariah capitalism of the Eastern European Jewry of Whitechapel. Thus the immigrant Jew seems to justify by his existence those strange assumptions which figured for man in the political economy of Ricardo, an always enlightened selfishness, seeking employment or profit with an absolute mobility of body and mind, without pride, without preference, without interests outside the struggle for the existence and welfare of the individual and the family. We see these, strange, assumptions verified not in the behavior of Englishmen, much less mankind, but, f in the Jewish. It is significant, in this connection, that Moses Rischen devotes over one third of his famous book on the migration of Jews to New York City to what he calls learning a new social ethic, part 4, my emphasis. Moses Rischen, The Promised City, New York's Jews 1870-1914, New York, Harper Torchbook, 1970, pages 169 to 257. T. The material in brackets, of course, is my own, not Miss Potter's, J.M.C. I. 40. Inhabitants of Whitechapel, and in the Jewish East End trades, we may watch the prophetic deduction of the Hebrew economist actually fulfilled. 17. Marx, on the other hand, reveres Ricardo for building his economics on precisely this type of market scene, namely, a purely contractual, purely utilitarian cash and excess disembedded from every social ethic and moral sentiment. Ricardo is the scientific economist of bourgeois capitalism, Ricardo's theory of value is the scientific interpretation of actual economic life, he declares against the French utopian socialists who try to prove their superiority over the English economists, as the English Fabian has just done question mark by seeking to observe the etiquette of a humanitarian phraseology, reproaching Ricardo and his school for their cynical language because it annoys them to see economic relations exposed in all their crudity, read Jewishness, to see the mysteries of the bourgeoisie unmasked 18, my emphasis. It is most significant that the great historian of the Shtetland of Eastern European Jewry, the late Morris Samuel, a Romanian non-Marxist Jew settled in Scotland, should converge with Marx in an identical analysis of Gentile economic behavior. Apart from the necessities of the law, you Gentiles, he writes, in a book called You Gentiles, attempt to bring into the field of business the curious punctilio of the fencing master courtesies and pretenses, slogans and passwords, which mitigate only in appearance the primal savagery of the business struggle. 19 Here again, the elements of the diaspora critique make their appearance. The observation of punctilios, courtesies, and mitigations, the relegation of these to the moralist category of pretense or hypocrisy, and, finally, the by now conventional contrast of the primal savagery with the misleading appearances, think of Freud's primary process underlying the superego, think of Marx's ideology concept. For Morris Samuel, it is clear, the goyim embed their economic exchange of goods and services in a social exchange of civilities because, good hypocrites that they are, they refuse to admit the primal savagery of what is actually occurring between them. As with Marx, the civil nexus is an ideology, a fig leaf for the cash nexus. Goyim have this hang up. The civilities are a kind of games Goyim play. Leave them to their Goyim knackers. Marx's ideology, scientific socialism, is, as we shall see, an odd kind of apology for the emancipating Jewry of 19th century Europe. It looks like anti Semitism, but it isn't. It is anti philosemitic. It annoyed both liberal Gentile and assimilating Jew that the Ost Jude should provide the occasion, create the actual social scene, in which they were forced. Just as, on the level of theory, Gentile economists such as Adam Smith, unlike Ricardo and Marx, embed their theory of capitalism in a prior theory of moral sentiments. To see economic relations exposed in all their crudity, 
to see the mysteries of the bourgeoisie are masked. Bourgeois Christian democracy, the whole edifice of refined bourgeois gentile civility and social ethics, was but a superstructure, a cunning obnubilation designed to conceal the rank materialism of bourgeois capitalism underneath. Both Marx and Freud viewed bourgeois modernization as a vast ecclesia supercloak and the scandal of the Ostjude was that he exposed to full view, openly, the dark underside of European society. At the very time Beatrice Potter visited London's East End, the Danish-American Jacob A. Rees visited New York's Lower East Side to see how the other half lives. He writes of the Eastern European Jewry he sees there, money is their god. Life is of so little value compared with even the leanest bank account. In no other spot does life wear so intensely bold and materialistic an aspect as in Ludlow Street. Proprieties do not count on the east side, nothing counts that cannot be converted into hard cash 20, my emphasis. Throughout the 19th century the contrast keeps cropping up, bald, bare, naked, materialistic, cushion excess on the one hand, propriety social sentiment, civility on the other. The social behavior of emancipating Jewry becomes an experimentum crucis for the nascent social sciences. In these Jews, the pariah was not yet hidden in the parvenu. The Ostjude becomes for Marx his antibuyui his substructure. All the rest is propriety, that is, bourgeois social and legal formalism. Scarcely a generation after Rees, the socialist phase of Walter Lippmann, as a German Jew, typically began with his intense preoccupation with the problem of the behavior in public places of newly rich American Jewry. Lippmann's socialism was not driven by any passion for redistribution. His was not a socialism that would give with one hand to Mike Gold's Jews without money what it took with the other from our crowd. No. Lippmann's was a sumptuary socialism designed to curb the ostentation of bourgeois Jewry. The ideologies of intellectual Jews are their ways of settling their accounts with the Jewish question, as they see it, and only derivatively universalist manifestos addressed to mankind. We quote at length from Lippmann's analysis of a half century ago. He writes that while there are not among Jews more blatantly vulgar rich than among other stocks, sharp trading and blatant vulgarity are more conspicuous in the Jew because he himself is more conspicuous. He needs more than anyone else. Kenneth Burke's definition of art, personal communication, plus Leo Strauss, in another context, notes the connection of the classical aversion to commercialism with the traditional demand for sumptuary laws. Preface to the English translation. Spinoza's Critique of Religion, Trans. E. M. Sinclair, New York, Skookan, 1965, p. 16. The Marxian Zine. To learn the classic Greek virtue of moderation, for he cannot, even if he wishes to, get away unscathed with what less distinguishable men can. For that reason the rich and vulgar and pretentious Jews of our big cities are perhaps the greatest misfortune that has ever befallen the Jewish people. They are the real fountain of anti-Semitism. They are everywhere in sight, and though their vices may be no greater than those of other jazzy elements in the population, they are a thousand times more conspicuous. Moreover, they dissipate awkwardly. It happens that the Jews, for good or evil, have no court or country house tradition of high living, and little of the physical grace that just barely makes that mode of life tolerable. When they rush about in super automobiles, bejeweled and beefed and painted and overbarbered, when they build themselves French chaises and Italian palazzi, they stir up the latent hatred against crude wealth in the hands of shallow people, and that hatred diffuses itself. They undermine the natural liberalism of the American people. I waste no time myself worrying about the injustices of anti-Semitism. There is too much injustice in the world for any particular concern about summer hotels and college fraternities. I worry about the Jewish smart set in New York. They can in one minute unmake more respect and decent human kindliness than Einstein and Brandeis and Mac and Paul Warburg can build up in a year. 
I worry about upper Broadway on a Sunday afternoon where everything is feverish and unventilated. And as a Jew writing in a Jewish weekly to Jews I say that there is a very serious danger of failure. The Jew is conspicuous, and unless in his own conduct of life he manages to demonstrate the art of moderate, clean and generous living, every failure will magnify itself in woe upon the heads of the helpless and unfortunate. The Jew will have to display far better taste than the average if he is to discount for the purpose of sympathetic understanding with the rest of the American people the fundamental fact that he is conspicuous. 21. Lippmann's socialism betrays its roots. Closer in inspiration to Marx's. A dozen years earlier he had worried about Washington. In the discussion of socialism, politics and metapolitics in the Harvard Illustrated magazine, the Berliner scandal a kind of Jewish teapot dome, which was an Irish scandal. See Stephen Birmingham, Real Lace, America's Irish Rich, New York, Harper and Row, 1973, pages 103 to 34, during Taft's incumbency, motivate Slipman's socialist call, if you support Berliner and the Guggenhams, he proclaims, you are consistent with 19th century unsocialist theory. If you support Gifford Pincott, you are a supporter of an essential part of the socialist program. Harvard Illustrated Magazine, April 1910, pages 231 to 32. Lippmann will later move, as he acculturates to the culture of civility and as Jews assimilate, from the advocacy of public property to his final phase of the public philosophy, namely, civility. Communism and he would be pleased to admit. This apostle of Puritan plain living and high thinking clearly constructs his socialist ideology as a prophylaxis for what he takes to be Jewish ostentation. When Eastern European socialism is urged by Eastern European Jews, it is urged for the sake of the Jews, Eastern European Zionism also. They are auto-emancipations. But the provenance of German Jewish socialism, as of German Jewish Zionism 5 is different. Lippmann's was a sumptuary socialism as Brandeis's was a sumptuary Zionism. For it was clear to those who did not seek the way of individual escape by means of conversion, Jacob Katz writes of post-emancipation Jewry, that, as Jews, they would always be judged by the collective and it was to their advantage to see that the lowest type of Jew, who seemed to provide a model for the stereotype, should disappear altogether. 22. Chapter 17. Marx and the Euphemists. The whole of the 19th century can be viewed as a search for the proper set of euphemisms with which to talk about the Jewish question. The stage was set in 1781 with the publication of Christian Wilhelm von Dom's pamphlet Über die Bijelische Verbesserung der Juden, on the civic betterment of the Jews. But what did this well-intentioned Gentile Dom? the outstanding advocate of Jewish emancipation in 18th century Prussia, according to Hannah Arendt one mean by his phrase civic betterment. Logically, Jacob Katz points out, the subject of the implied verb verbesseren is society, the Jews themselves, or probably both. To and this, indeed was Dom's proposal, for civic improvement to occur, both society and Jewry would have to mend their ways. Dom accepted the prevailing evaluation of the Jews, Katz writes, as a politically incapacitated and morally degenerate group. He had not written, Dom replied to his critics, an apologia for the Jews as they are but, vide the title, as they will be. 3 Thus, the idea of self-improvement as a precondition for civil rights, a debate that was revived in the form of functional prerequisites for a stable democracy only at the end of World War II with reference to decolonization, and after 1950 with reference to civil rights for American blacks was being publicly debated at the end of the 18th century in reference to Jews. Thus, Jews and non-Jews alike who in the decades following Dom's work fought for the betterment of Jews' civic and social situation did so, Katz notes under the assumption that at the same time a civic and moral say, f improvement on the part of the Jews was necessary. Thus the objective appraisal that the access of Jews to Western bourgeois civil society would require a goodly amount of adjustment and self-adaptation, to use value-free terminology, 
was actually couched in terms of moral judgment, stating that the Jews must become not only different but better. Not a little of this transposition of the Jewish. A parallel in the 1950s was the growing resentment of militant blacks in the United States toward the second day in the acronym NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The more militant leaders were more extrapunitive, blaming white American society, insisting that it must advance. Question into the key of morals is due to Dom's verbesserung a term remaining in use for almost half a century. 4. But not everyone was equally pleased at that way of talking about the Jewish question. There is the pathos of Jews like Moses Mendelssohn who welcomed Dom's initiative in behalf of Jews yet found his estimate of the current cultural depravity of the Jew difficult to swallow. Inhaling Dom's book, Mendelssohn characteristically dropped the term Bijalish for Besserung, substituting in its stead Bijalish Ofnum, that is, civil acceptance. Inadvertently, perhaps, Katz adds, he interpreted Dom's term as referring to the state, which had to improve the Jews' status. 5. Here we see, not some inadvertence, as Katz suggests, but an early form of a structural element in the Jewish emancipation problematic that recurs throughout its history. The discoveries in science of Copernicus, Darwin, and himself, Freud wrote in 1917, by toppling man from his privileged position at the center of things, things cosmological, biological, and psychological, respectively, wounded the general narcissism of man. 6 If the self-love of Gentile humanity was, these three times, severely wounded by discoveries in science, the ethnic narcissism of the Jew suffered all at once a grievous trauma by its discovery of 19th century European civilization. In the pre-emancipation era, Jewry could maintain the illusion of its privileged position by maintaining the plausibility of its expectation of the long-deferred messianic reversal. A credible theodicy was always ready to hand to explain the problem of evil namely, the present, and hence apparent, inferiority of the Jewish people vis-a-vis -vis the present, and hence apparent, superiority of the surrounding goyim. Solomon Maimon, for example, recalls an incident from his Polish boyhood, he was later to visit, and embarrassed by his behavior, Mendelssohn and his circle in Berlin. One day, Prince Radzivil, a great lover of the chase, came with his daughter Princess Radzivil and his whole court to hunt in Mayiman's neighborhood. The young princess, needing rest, came with the ladies and servants of her court to the very room, Mayiman writes in his celebrated autobiography. Where as a boy I was sitting behind the stove. I was struck with astonishment at the magnificence and splendor of the court. I could not satisfy my eyes with the sight. My father came in just as I was beside myself with joy, and had broken into the words, Oh, how beautiful! In order to calm me, and at the same time to confirm me in the principles of our faith, he whispered into my ear, Little fool, in the other world the duxel will kindle the pesha for us, which means, in the future life the princess will kindle the stove for us. 7. No one can conceive the sort of feeling this statement produced in me, 146. Recalls Mayiman, supplying precious testimony on the waning of the Jewish Middle Ages. On the one hand, I believed my father, and was very glad about this future happiness in store for us. On the other hand, I could not get it into my head that this beautiful rich princess in this splendid dress could ever make a fire for a poor Jew. I was thrown into the greatest perplexity on the subject. 8. Jewish emancipation in the next century consists in a humiliating series of such encounters of the theodicy of Jewish exile with the West. On every such contact, the plausibility of the explanation of why the people of the covenant need betterment, and why the surrounding goyim are riding so high, comes under considerable strain. Little Jewish boys, Margaret Mead writes, read the stories of Polish heroes, with admiration as well as with the required disapproval, covet admiration coexisting uneasily with overt disapproval of the lure of the world more attractive existing beyond the pale of the Eastern European shtetl.
9 The core concept that embodies and integrates the whole Jewish experience in the diaspora, writes Ben Halpin, is the idea of exile. A ban of penance. Living in expiatory subjection to the Gentiles. 10 Emancipation puts this core concept under increasingly more strain. Traditional ethnic self-esteem eases this tension and maintains Jewry's morale by the stance it takes up toward the past, the present, and the future. The matter might be put as follows, Jewish secularization takes place in three tenses, as far as the condition of the Jews goes, at any given time the need for betterment due to degradation, inferiority, call it what you will, can be either affirmed or denied. If it is affirmed, then it will be explained by the past. The traditional, observant Jew will explain it as part of sacred salvation history, that is, it is a punishment for Israel's sins. The secularizing, intellectual Jew will turn this theodicy inside out, forging it into an instrument with which to blame the Gentile. The older, intrapunitive theodicy becomes an extrapunitive sociodicy, you made us what we are today, the secularist intelligentsia of the diaspora will insist, indicting the Gentile West creating what Sallow Baron calls the lacrimose historiography of the Jews. 11 The culture of the West being what it is, Christian, the victim status carries considerable prestige. This victim status, derived from the Christ figure, becomes for Jews almost irresistible when to its pathos is added the attraction of the fact that it is liberal Gentiles of impeccable status like Dom who themselves offer past anti-Semitism as the overall explanation for the present Jewish condition. Historically, Katz writes, Christian Dom lays the blame for the civic and moral deterioration of Jewry on Christian society which debarred Jews from using their abilities and exercising their innate moral qualities. But his diagnosis of the fact of deterioration, or perhaps even. See pages 211 to 212. Degradation, was accepted with little hesitancy. 12 Dom's description of the present degradation of the Jews was accepted with little hesitancy precisely because, and this is another recurring feature of the problematic of Jewish emancipation, it was coupled with the anti-Semitism explanation of the origin of this degradation. It was coating on a bitter pill. This package conceding Jewry's ignominy, pledging betterment, explaining it by Jew hate, is the formula for both the classical liberal Jewish adjustment to the diaspora and its counterpart among the Goyim, liberal Gentile philo-Semitism. This diaspora liberalism divides once more into two varieties, the militant activist liberalism whose provenance is among Eastern European Jewry and which, throwing over the passivity of the rabbinical halakha, organized for auto-emancipation, and the more assimilated liberalism of Western Jewry, which threw off the traditional legal system only to replace it with the restraints of the Gentile halakha of civility. To this day, the thrust of the former type of liberalism is reflected in the American Jewish Congress, as the latter is in the American Jewish Committee. The liberal Jewish adjustment for living the diaspora, then, was to concede present Jewish shortcomings contingent upon Gentile admission of Christian shortcomings both past and present. In the diaspora ideology of liberalism, in other words, anti-Semitism was not a phenomenon of interaction, a tragic but inevitable outcome of Jews in a Gentile world, but was almost entirely an input from the Gentile side of the line, gratuitous, willful, unnecessary. The diaspora ideologies of Zionism and radical Marxism directly challenged diaspora liberalism's diagnosis of the past and the present and its hopes for the future. Zionists, for their part, held to a sociological doctrine that Jew hatred was necessarily caused by Jewish homelessness and would disappear when the national home was built and the exiled Jewish masses were gathered in. The symmetrical ideology of universalistic Marxism was identical in this respect to Zionism, Jewish radicals analyzed anti-Semitism as incidental to the class struggle and expected it to disappear in the ruins of the capitalist system. Those who made a direct attack on anti-Semitism, Halpin concludes, were Jewish liberals 13, my emphasis. 
In this way, the disist team and self-hate structural to the experience of dispersion into the West could be muted. Zionists planned to heal at one stroke the wound to national self-esteem by leaving Europe, and by leaving behind the invidious comparisons fatal to remaining there. Marxists planned to kill the Jewish question by revolution, not emigre. Ben Halpern contrasts the frankly ethnic politics of Eastern European Jewish activist liberalism with the Central and Western European passive and individualistic liberalism. Jews and Blacks, see no date, p. 125. The former liberalism was in a kind of pre-established harmony with the pluralistic liberalism of melting pot politics needed for survival in Metro America. Marx and the Euphemists Shun at one stroke, all would be changed, changed utterly, as a species humane community is born. The ideology of diaspora liberalism was essentially a decision and a utopian dream, it was the decision to remain in the West, neither emigrating nor revolting, it was the dream that, by dint of nudging and quetching, litigation and voting, education and modernization, a neutral society might awake from the nightmare of history offering neutral spaces and public places where Jew and Gentile might mingle civilly and socially, a social system in which differences in culture made no difference in society. But the question that remained for diaspora liberalism was how best to talk about those differences between Jew and Gentile that persisted. The search for the proper set of euphemisms with which to talk about the Jewish question continued unabated. Mendelssohn, as we have seen, dropped, not so inadvertently, Dom's term civic betterment, Vigilish Verbesserung, for civil acceptance, Vigilish Ofnum, Meyer of Journeys from Paris to Berlin. He had read and was duly impressed by Lessing's Nathan the Wise, arriving in Berlin just after the death of its real-life hero, Mendelssohn. He attends the Salon of Henriette Hertz, intervenes with Frederick II in favor of her people and reads Dom's Civic Betterment. Emulating Dom and C. F. Nalai, the Comte de Meyerop soon publishes his own Apologia for the Jews, Moses Mendelssohn et la Reforme Politique des Juifs. Fourteen Civic Betterment has taken on a French accent and been politicized into political reform. But in Germany the idea of the self-improvement of the Jews as a precondition for full civil rights gains more and more currency after the Congress of Vienna in 1815, Dom's very term is used in its documents. Fifteen finally, by way of the public discussion of Catholic emancipation in England, the term emancipation not used prior to 1828 in Germany begins to take hold as a way of talking about the Jewish question and, in the end, expropriates all others. Emancipation as a euphemism for talking about the Jewish question defeats all its rivals because it gets rid of any notion of self-improvement as a precondition for civil rights on the part of Jews, and, by being a political term purely and simply, it rids the problem of any lingering suggestion that there might be non-political qualifications, bourgeois qualifications, for political citizenship. It cuts off in advance any idea that there might be a possible connection between the rudimentary political rights of civil society and the bourgeois social rights of polite society. Emancipation has the additional advantage, from the side of diaspora liberalism, of implying that the pre-emancipation status of Jews in the Gentile world, accounting for all their subsequent disabilities, was one of slavery. Sir Isaiah Berlin merely draws out the implications of the term itself when he writes, in 1961, his Jewish slavery and emancipation. Sixteen European Jewry, then, in its non-Zionist, non-Marxist mainstream, becomes, in both its own and, in liberal Gentile eyes, the earliest of those belligerent communities of pathos of which Renate Maintz speaks. 17 With the emergence of this pathos of the victim or mystique is born, henceforth, Gentile liberalism will be inseparable from bourgeois Christian philo-Semitism. It is a revealing cultural circumstance that so many of the diaspora ideologies begin their revolutions in revolt against euphemism. Frud's psychoanalysis de euphemizes sex, the id, which represents, as we have seen, the pre-emancipated Jew. 
the civilized sexual morality of Western civil society, Freud argues, inclines us to concealment of the truth, to euphemism, to self-deception, and the deception of others. 18 Theodor Herzl's Zionism really began on January 5, 1895, when, as correspondent for the Vienna New Free Press covering the public degradation in Paris of Captain Dreyfus, he heard the mob scream death to Jews. A mort. A mort lay Jewifs, the liberal Jewish editors of the New Free Press altered the text of Herzl's dispatch in their Sunday edition, universalizing, that is, euphemizing it to read, death to the traitor. Even if we grant, on insufficient grounds, Herzl's biographer, Alex Bean writes, that it was really a traitor who was being condemned and degraded, the attitude of the crowd was, according to the report, a strange one. We read, in the new free press, that the crowd shouted, death to the traitor. This is quite comprehensible, but there is something incomplete about it. We cannot avoid the impression that Herzl's telegrams were edited before they were printed, and it was fear that motivated the excisions. It is unlikely that Herzl had himself colored the report. Four years afterwards there still rang in his ears the shouts of the crowd, which left him shattered, a mart. A mort lay Jew if 19. Politeness, perhaps even more than fear, motivated the excision and the resulting euphemism, the substitution for Jews of the more abstract traitors. There was a contradiction between the coarse bluntness of Herzl's dispatch and what Hannah Arendt calls in another context the hypocritical politeness which surrounded the Jewish question in all respectable quarters. 20 This politeness and euphemism existed in Marx's time, in all respectable quarters. In fact, such politeness and euphemism defined respectability. It is this cultural situation that will make it all but inevitable that the anti-philosemitism of Marx's essay on the Jewish question will be misread, when it appears in 1844, as unadulterated anti-Semitism. Liberal ideology's concept of suffering situations links it with the cultural pathos of the Jew and with philosemitism. See Kenneth R. Minogue, The Liberal Mind, New York, Vintage Books, 1968 pages 1 to 13. Chapter 18. Claude Levi Strauss. The Rude, the Crude, the Nude, and the Origin of Table Manners. Claude Levi Strauss belongs with the founding patriarchs of Jewish intellectual culture in the diaspora, with Marx and Freud. He is to anthropology as they are to sociology and psychology. Structural anthropology is the last of the classic ideological remedies for the cultural status wound inflicted on intellectual Jewry by its emancipation into the West. In comparison with Western modernity, Levi Strauss, his religion, his people, appeared backward, primitive. His revered teacher, Emile Durkheim, believing in historical development, had founded French scientific sociology with his first great work in 1893. The Division of Labor in Society, in which he analyzed the modernization process as a development from tribal or mechanical solidarity, which he illustrated chiefly, as a son of rabbis, by copious Old Testament references to modem civil societies in the West, which he called superior societies. It is significant, recalling the old dispute over the word betterment, verbesserung, in Dom's title, that the subtitle of the first edition of Durkheim's Division of Labor namely, Etat zur Organisation des Societes Superiores was subsequently dropped. Levi Strauss experienced such developmentalism as demeaning, much as today in Latin America Marxist intellectuals derisively reject the whole developed underdeveloped paradigm of modernization by calling it de arolismo. One all our teachers, Levi Strauss recalls, were obsessed with the notion of historical development. Two experiencing the same status wound that would later lead members of the Jewish community to bitterly resent Arnold Toynbee's reference to observant. Orthodox Judaism as a fossil, Levi Strauss, though an unsynagogued, secular Jewish intellectual, turned decisively against the whole idea of social evolution, even. 45 Explicit References to Deuteronomy, Exodus, Joshua, 
Leviticus, Numbers, and the Pentateuch are indexed in the division of labor, more than to any other single topic or person. Professor Benjamin Nelson once remarked in a lecture that the index to Max Weber's economy and society contained more references to Jesus than to Marx. In its modem and relativized form, what is now called the new evolutionism. His deeply oral imagination, he castigated the cannibal instincts of the historical process, three as he would later code myths under the categories of the raw and the cooked for spat out western civilization and the vaunted meaningfulness of historical experience. My intelligence is Neolithic, he announced, to reach a reality we must first repudiate experience. 5. Levi Strauss attributes this fundamental insight to Karl Marx, who also repudiated appearances, to whom he considers himself to be in pupillary succession. Falling back on the anthropological language of initiation, he writes. When I was about 17 I was initiated into Marxism by a young Belgian socialist whom I had met on holiday. A whole new world was opened to me. My excitement has never cooled and rarely do I tackle a problem in sociology or ethnology without having first set my mind in motion by reperusal of a page or two from the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte or the Critique of Political Economy. 6. Levi Strauss, by thus rooting his ahistorical structuralism in Marx, inadvertently unpacks the historicism and idealism at the root of Marxism. Historicist idealism is an ideological strategy used by both the old aristocratic insiders and the new ethnic outsiders, for recouping from the status humiliations of modernity. Cultural and subcultural dispossession are a wound in the heart. Structuralism, like Marxism, is an ideology of subcultural despair, an uneasy melange of cognitive relativism and ethical absolutism. The component of positivism in Marx, his hard-boiled, Hard-nosed materialism is small indeed compared to the logicism, his contradictions talk, and idealism. It is not for nothing that Talcott Parsons, after briefly analyzing Marx as part of the positivistic tradition, breaks off his analysis, further discussion of Marx will therefore be postponed until his relation to idealism can be taken up, in chapter I8, The Idealistic Tradition. He is one of the most important forerunners of the group of writers. To be dealt with under the heading of idealism. 7 The curious paradox of Marxism which Michael Polanyi has identified as constituting the secret of its appeal, namely, skeptical fanaticism, characteristic also of that other product of Jewish intellectual culture in the diaspora, Freudianism is itself rooted in large part in the fact that Marxism is a theoretical conceit that is, a violent yoking together of theoretically unmediated components, positivism and idealism, which, using conceit as it is used in literary criticism, the way Coleridge in Biographia Literaria used fancy, pitting it against imagination, only the latter melds components into new holes appeals to an intellectual clientele at once cynical about the situation of social action and utopian about the ends of social action. Thus, the allure of these ideologies for a dissociated theoretical sensibility consists in their appeal to moral passion in the language of social science. A passionate social conscience is licensed as dispassionate cognitive science. In scientific socialism as in scientific psychoanalysis, the normative and the cognitive are conflated, the fire and the rose are one. A pitilessly punitive and skeptical objectivity unmasks a given world of fact, a homeless revolutionary longing projects a new world of value. Members of the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research, for example, Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse, and others, considered their effort to combine elements of Marxism with Freud's psychoanalysis in developing critical theory to be the work of unattached and universalistic radical intellectuals. The Frankfurt Institute members are famous for their indignant repudiation of all sociology of knowledge attempts to relativize their radicalism by exploring its possible connections with their cultural marginality and ethnicity. Members of the Frankfurt Circle its historian Martin J. notes, were anxious to deny any significance at all to their ethnic roots. 
Dot. Felix J. Vile, for example, has heatedly rejected any suggestion that Jewishness, defined religiously, ethnically, or culturally, had any influence whatsoever on the selection of institute members or the development of their ideas. What strikes the current observer, J. continues, is the intensity with which many of the institute members denied, and in some cases still deny, any meaning at all to their Jewish identities. T8 In this vehement rejection of the meaningfulness of Jewishness in their backgrounds on the part of Frankfurt's critical theorists, in this insistence on their own total assimilation, J argues, one cannot avoid a sense of their protesting too much. 9. It is important to note here that, excepting the case of Wall to Benjamin, there was no open break, by Frankfurt Circle members, with their parents or with the Jewish community. On my analysis, there existed all the shame and anger at the vulgarity of the parental bourgeois materialism as they had been in the case, for example, of Helene Deutsch, but, unlike Deutsch, and like Rosa Luxemburg, this hostility. Jean Richard Bloch in a brilliant essay, translated by Lionel Drilling, was the first to identify this subcultural syndrome, what Bloch calls a combination of skepticism and fanaticism in the secular intellectual Jews of modernity. Napoleon, the Jews, and the modern man, Menera Journal 18, Number 3, March 1930, 219. T.J. notes the intensity of the disclaimers of Vile, the financial sponsor of the Institute and other left-wing ventures such as the Malik Verlag and the Piscator stage. He writes, in more than a score of letters, Vile exhorted me to ignore the Jewish question entirely in my treatment of the Institute, to bring it up once again, he contended, would play into the hands of earlier detractors who had explained the Institute's radicalism by pointing to the cosmopolitan roots of its personnel. Martin J., Anti-Semitism and the Wimar Left, Midstream 20, No. 1, January 1974, 44. Was displaced from Jewish bourgeois society to the permitted target of the larger Gentile society. It is highly significant that the radicals of the Frankfurt Institute, again, with the exception of Benjamin, precisely did not carry their rejection of the commercial mentality of their parents tend to use Jay's phrase, into outright personal rebellion. Of equal significance is the obverse fact, these well-to-do business-oriented Jewish parents of the Wimar twenties and thirties did not, for their part, rebel against the radical mentality of their sons but, on the contrary, generously supported them as affluent suburban parents were later to support their new left activist offspring in the American sixties eleven in their higher calling. What had been published by Marx openly and publicly in 1844 on the Jewish question would be written discreetly in 1946 by Horkheimer in a private letter to Leo Lowenthal, the Jew is the pioneer of capitalism. 12 The difference is that the Marxism of the Frankfurt Circle is a refined or bourgeois Marxism. Frankfurt Marxists, as Edward Schill's notes, are idle Marxistan. 13 Marx's bad taste was his insistence on saying in public things others would only say in private, 